All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm going to start the video right now. Hi, we are the Libis team behind KU Leuven RDA, pronounced as RADA, which is the institutional research data repository launched in January 2022 for the KU Leuven, one of the major universities of Belgium. The team exists of four people. Chris and Eric as software architects, Özgür as developer and me, Diewirtje, as product manager. Our Dataverse installation is pretty much in line with the normal setup, but there are some smaller features and things that make our installation different and unique. We decided to set up Geilöwen radar using Docker. Next to the actual installation, we also use Geilöwen's literature repository and the SAP system for our custom lookups as set up by Chris. We use a lookup for the author field, which makes it easy to add Geilöwen authors and their ORCID ID in one go. On top of that, we also use a lookup for the related publication field. There, the user can look up publications in the institutional literature repository to fill in the relevant fields in one go. Next to our own developments for our setup, we're also actively contributing to the community, with some of the latest contributions being the feature developed by Eric that allows mails and notifications to be configured by users and admins, the lookups made by Chris that we use for our author lookup, as it can also be used for raw lookups and other controlled vocabulary searches, and another smaller but impactful pull request Eric contributed is the one where controlled lists are now searchable on the contains principle instead of the stars with principle. If you want to know even more about our installation or our team, you can contact me directly or via our help desk. DENS, the National Center of Expertise and Repository for Research Data in the Netherlands, established in 2014 their first Dataverse repository, Dataverse NL a repository platform for Dutch universities and research institutes. This year, year we are establishing discipline-specific data stations built upon the Dataverse software. Besides Dataverse NL, we are planning for four data stations. One for archaeology, one for social science and humanities, the third for physical and technical sciences, the fourth data station will be for life, health and medical sciences. The launch of the archaeology data station will be within a couple of weeks. The other data stations will follow in autumn this year or early 2023. Would you like to have more information about the data stations? Please visit our website or send us an email. Hi, I am Nada Shaya, and I'm going to briefly introduce the ACSS Dataverse. Four years ago, the Arab Council for the Social Sciences, a regional organization based in Beirut, started focusing on social science, data management, and open access in order to promote the norm, practice, and capacity of data management among social scientists and research institutions in the Arab region. And this is within the concept of knowledge as a public good, uh, and because accessibility and not quantity of research data is one of the obstacles to improving quality of research. The initi initiative is implemented by the ACSS in collaboration with the Odin Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. The initiative has two objectives. The first is preserving and facilitating access to and the use of social science data sets produced in and on the Arab region. For this, we created the ACSS Dataverse, the first interdisciplinary social science data repository in the region. It went live in 2019 and is available to both individuals and institutions. Uh, the second objective is capacity building, and the ACSS is holding a series of regional trainings and training of trainers that introduce principles, best practices, and tools of data management. In addition to contributing to data literacy, we hope these training workshops will create communities of practice on data management in the region. If you want to know more about the ACS Dataverse or want to deposit a data set in it, you can contact us uh, on the email on the slide. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Matthew Harp, Research Data Services and Outreach Librarian at Arizona State University's ASU Library. We added five new collections and 18 new data sets and jumped from 764 files to over 3,000 in the past year. Our downloads increased from 1,401 to 14,298 this year. We now have around 18.2 terabytes of data in the repository. The ASU team moved from establishing our research repository to improving workflows and guidance. We integrated data set records into the library catalog, added metadata only records for restricted data sets, and learned a lot about working with big data sets. We deployed a confluence-based user guide wiki following the Texas Data Repository's consortium model. Our interns identified information gaps and researched how the other Dataverse installations communicate guidance to their stakeholders. We also created a curator's guide. This isn't your favorite YouTube gamer video. It's a DARPA-funded artificial intelligence experiment. With 14 terabytes of data, it's been a learning experience in how to describe and make big data accessible. Some end users are also surprised at the length of time for downloads. So we now recommend requesters use a download manager for accessing large data sets such as this. On the opposite end of the spectrum are our metadata only records for restricted data sets. For the restricted data, having the HTML markup in the description field paid off as researchers can directly connect to request forms right from the library search interface without actually having to go to the repository. Initially, all data sets were indexed under Discovery Platform as open access resources, but we now tag restricted data sets as ASU only, removing the open access icon. This year, we saw more collection owners utilize guestbooks. They have helped gain purposely provided user information. We have received some feedback from requesters of large data sets that the guestbooks make downloading a bit difficult. So we now communicate the pros and cons of setting up guestbooks for submitters. But the services cannot function without people, and we are expanding. Our research data curator position is open for recruitment, and this person will be working to join a newly formed unit dedicated to open science and scholarly communications, and will work with the Labriola National American Indian Data Center to build relationships with indigenous communities. This position closes on July 6 of 2022. Thanks, and we hope to talk with you soon. Find us at dataverse.asu.edu. The Harvard Dataverse Repository is free and open to all researchers from any discipline, both inside and outside of the Harvard community. It's collaboratively supported by both IQSS and Harvard Library, and is a member of the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. Despite a slight decrease in the number of new collections created, since last year's community meeting, we have grown significantly in terms of the number of data sets that have been published. We also saw the average data set size decrease from about 750 megabytes to 250 megabytes. The number of downloads we saw over the last year shrank as well, but this was likely due to the fact that one dataset was downloaded about 5 million times between the 2020 and 2021 community meetings. Accounting for that, the downloads have remained about the same. Finally, we also saw a decrease in the number of new user accounts that were created over the last year, but a larger percentage of these users are actually depositing datasets. We've also been working with the community to improve support for multiple licenses. The feature update was added to Harvard Dataverse in late March of 2022. It adds field validation to encourage depositors to choose a standard license or add custom terms of use. It improves the deposit workflow to more prominently display licenses and terms and helps the repository include more machine readable licensing information. Here you can see that prior to the update, we had a pretty significant number of data sets that failed to include any terms of use or applied something other than CC0. We hope that this update will clarify the contents of this other category a bit more and prevent as many users from publishing data sets without any license at all. We're also trying to improve the messaging for the file upload process, especially by adjusting the wording about tabular ingest limitations and providing links to information in the user guides. We also have links here to a number of other improvements and updates, including new curation projects and services updates, the ability to embargo files in a data set, the creation of a metadata block for 3D data, improvements to the guestbook feature, adding a preview tab to the file page, plans to redesign the private URL feature, and adding the GeoJSON file previewer. We are looking forward to another productive year. 
Hello everyone. Our big news this year is that we are pleased to announce that Scholars Portal Dataverse is changing its name to Borealis, the Canadian Dataverse Repository. Although it's a new look and new name, the core service remains the same. Borealis is a bilingual, multidisciplinary, secure Canadian research data repository supported by academic libraries and research institutions across Canada. The launch of the new name on May 31st was the culmination of a collaborative effort with a number of stakeholders to develop a name that reflects the new identity of the service. The new name is bilingual and evokes connections to the Canadian landscape. We are launching our new website for the platform on June 23rd at borealisdata.ca. There will be a new landing page with updated service descriptions, new use cases and metrics. A new about page will provide more details about the service and we will also feature our new policy documentation. Grant Hurley will present on our preservation work at the preservation session later this week. In terms of metrics, we now have 60 participating institutions and there are over 8,000 data sets, 180,000 files and 10 million downloads. Other highlights over the past year include the migration of our file storage to the Ontario Library Research Cloud, a secure, private, geographically distributed cloud storage network built with partner universities. Last year, we migrated the University of Alberta Dataverse to the national instance and John Huck will discuss this project later this week. Caitlin Newson developed the GeoJSON Previewer, which she will present in the geospatial ses session this week. We supported a cohort of institutions to prepare applications for Core Trust Seal certification this year. And we are developing our open, inclusive Dataverse community in collaboration with the Dataverse North Expert Group and with support of the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. And here are some of our planned future directions, including expanding the service to other academic institutions in Canada, migrating survey data from our Odyssey service, and developing infrastructure and guidance to support sensitive data sharing, and improving metrics for research impact analysis. If you have any questions, please get in touch with us. The Texas Data Repository Steering Committee would like to share our annual activity report for 2022. The institutions that represent TDR are Baylor, Texas A&M International, Texas A&M, Texas A&M Galveston, Texas State, Texas Tech, the University of Houston, University of Texas at Arlington, and the University of Texas. To start off on April 26, we uh, implemented the preservation workflow. We've also implemented Make Data Count. We decided that we needed our own data repository. And we also needed our DSpace uh, repository for articles and presentations. And so we put both of those together. The assessment committee did a wonderful user survey and provided us with a lot of data and information. They also did our annual reports for each school and showed us a lot of information about how the year has gone as well as previous years. We were very excited to look into the larger data set work that had happened in the past year and are looking into how we could implement this in the future with the steering committee. The Carpentries pilot has grown by leaps and bounds and has now become a Texas digital library service. We had our graduate student, Anya, who worked uh, more with integrating R and using APIs. We also had two graduate students who worked on Google Analytics and they put together a wonderful handbook for us to use in the future. We were honored to be able to participate in the OCLC study, looking at library collaboration in research data management. We did a lot of presentations. Uh, we worked with the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries we did presentations at Cross Timbers Library Collaborative. We also did preservations at the research, excuse me, presentations at the Research Data Access and Preservation Association Annual Summit. And we worked with the Research Integrity Working Group um, as part of the Texas Digital Library and did a presentation there this spring. And we also did our upgrade to the latest version. We really wanted to thank everybody in the community and at all the places where you all are doing all the things that keep us all going throughout the years. 
And finally, here's some work we've been doing at the individual institutions. You can see there's a lot of variation and um, a lot of progress. I also wanted to make sure and uh, thank Christina Chan for all of her hard work on this presentation and making the recording happen. Thank you all. We really look forward to connecting with you in the future uh, annual cycle. I'm Ying from State University, Shanghai, China. State University Social Science Data Repository has been released on December 2014. Up to now, there are 167 developers. There are 787 datasets, and there are more than 700,000 downloads and more than 10 million hits. Thank you. Hello. IIT Dataverse is the repository of the Italian Institute of Technology for Research Data Preservation and Sharing. The Italian Institute of Technology is a foundation funded by Italian state to conduct scientific research in the public interest for the purpose of technological development. IIT research is focused on four main research domains, robotics, nanomaterials, life tech, and computational sciences, all tackling pivotal scientific, technological, and societal challenges. IIT is spread all over Italy and count around 1,900 people in 93 research units. We are a very young installation. IIT Dataverse has been launched, in fact, in 2021. We enabled dataset publication starting from the end of last year. Our journey started from a survey to identify our researchers' needs and continued with a six-month pilot to get the user's feedback, involve the scientists, raise awareness and design the final configuration. We came out with this design, in which we created for each research group two dataverses, one for the private datasets and one for the public datasets. The user rights are diversified in the two collections. We are very much interested in possible future collaborations and the most interested lines of development are the improvement of subject-specific support for metadata using, for example, external control vocabularies and offering easy automatic tools for import and export of datasets from and to other repositories using standard formats. Thank you for the attention. Welcome everyone. Today we are bringing you the so-called repository, Cora Repository de Dades de Recerca. The Consortium of University Services of Catalonia, CESUC, was born in 2014 after merging infrastructures and library sector. CESUC's goal is to execute shared projects in a collaborative way to allow the Catalan universities increase their efficiency. In 2017, the Open Science Area was created to facilitate the adoption of the Open Science principles and actions. Regarding the management of research data, we support Catalan research system to publish research data following the FAIR principles. After a pilot period in March 2021, the repository was open for the entire Catalan research system. It is a multidisciplinary repository designed for the big amount of data. The repository is currently used by 29 institutions, 11 universities and 18 circle research centers. We have brought together different services for researchers under our common image, CORA. Catalan Open Research Area. In addition to the data repository, we offer a tool to execute data management and the Research Portal of Catalonia. The portal allows you to view and disseminate the research activity in Catalonia from a single site. We are already indexed in platforms such as OpenAir, Google and Datasite. We have linked the repository with the Research Portal by making the datasites more visible. We have signed a digital preservation agreement with the Madroño Consortium, based in Madrid, by which we exchange copies of the repositories. We have also translated the software into Catalan, as it is Catalonia's own language. We are now very focused on organizing the repository, specifically developing rules for functioning and establishing procedures to carry out things. 
We have a work plan that aims to advance the functionalities of the repository. In the long term, what we are most concerned about is improving the interoperability of metadata on different platforms and obtaining the core trust seal. We are also focused on extending the use of the repository. The current repository usage is still low and uneven across institutions. We currently have over 160 published datasets. And that's all. Thank you for your time and we look forward to welcome you at any time in Barcelona. Hello, we present the National University of Rosario Academic Data Repository. Our university is one of the network of national research universities in Argentina. Highlights to remember of Rosario, National Flag Memorial and Messi, a football player born here. Along with the journals portal and the institutional repository RedKeep UNR, RDA UNR supports our university open science initiatives which serve a large academic community. We started by conducting a survey to understand the needs of our community and found that very few researchers had experience with data creation and publication. For that reason, we decided to involve researchers from different disciplines in our data repository planning process. During many virtual sessions, we learned about the data workflows and management practices, worked with them to organize and describe their data sets and use the test dataverse installation to upload and curate their data. Librarians also learn data curation in this process. We also develop best practices, documentation, and a consulting workflow to help our first-time users. Our policies and user agreements are inspired by the work of the global Dataverse community and by existing legislation. Because guidance is so important in our context, we translated the Dataverse user guide into Spanish. We invite the Spanish-speaking Dataverse community to use this translation available on our website. We are officially opening the repository in August and looking forward to the work ahead and to show the world the outcomes of our research. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you. Thank you to all of the uh, installations that shared their updates. Again, um, if you are able to tweet, the hashtag is Dataverse with a capital D 2022. And we have shared uh, the welcome band, the banner that we're using for our um, meeting this year, as well as public notes document. So we are going to move on to Gustavo, who is going to Give us updates on the Dataverse software, new features and future plans. Most of you already know Gustavo. He's the technical lead and architect of Dataverse. And he works here at IQSS. He's been in the Dataverse in many roles since the beginning as lead architect and technical design, uh, technical design of the platform. He reviews codes from internal and external developers and assists the community contribu contributions and overall work of the development project team. Welcome, Gustavo. Thank you. Um, so I was all excited. I thought I had 30 minutes and I was ready to talk slower to pace than I normally talk because if you've seen me present before, I usually tend to speak a little fast. Um, but I think it's a nice sign of success that we have so many new installations that you know the video was, was a nice size and um, I'll do my best to get through these slides in the time. If there doesn't end up being enough room for questions at the end, there's a lot of different breakout sessions that will talk about a lot of the different things that are in these slides. So hope there'll be room then um, throughout the whole course of the week in the meeting. Um, so as Sonia said, I'm Gustavo Duran. I'm the tech lead and architect. Um, I most of the people at this meeting, I presume, are already aware of Dataverse and are you know part of the community already. But I'm sure that there are some new people that are here to learn. Um, so I'll go through a quick little intro to Dataverse. Um, you, a lot of you have already seen the, these slides before, but uh, Dataverse is an open source platform to publish site and archive research data. And in particular, we've built it so it can support multiple different types of data, users, and workflows. Uh, we develop it out of IQSS at Harvard. It's been 
around for 16 years since 2006. Uh, there was a predecessor before that as well. And the funding is provided in combination by IQSS and Harvard and then grants that are how we collaborate with the community and our partners around the world. We do have a core team at IQSS, which consists of developers, designers, the UI UX team, metadata specialists, the curation team with Sonia and Dwayne, the leadership team um, and all that. Uh, so if I'm giving a presentation to people who aren't aware about Dataverse, normally here I have a bunch of different slides where I detail a lot of the different features. Um, here, I'll just point you to this website. We recently updated this page to get more of the later features in and everything. The main thing I want to point out, though, is that a core principle of how we develop Dataverse is that we have the core code focus on the publishing, just the, you know, citing, sharing your data, versioning, permissions, et cetera, and supporting the fair data principles. And we let what I would actually say is the more fun stuff, but the visualizations and explorations work with Dataverse using our robust APIs. So that's we have external tools for that. And then, you know, there's all the other APIs for harvesting and other ways of sharing with other repositories and, and software. Um, and I always talk a little bit about the technology. Uh, we are a Java web application in the past. The last time I had to present pre-COVID, uh, this would be Glassfish, but we've since moved to PyR5. You'll notice there's asterisk there in a Java EE8. That's because we are actively working on updating it to PyR6. Um, we already actually have a PR ready for it, but we're waiting. PyR6 is not yet ready for production. Um, we're waiting on them. They're waiting on the spec for Java EE10. Um, that's why that one has an asterisk. But basically, it's a Java web app. We use the EE for lots of different layers, and we have you know, a Postgres database and different ways to store the files, whether it's local or S3 or Swift, things like that. OK, now let me talk a little bit about the community. You guys all saw that wonderful video and saw lots of different individual aspects of the community, but hopefully this will bring it all together a little bit. Um, so being an open source project, you know, the code and the documentation is all available on GitHub, and we have 140 GitHub contributors who have you know, made a pull request at some point. And like I said, that includes not just code, but even documentation changes, working on the guides, things like that. Um, but I think the majority of them are probably have done some aspect of code. And that even can be a small one line, two line bug fix, or it can be a major new feature, as we'll see a little bit when I talk about some of the recent updates from this past year. That said, beyond that, the community itself is hundreds of members large. There's, you know, besides the developers, there's researchers, there's libraries, there's data scientists, there's all of you guys, basically. Um, and with that community, ways that we work together, we conduct workshops and trainings. This meeting is an example, and there, or there'll be an example of the training during this meeting. Um, but we also hold those as needed um, for individual organizations or more generally um, group group kind of trainings. We do UI UX testing and interviews to work on the when we work on features, especially the ones that are going to be UI heavy. Um, there's the Global Dataverse Consortium Community Consortium, and I'll talk briefly about that in a second. Um, and then there are the different ways that we try to maintain communication and collaboration with the with the community. So there's an email list, at Dataverse Google Groups. There's Matrix for chatting. There's also more recently, we also added a community Slack, so another way to do some, some chatting with the team um, and other members of the community. And if you're not a member of those and you know you want to be part of the community, you want to be involved, make sure to join them. It's you know it's easy, it's free, and then you'll you know receive emails and be able to communicate and like I said, chat in the in the other two options. We do do bi-weekly community calls. Um, so every two weeks we have a call with the community where we set up some agenda where we talk about you know, whatever updates we have out of here at QSS, we also talk about updates from the GDCC. And then if there are specific community updates or and or we open it up to questions from anyone in discussion. And, you know, sometimes these meetings, if we don't have much of an agenda, run fairly quickly, but oftentimes they take the full hour and have a lot of robust discussion and conversation. Uh, we do two calls, actually, because, you know, we have one call that is really timed so that it works for the US and then Europe as well. So it's, you know, early morning, our time. Um, well, for me, early morning, probably other people think it's late morning, uh, it's 10 or 11, uh, but that works for Europe and our time and can get in the, the early birds from California and things like that. Um, but then to be able to support Asia and Australia and that part of the, the, the world, we have one that is on Monday night, our time and, you know, Tuesday morning in that part of the world. And then lastly, we host an annual community meeting. That's this. Um, I presented last week at Open Repositories and I had a little parentheses saying next week, uh, but now we're here. So... So the Global Dataverse Consortium, Community Consortium, um, there's gonna be one of the breakout groups a little bit later, I believe it's today, but there, I think there's two of them during the week um, to support again, different time, time zones and different 
from different users. But the general goal of it is to support Dataverse repositories around the world. And that can be as simple as grouping together the different installations to get data site membership and get your DOIs to helping sys administration for those installations that don't have the resources necessary to run their own Dataverse and need some help with that to figuring out, you know, if some one installation has a little bit of budget, another one has another little bit of budget, combining that and combining maybe two or three or four to be able to hire contractors to help work on some code to add a new feature to the Dataverse. Uh, so there's a link here. When you get the slides, you'll be able to go to learn more about the GDCC. But I said, but like I said, there's a governance of GDCC breakout groups later this week as well. Uh, so we saw all the videos. And so this is a more, you know, putting together. We, as far as we know, from self-reporting installations, we have 80 installations around the world. Um, you can see on the map, they're all over the world. I particularly am excited because as you saw in the video in August, we'll have the Hopefully it'll be more than the 81st. Hopefully we'll have a few more before then, but at least the 81st one out of Argentina. And I've been very excited. We can finally balance out that little group of Brazilian uh, data verses with an Argentine one. Um, and yeah, so a little bit more about the individual parts of the, the, the metrics. Um, and this is based on 61 of the 80 installations because there are some Dataverse installations that are running older versions that don't yet have the matrix APIs. And then the, some of the newer Dataverse installations we haven't yet added to the list of the installations that we gather these metrics. But from the 61 that we can ping the API to get information, we have almost 12,000 Dataverse collections, over 200,000 data sets, over 2 million files, and those files have been downloaded 50, more than 56 million times. Um, it's fun because last week, again, I gave this presentation and the number of data sets was just under 200,000, but it's, I'm excited to be able to now say over 200,000 data sets. Uh, and you can go view those and other metrics at dataverse.org slash metrics. Okay, so now let me focus on some of the newer features that have come out within the past year from, from last community meeting to this meeting. Um, and I'm only gonna be able to talk about a few, obviously, because time is limited and a lot of work has happened in the past meeting. I'm gonna focus on some that I think are more interesting. Um, I've tried to focus on ones that came with some or most of the work from the community, um, just to, you know, Bring it to you guys and yeah so and if you and if you've been coming to the community calls on a bi-weekly basis often you are probably already aware of most of these but hopefully there's something new for everybody um, the first is embargo this is something that's been wanted added from the beginning of dataverse basically and there are always work around ways to do it by restricting files but it was never a true embargo so now in if you have one of the more later versions of dataverse you can make content inaccessible until the embargo end date um, and this is actually configurable per installation. And so you can turn it on or off. And when you turn it on, you also can decide whether an embargo can last indefinitely, or you can say, you know what, users can only embargo up to a, a year, for example. And, and, the, and this was worked on in partnership with the Don's group. Um, and we worked collaborated closely with them to get the design. And this is where we did a lot of like UI UX testing and things like that. But Don's did the core of the code coding for it. Um, similarly, they also worked on the custom licenses. So again, from the beginning, you could always set a license on, on a data set in Dataverse, um, but you were limited to either picking CC0 or having to define the license at, in the custom data set terms section. So now, instead, you're able to add as many standard licenses as you would like. They're easy to register. You just have a JSON file for them. We provide JSON for a lot of the standard licenses, and then you load them in the ones you want. Um, and then if user, if you still want, you can still allow for custom data set terms if there's something outside your license. But what's nice is you can also remove that and only allow the licenses. Um, we obviously didn't want that before when it was only CC0, but now that you can set the four, five, six licenses you want users to pick from, you can say, well, and that should, you know, you don't want to deal with custom stuff or you can allow it. It's flexible again per installation. The next feature is something, again, this was worked on by Slava and his group, and this is external control vocabularies. Um, so we've always had control vocabularies, but they were defined within Dataverse. Uh, there are advantages to doing it within Dataverse, uh, which as well, but there are advantages to have external control vocabularies. I think the main one being that as they get updated, you don't have to manually do anything. If the external control vocabulary adds some new values and you're pinging them via the API directly, you, they will automatically be added. Um, so the user basically it allows users to pick external from external vocabularies that's done via API. An example is Cosmos. Um, and there's a lot of flexibility around this. You can decide which fields are mapped. You can decide whether they have to pick from the list or whether free text is allowed. 
um, and you know, basically which vocabularies are used. And one thing that's also useful about this is that by using this, it allows a little more flexibility than the internal ones again, because as you saw, I think in one of the videos, they had they used the external con controlled vocabulary for their list of authors. And obviously that's going to be installation specific and not unique. And so they can they don't have to worry about modifying the core aspects to get the, in their authors. They can use that through the external controlled vocabularies. Um, and as I mentioned previously, you know, we're focusing on the core code, but we have these APIs. And so what the APIs allow is these external tools. Um, and so in the past year, a couple of tools that have been developed that are very exciting is, I think it was mentioned in the video from Scholars Portal, now Borealis, um, but the map previewer. And so there'll be more talk about that during the geospatial breaking group, breakout group, but it supports GeoJSON files. You get a nice little map like you can see on the slide in your preview window. Um, and that previewer is already available at the GDCC repo. We recently added it to Harvard Dataverse um, and to Demo Dataverse if you wanna check it out. Um, and a more recent previewer that was added was the zip file previewer. And you'll notice there's a little plus there um, because it's not just a previewer. It actually uses this new functionality that we added to our access API that allows you to get a range of a file. And so besides just being a viewer of the files, it can actually unpack and download individuals' files too. And we reached out to the developers. This was made, done by the Max Planck Society, and they are going to contribute that as well to the GDCC repo. So coming soon for, for that one, if, if that's of interest for your installation. And there's much more. Um, I'm not going to have time to go into detail on this, but we've added data curation labels. We've enhanced private URLs with anonymized access for support of double blind review. There's a new experimental data set migration API, which helps installations when they're starting up to be able to migrate from other systems. We've had a heavy focus on improving accessibility. Outside the core for external, there's a GitHub action to upload a GitHub repository or a subset of GitHub, of GitHub repo into a Dataverse. There's the ability now in the metrics repo to run a version that just shows local um, metrics and also can just get a Dataverse collections worth of metrics instead of just for the entire installation. And dot, 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 because there's even more than that. Um, and if you go through the GitHub and you look at each of the releases from you know, the past year, you can see all the, the, the fun stuff that's been added. And as of yesterday, we have released Dataverse 5.11. So that was very exciting. Um, it's out there now. If you go to GitHub, you can go to this link and you'll be able to see the release notes. I think there's almost 20 different bullets of things that were added from different bug fixes to some new features to technical updates. Um, I know we updated the prime faces, the most recent version of prime versus prime faces. And sometime later today, we're, that should be on demo.dataverse.org. Um, we released the code yesterday, and usually we release the code, and then sometime later that day or the next day, we go ahead and deploy it to demo. So if you want to try it out, try it later this afternoon or evening on, on uh, demo dataverse, and you can see it. Um, and since I like talking about features, I'll mention one feature. And again, this contrib contrib community contributed, but KU Levin worked on this, and it's the ability to mute notifications. Uh, this is set up at the installation level. You can turn it on or off. Um, and when you turn it on, you can make sure that some notifications are always on. So for example, request access is a feature that if it didn't have notifications would be pretty useless. Um, and so that you can say always, you have to receive notifications for request access. You can also turn off notifications that you feel your installation never needs to use. Um, and then the remaining, you can let the user configurable. And then what that allows is the user goes to their own web page for their user account. They go to the notifications tab and they can turn on and off their notifications and they can do both. They can say they wanna get email, but not in app, or they can say they want in app and not in email, or they can want both or neither. So there's a lot of fun configuration, both at the installation and user level for that. So future plans, uh, basically, what is it that we're currently working on? What is it that we're looking towards in this for this next year worth of work basically? Um, so, here, I'll focus a little bit more on what the Dayverse team at Harvard is doing. Um, obviously, the community is still going to be doing stuff for this next year, but uh, we'll let the community just talk about what they're working on as, as in the different working groups. Um, there are two big projects that we're a part of. The first is the Harvard Data Commons, um, which is a collaboration across multiple groups in Harvard. And the second one is the NIH Gray program. Um, and that consists of an individual proposal that we have made. And as well, NIH likes to work in this cooperation co mode where they get a bunch of different repositories together and we are working together with our competitors basically um, and for this it consists of six reposit general repos repositories dataverse is one of them but then there's dryad big share mendeley osf nibley 
In addition to that, we have what we always have, which is support of Harvard Dataverse. Um, that includes working on tickets when they come in to help support individual users as they have some problem, want to make some change, want to understand how to use the system, to making some feature changes that Sonia requests because it will help our users and in that help the community as well because you know, generally the kinds of things that our users want are the kinds of things community wants, just like vice versa, things community wants are things we want. Um, and in that, we continue facilitating the community development. All those features that we meant, I mentioned earlier that were worked on the community, uh, while the core coding was done by them, they reached out to us. We worked on them with the UI design. We did some technical design. We did reviewing of the code and, you know, worked through it to, to get it merged into the core code. So a little more about the Harvard Data Commons. Um, like I said, it's collaboration between Dataverse and IQSS, and then like medical school, the libraries, business school, basically the idea is to automate the flow of research data from research computing environments to management, publication, discovery, and presentation environments. Two minutes, Gustavo. What's that? Two minutes, time. Um, it consists of three primary objectives, which is automating the technical pipeline between the research community infrastructure and Dataverse, enhancing Dataverse to support machine actionable workflows of various types, and automating connections between research system and key library systems used. Um, so I'm gonna have to go through these fast because I originally, like I said, thought I had 30 minutes. Um, but for each of those objectives, I highlighted one of the features. For objective one, really we're focused on getting the Globus integration into the code. We're doing that as an external tool that we wanna uh, integrate into the Dataverse upload workflow. Um, for objective two, it's all about computational workflow support. So we've added a new metadata block. We've also added a new facet data set feature which is nice because it can be used for computational workflow, but can also be used for, if you wanna highlight other metadata blocks like geospatial or one of the domain metadata blocks. And it has additional functions of automate, automatic checksum validation um, on bagot files and other things that are to support workflows. Objective three is actually broken up into three, three into two, into three A and three B. The first one is really about adding more robust archiving features for S3, which includes a new archive status API and an admin display for that. Um, the second is to create some bio-directional notification of related resources. And so we're, it, that adds the ability to send and receive linked data notifications showing relationships between data sets and papers or other resources. We eventually want to be compliant with the core notify protocol, um, which is a general protocol for notifying between different systems. And a bonus feature that was added with, by that was the ability to add custom instructions to templates. Um, we have that for this because we want to be able to make sure to um, augment the fact that right, right, on writing a template, you are putting in related publications that the information will go to, for example, on Harvard Dash. Um, and so this was done in a general way that can support other custom instructions on templates. Uh, okay, so I'm not gonna have a lot of time to talk about the NIH Gray. The good news is that there is another meet breakout group or uh, I think actually a, a plenary in a little bit talking about the NIH Gray grant and the, and the data management plans. Um, but basically, it's a multi-year program. I mentioned it's co repetition. Um, in the first year, these are the different tasks we're interested in looking at and visiting. Um, everything from remote large st st storage support, which is in line with what we're doing for Harvard Data Commons, for example, with that Globus integration, to control vocabulary for biomedical, to the DDI, CDI, to workflows. Um, like I said, since I'm running out of time, I'm not going to be able to go through all this, uh, but it, it also involves training. There'll be a training this in this meeting, so that's a nice example of us working on this, this project. If you're interested in learning more in general about everything we're working on in the team here, there's a link to the roadmap here. It describes our strategic goals and also describes what we're implementing, what we're planning, what we're future. We're working on updating that, so keep an eye on it in the next few days and week and everything, and it will be being updated with all the latest and greatest from what we're working on and learning here. So that's it. Uh, Thank you. Sadly, there's not time for questions, but there should be time at questions for all the different breakout groups. All these things are covered in different groups throughout the next few days. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Gustavo. Great updates. Thanks. I've been trying to tweet, but it's kind of hard to tweet and manage this at the same time. So Dataverse 2022 with a capital D is the hashtag for social media. And right now I'd like to welcome Dr. Gary King, who is the Albert J. Weather III University Professor at Harvard and the Director of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. Um, the Albert J. Weather III University Professor is, um, is a, a title that is given to one of the 25 with Harvard's most distinguished faculty title um, at Harvard University. He develops an, uh, King 
Dr. King develops and applies empirical methods in many areas of social sciences, focusing on innovations that span the range from statistical theory to practical application. And of course, Dr. King is the PI on the Dataverse project. Welcome, Gary. Thanks so much, Sanya. <clears throat> thanks, Gustavo. Um, thanks to the team and thanks to the, the great presentations from this morning. Um, uh, it's uh, amazing the work uh, that you're all doing and the, and the really incredible pro pro um, progress that we're all making together. Um, <clears throat> I've used these welcome sessions over the years to address different topics, um, the, the really important impact we've been having on the scientific community, the generation of new knowledge, the commitment we all have to improving the basic underlying infrastructure of, of science. The last time we were we were together in person, I threw marshmallows at you for good scientific reasons, if you remember. Um, um, uh, we, we've, we've made uh, really incredible progress even through even through the, the pandemic, and I'm, I'm really proud of, of everything that we've done together. <clears throat> um, this year, I thought I'd address something a little bit different, which is um, why in the world should your university and ours support the kinds of things we're doing? I mean, really, why don't they use the money to to give it to students or, or give it to faculty or, or, or build a new climbing wall for, for, the, for the undergraduates. I mean, why don't they do something else? Like why, why, why do they need to give money to, 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 to your little shop? Um, I thought that might, that, that is on occasion, the thing that you focus on when, when the Dean comes asking uh, for your uh, end of year justification. Um, so here's, what, here's why. The goal of universities, their reason for existence is the creation, preservation and distribution of knowledge. That's what it is, the creation, preservation, and distribution of knowledge. Dataverse makes a massive contribution to all three. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> if, <clears throat> if, if you're gonna do, if a university is gonna do what it is supposed to be doing, then, um, then you should be supporting Dataverse. Okay, but you might ask, why does my university need to pay to, to make a contribution here when all the others are contributing. I mean, why don't we just free ride? I mean, it, it, all this stuff comes free, right? Well, the rule in business is the more I give you, the less I have. The rule in academia is the more I give you, the more I have. Um, we compete by cooperating. If, <clears throat> if I write a paper and I let you read it, maybe you'll learn something. And maybe you'll find something wrong and tell me and I'll learn something. If I give you my data, <clears throat> um, you might learn something, but maybe you'll find something that helps me improve too. If I give you my replication data set, I'll get to publish. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and you, you might make faster progress than, than, uh, uh, um, than you would have otherwise. Um, for more than 30 years, I, would, I require students in my uh, intro methods class to go find a, 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 an article they really like and replicate it, um, just, just replicate the tables and figures, bringing them up to the cutting edge, right? And it used to be that, that three quarters of the semester was this work that would go on behind the scenes while they would write letters to, 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 to scholars, hoping that they might give them access. And, and I, I would reserve an entire class for the horrific stories. They were hilarious and, un, and, and terrible about how difficult it was to get data from somebody else. Now, I give them the replication assignment and, and that night they go to, they go to Dataverse and they, get, um, they, they pick out a replication data set. It's completely changed the way I teach and of course, many, 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 many others do, do as well. Um, universities, of course, they were even giving away teaching now with MOOCs because it, why is that? Because they give it away and it makes them, it may make someone else better, but also if they, uh, we see how they react, we see what the, we see what they learn, and then it makes our teaching better. If I contribute code to an open source project like Dataverse, the community gets more and I get more too, right? I get the features that I, that I want. I get to steer the open source project a little bit in the direction that I want. And of course, since we're all in a similar boat doing similar things, uh, if someone else contributes to the open source project and I don't, I'm not part of that at all, I'm gonna benefit as well. But, but you know, there's only so long that you can 
eavesdrop on a conversation and still learn, right? It's much better to eavesdrop and then occasionally make a contribution yourself. It's helpful when someone's giving a talk like right now, if someone asks a question, which I encourage you to do, because it's hard to listen for hours and hours without saying anything. If you contribute something, you get more. Um, so it's a, so it works. It works the same way. The same way here. If I merely use Dataverse, I actually get something, of course. But I also contribute something. If I find a bug and tell others, everybody's going to benefit. In fact, if I just run into a bug, the team will find that bug, even if I don't tell anybody about it. So if you just use Dataverse, if someone is just using it, we'll all benefit. Um, and of course, if you learn something of value to society, we all we all benefit. Um, Dataverse extends the idea of the more we give away, the more we have by solving the social and political problems with technology rather than balancing. We try to make sure that everybody can have 100% of what they want without actually having to, to, to split, split things. Um, actually, when, when we first created um, the predecessor to Dataverse, um, we would automatically FTP across campus because everybody wanted the what was Dataverse at the time in one computer, it only existed in one computer, there was no internet, right? So it was in one computer um, in, the, in, the, in what, what is now IQSS in the data center. Um, and you would go to that one computer and you'd do, it, you'd do a search on, on, the, on the data that was available. Um, but there were people across campus that wanted it also. So we worked out automatic FTP to, to, people, to people across campus. Um, and so that way we didn't have to, we didn't have to have it in one place or the other place. We had it in both places. Of course, if we had figured that out, we would have invented the internet, but so would have lots of other people, unfortunately. Anyway, we also walked 20 miles through the snow to get to school, just so you know. Um, uh, so uh, the, the original motivation for Dataverse, the, re the reason I, I, I started working on it originally was to break the bad choice for the research scientist. Right, so the research scientists, they, they always have the choice. Um, we wanted to make, to get them to make data available. Um, and and um, you may know this article I wrote um, in 1995 called Replication, Replication, trying to get people to make data available. And what, what the research scientists would do at the time was they would, they would make the following choice. They would either have the data, control the data, decide who gets the data. I would give it to you. You would have to cite me if, you, if I give it to you. And maybe I, you would even promise not to criticize me and then I would give you the data. That's of course not particularly useful from a public perspective, but I, as the, as, as the researcher would get credit, right? Because the coin of the realm is citation. The alternative is I could do the right thing and send it to an archive, the ICPSR, National Centers for Health Statistics or, or wherever. And they would have offsite, off-site backup, disaster recovery, preservation formatting, formatting, and a baby version of all the cool things that, that Gustavo was talking about, all done by hand, of course. But they would have preservation, right? <clears throat> they would have uh, standard metadata. They'd have professional documentation. The, the, it, would be, it would be preserved in perpetuity, right? So either I control the data, but if I move, I'd probably lose it, or I'd put it in the, in the, in the archive. The problem with putting it in the archive it is not preservation, of course it's preserved, but if someone else wanted the data, well, they could go to the ICPSR and get the data. That's really terrific, right? Well, it's terrific for them, but it's not so terrific for the researcher if, if, if they get the data from the ICPSR and they thank the ICPSR, which, abs which absolutely deserves credit. I don't mean to pick on the ICPSR. They're, they're of course part of our club as well, and, and we're part of theirs. Um, and and uh, but but or, or, and we're, we're also an archive, right? So so if they just send it to an archive and the archive preserves things and people thank the archive, absolutely the archive deserves credit. But we need we need to we realized originally devolve the credit back to the researcher because I might have spent three years crawling through bug infested fields to collect the data, and you're thanking who? Right, so we just we just work out citation standards, which of course we've done, and we've broken the bad choice. So it's no longer the case that you need to either preserve the data or get credit. Now you get both. You can go to my my uh, web page, my my you know my own homepage, GaryKing.org, and you get um, all my tabs, and one of my tabs is my Dataverse. And it's branded as mine. It looks like mine. All the cool services that that are in Dataverse look like they're mine. But if my website disappears, that 
that page, that dataverse, that Gary King dataverse will be will be there. You all know this, of course. But that breaks that breaks the um, the the difficulty of working together. <clears throat> it makes it possible without balancing to work together more. It makes it easier to give away more so we get more. And it turns out there's lots of other things. Um, Gustavo mentioned GitHub. Right? So GitHub was not designed for archiving, but people sort of started to use it like that. You know, this thing's there, it's, it's there. But, you know, Microsoft, which owns GitHub, doesn't make any permanence promise. You, know, you sort of figure, well, it's going to be there for a while. But yeah, I mean, if they start losing a lot of money from it, you wouldn't expect it to be there for, 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 for forever. Um, <clears throat> they're not in the position to make those, kind, those kinds of promises. And so what we do is eliminate the, the choice like we're cool with GitHub, we use GitHub, right? We, we don't wanna, we don't wanna make it, we don't need to be competitive. Um, we, need, we need to help, we need to give away more and get more. So we put a little button on GitHub and at, at the right moment, you, a, a researcher that uses GitHub can push a button and it will go to, uh, to, put, to push the a current snapshot into Dataverse. There's also, um, Gustavo also mentioned the Harvard Data Commons, which will unquestionably have to be renamed because this is a totally another project called Data Commons, of course, unfortunately, and it's completely unrelated. You can look at datacommons.org, which is a, an audacious plan to, to instead of Dataverse, which has you know, the world's data sets, a heterogeneous variety of data sets, <clears throat> Data Commons seeks to take all the world's public, completely public data sets and make one database where you know, New York means the same thing in all the databases, et cetera. And so then, then it would be possible to, um, to do, and it is possible to do um, uh, 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 all, all kinds of very cool automated analyses. Well, you know, we've been working with them and lots of other people, GitHub and everyone else, and we find a way to work together so that, um, so that our competitor is also our, 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 our cooperator. And uh, when you use that, that, the big question that comes up is, well, what's the providence of all this? I mean, how did you merge all these data sets together? Well, they have a record. And the way that uh, the, way the thing would work is there's a button, sort of like on GitHub, and, you can, you, and we're working on this now, so that they'll, they'll, they'll be a, they'll, if, you, if you take data from that and you use it and you find it useful in your research, you'll be able to put a, push a button and get a replication data set put into, into Dataverse. Um, <clears throat> with an institution behind it. Very few commercial firms um, have any way to make a serious preservation promise. Even if they say it, I mean, there's, there's nothing that stops them. For, there's, just, there's no institutional way for a private firm, which is set up to you know, maximize shareholder value or whatever, um, uh, to, to do the kinds of things that, that we do with serious, trusted, longstanding institutions um, backing up our promises. Uh, you know, if you look at the top 10 companies from 100 years ago, you wouldn't, you, you, you might remember them, but you wouldn't recognize, they wouldn't be on today's top 10 list. But if you look at the top universities or even the top uh, hundreds of universities from 100 years ago, most of them would still be, would still be here. Um, um, so uh, we have hundreds of journals now that requ work, require replication dataverse, data sets to be put into Dataverse. They make the journals better um, and they make Dataverse better. Um, so we're happy to give that to them because it makes them better, it makes us better. Um, you all compete with us. Your universities compete with Harvard. You steal faculty from us, we steal faculty from you. You, you, you swipe students from us, we swipe students from you. Um, but we couldn't be working more closely together uh, to build Dataverse. It's a crazy field, but a really wonderful field that we all get to be in where cooperation makes, makes our uh, competitive position better. Um, that's not true in many other sectors, but it's really terrific that it is, it is true for, for us. Um, by the way, even if a private company um, privately installs Dataverse behind a firewall so it's not shared, they don't come to the community meeting, there's, there's nothing public about it, um, uh, they use it internally, even that is, is a contribution to us. Um, they'll be training people to use Dataverse. They'll be training people probably to make some changes to Dataverse. They might find some bugs. They, they might even want us to fix them. Uh, they might want to influence the direction that the open source project goes. Um, they might want features that, that they could suggest. Even that's a good thing. <clears throat> um, uh, and there are private companies that do that. 
Um, so what we're doing together is not an easy thing. Like we should really recognize that. Um, uh, the Dataverse app is a lot more sophisticated than tools that are extremely widely used, like Gmail, let's say, right? But, like that's pretty good, pretty good product. Product, but the number of features in Dataverse far exceeds something like that. If we do it together, though, it's easier, and we all get better at it. So by by working together, we push science forward. The world learns more. It is really true that by what you do, everyone lives happier, healthier, more fulfilling lives. Um, when we're working on Dataverse, we're we're sometimes on the, the front lines um, and sometimes far from the front lines of research discovery, um, but those front lines wouldn't be uh, as far away and wouldn't be moving as fast if it wasn't for us. So congratulations, uh, thanks for all that you do. Um, and thanks uh, for work, working together with us um, and with each other. And we look forward to uh, what comes next. Thank you, Gary, very much. Thanks, Anya. Happy to take questions if anybody has or um, whatever. We do have time for questions, so. We could also we could also say uh, for me or or Gustavo who has uh, who didn't have time to um, put questions in there. I have a question, Gary. Uh, what is the relation? What is the relation? I see the, the chat. What is the relation of the Microsoft Dataverse and the Harvard Dataverse? Okay, that's a good question. And <clears throat> there's a there's uh, we we discovered the Microsoft Dataverse was using was using this name, which is our name. Um, we talked to them. Uh, we <clears throat> we came to an agreement. Um, and part of the agreement is that we can't tell anybody about the agreement. So, <laughs> so I, all I can say is that um, it was a good, it was, it, it was a good outcome. So, yeah, question asked and answered on how to deal with Microsoft ownership of GitHub. Yeah, that's right. So they own GitHub. That's perfectly fine. Um, you know, GitHub makes a big contribution. Um, Microsoft has been a supporter of of uh, of lots of things we do, including Dataverse directly. They've given us they've given us funds to support Dataverse uh, over over the years, and we're working with the Microsoft team at GitHub. Microsoft is a little like like uh, many of our universities, where where each like Harvard is is it, it's really a flotilla of of loosely related entities <laughs> that sometimes know what each other's doing and sometimes not. So and maybe any questions for Gustavo on the presentation on the features and updates as well. Okay, I think then we're all set. Thank you very much, Gary. Thanks everybody. Okay, so I am going to um, see if our keynote speaker is here yet, and she is they are not here yet. So I'm going to uh, wait until nine thirty to introduce Steve McCurt, Steve from um, Australia Data Archives, and then we will start our keynote. So it looks like we will have a little break unless there are other questions for Gary before he hangs around or. Hey, what, what other big changes <clears throat> or directions would you all suggest we go after? Like where's the big, do you see big needs in your institutions for things that Dataverse, thing, things that Dataverse isn't now tackling um, and might be, um, uh, we, we might, you tackle. There's a lot of things adjacent to data to Dataverse that we haven't taken on, but might. Um, Alyssa says storage for for sensitive data. Yeah, that's very interesting, right? Um, uh, we do have, you know, we have a project um, with uh, OpenDP. So this is another project we have at IQSS. So OpenDP is um, Open Differential Privacy. Maybe some of you know how differential privacy works. Um, uh, but the but 
in, in the way the way I like to think about it is that we are um, we need to switch the, um, the the standard for how data is uh, given to other researchers. Like right now, we have a regime which is a data sharing regime, which is um, we follow certain rules and we give you the data. But then you have the data, and if you violate the rules, then you know then the privacy of our research subjects is violated. Differential privacy completely changes things. It gives mathematical guarantees for the privacy of research subjects. If you have a cell phone in your pocket, there's differential privacy in your pocket. Um, the United States Census Bureau just released data in differentially private format, which gives, as I said, mathematical guarantees for privacy. It doesn't. It doesn't depend upon how hard we try. It depends upon it gives the guarantee to the research subject. And the rough idea is, is you take a, a data set and you add specially calibrated random numbers to the, to the data set. Um, uh, and you, you just, just enough randomness to make it impossible to identify the row that is your information. Um, but when you do an analysis of the whole data, if you do the analysis appropriately now with measurement error, you can get roughly the same answers. As long as you're asking questions that involve the whole, um, uh, you know, the, the patterns rather than the individuals, right? We're, I would say we're social scientists. So we, what well, we care about everybody, we don't care about anybody, right? So we, we're interested in the, the patterns, not, not who you are. Um, and so with differentially private data, it is possible to do that. So OpenDP um, is, is, a, a move, is a, a, another open source project, sort of parallel to Dataverse, but we're, we're connecting them. So in Dataverse, it's going to be possible for you to release different to release data in differentially private format. No matter how sensitive, um, it is possible to release data that way. So that's one way we'll attack it. Um, uh, Alyssa and Sebastian might ha have other uh, other versions of this. Of course, you might want to actually give people the original data. Um, let's see what else we got here. Hey, Rob, Robin gives, uh, says, um, uh, help librarians in the global south to effectively use Dataverse in their institutions and break the bad incentives for sharing in poor, poorer countries. Uh, Robin, I wonder if you have a second whether you could unmute yourself and tell us a little bit more about that. I'd love to hear uh, a bit more about how we might do that. We, we of course, have been trying to do that in in the global globe, uh, you know, and even in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and everywhere else, for a long time. But tell us about the special needs needs there, and and you might want to tell us where where you're from as well. Okay, thanks, Gary. Um, enjoyed your talk. Uh, I, I went to a, a conference in India recently, um, Library Technology Conclave, and. Um, and it, and it, and it was and I, and I was I did a workshop on RDM for librarians and um, they're very into it and they were proud of the number of um, repositories, data repositories they already have in India maybe government agency ones but but they're aware they're not being used and there was there was a sense like the, with the whole open research message that um, that uh, you know academics are similar to what you said about the progress we've made, um, you know, in the West or North, um, that that now there we have broken the incentives. I feel like they haven't been able to do that because they feel like they still need to compete even more with things like high impact journals and keeping data to themselves for their capital. And it's even harder for them to overcome those um, those incentives. So um, I've been wondering what how we how we can help and i know the librarians want to set up data repositories but they're worried they won't get used yeah we might we might start by just giving them access to uh, to a um a, a dataverse um what are we calling it you know our virtual archive the, the um uh like, like the one on my website we could just give them that then they don't have to install anything they could experiment with it they could get a feel for it um uh, um, and then from there, then maybe we can, you know, invite them into our club. Um, uh, is India in particular a place where which we should go after first? 
I don't know, it's just somewhere I attended a conference. I also went to the core conference, um, Confederation of Open Access Repositories, which which has these issues in mind. So I think it's 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 everywhere. There's the, um, the, the as the, the North and West academics take on open research, then even you know the 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 researchers um, elsewhere can can read the material, but they have barriers to sharing in the same way. I think. All right. All right. And we have connected with with India over the past several years, Gary. One being the Gates Foundation, but we've also gone to um, ITT Ropar um, and Chandigarh and Gujarat and New Delhi, and they were very open to DataVerse. But again, they do have those barriers to data sharing, the question is always, why should we share it? How can I protect my work if I share it? So we have been working with them since about 2012. Um, and they had started a small space on the Harvard Dataverse uh, just to get the feel of it. I've, I've held some 2 AM meetings with people over in India mm -hmm. to um, introduce them to the tool. So we're gonna continue to do that as, you know, over Zoom for now, and then when hopefully um, get them on board um, sooner rather than later. Yeah, the, the usual, sorry, Robin, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just thinking that I, I think in the end, they will want to host their own infrastructure because I think that's that's part of the thing. Like they don't want to be giving their data to the US or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been a longstanding problem of researchers going into um, some uh, poor country and uh, basically ripping out the natural resources by which by which I mean you know taking the research data and just basically leave, leaving with it uh, and ignoring the local researchers. Dataverse is completely different in that regard, right? We, what we're when, when we say why don't you have an installation? What we're saying is why don't we why don't we give you access to all the data we have, right? Instead of taking it from you, we're going to be giving to you, right? We, you, we, you can tell them the. The point of my talk today, which is right, the more you give away, the more the more you get. Um, we're happy to give you what, what we have. So, um, but still, that if they don't have the institutions to support it, then then it, it takes a while. But but yeah, we should work on that. That's a good point. Does anybody want to talk about um, sensitive data in more in more detail, <clears throat> like other things we might want to go after? Or the particular applications that sensitive data would be useful for. I'm happy to talk about that. Hey, Sebastian here. Uh, my camera up currently. Um, so uh, this comes up all the time and in various forms, right? We work mainly, as you know, on qualitative data. A lot of the data can't be properly 100% uh, de-identified or computational techniques like differential privacy don't really apply because it's a text and applying differential privacy of a text might be possible in 20 years, but isn't currently. Uh, so um, uh, so a lot of the data need to be protected and need to be protected in different uh, degrees. And, and so one thing is it needs to be stored securely. I think the first thing we need to uh, get better is thinking about uh, encryption at rest, which I think we're pretty close to be able to do, but we should be doing properly. Um, and uh, But then we need to think about proper ways to, uh, to access the data. And one thing that we've been thinking about is uh, some sort of virtual enclave as, as, uh, as a tool. And there the concern is, right, and we learned that from ICPSR that as even well-intentioned users aren't always good at keeping data that they download safe. So the advantage of the virtual enclave isn't just that for the statistical code, you can actually review output, which is labor intensive, but for all, uh, all things, the data never leaves the secure servers, right? It's analyzed on remote secure server. And so you don't have to rely on your users being meticulous in keeping your data secure. And I think that's probably one of the more important next steps that we need to uh, take if we want to prop fully support a wide scenario of, of sensitive materials. Some, some folks actually are working on differential privacy and text, but that doesn't mean it's a plug and play answer and it may take a while. Um, actually, I just um, uh, published a paper, well, it was just accepted, but it wasn't, it hasn't been published yet. Um, uh, and that's the URL. Um, 
uh, which is the server kind of approach, where you take completely sensitive data, you put it on a server, you give, instead of giving researchers the data and hoping that they, 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 they do it well, um, you, you, um, they, they treat it well, treat it appropriately, you give them access <clears throat> under this differentially private regime, um, and then they can make queries. And, the, and because of the differential privacy setup, we know for sure that, <clears throat> that nobody's gonna violate anybody's privacy. That won't work for everything, but it might work for, for, for um, some of the kinds of things we're doing. I mean, you may not want to give, give uh, access to the world. You may want to give it to very specific researchers, um, which is another possibility. So. There is time for more questions, mostly because our main keynote speaker is not here yet. And we'd like to give an opportunity to get here so please continue the conversation if she doesn't come in a few minutes we'll go visit her house <laughs> <laughs> i did see a hand go up and then come down but i i neglected to see who it was uh, that was that was me, Garrett. Stephen Kekrin here. Um, I'm, I'm chairing the next session, so it, yeah, it was. Um, I, part part of me was sort of suggesting that uh, uh, say we, we could take up the entire discussion, just having a discussion on sensitive data. Basically, it, you know, um, I I think a you know a concerted discussion on that. You know, as I mean, Sebastian has just talked about the fact of you know different models of of managing. Um, you know, of sensitive data, and you talked about the, the open DP as well. I think certainly it's the case is um, there are going to be multiple models with multiple, you know, um, uh, preferences from, particularly from data custodians. You know, we work a lot with um, government agencies and they've got different models about how they want to think about the, you know, the safety or otherwise of, diff you know, of, of different dissemination or access techniques as, as it were. Uh, and as I, I would say, it's and all the, the above discussion. So, um, you know, um, I think certainly a, um, what would be useful as a framework for thinking about, you know, the, the broader means of accommodating, you know, um, different different approaches to, you know, to managing and, and, and enabling sensitive data probably would be a good discussion to engage in. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> um, you know, I think, I think uh, the, the topic of sensitive data is coming up more and more just because there's more and more data, right? Yeah. Like, like if you have more data on more people and the data you have on more people is more and more informative, it by definition is more and more sensitive. Um, yeah. So this is not something we're gonna be able to avoid. Um, it's gonna come up more and more, so. <clears throat> you know, another topic related to this is <clears throat> is we have more data than ever before. Um, and, and that's created lots of spectacular discoveries powered by our community, powered by Dataverse. Um, um, but most of the data about the people that we study are act, is act in the world is now actually tied up inside private companies. Um, and so one of the things that we, we're gonna need to do better is to make relationships with these private companies. I mean, it used to be that we created all the data in the world, and we and we we and we stored it as we wished, and we used we we used it as we wanted. Um, and now the the you know our former students have gone to work in the corporate sector, and they've uh, they've um, done done a very good job of collecting uh, incredibly detailed data on billions of people. Um, <clears throat> we have to find ways of of. Um, uh, uh, of accessing that data in incentive compatible ways, right? <clears throat> because there's no way a company is gonna give us data if we're gonna give it to their competitors. So it's a different kind of sensitivity, um, <clears throat> but, it's, but it's very important that we work out those, those relationships. And our keynote has arrived just on time. So mm -hmm. we will be promoting her to speaker in one second. Thank you so much, Gary, for facilitating the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And Stephen, I will introduce you in a second.
So hello everyone again. I shared a document a second ago with the banner. If everybody, if anybody would like to download the banner that was created by Dwayne for the meeting, um, and there's a public notes document for taking notes, um, and the hashtag is Dataverse with a capital D, 2022 for tweets and social media. Um, We'd like to welcome Bonnie Healy, our keynote speaker, and Stephen McCurchin, who will be chairing her uh, presentation today. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Stephen, who will introduce Bonnie. How's that? Okay. So Steve is director and manager of the Australian Data Archive at the Australian National University, where he's responsible for the daily operations and technical and strategical development of the data archive. He has high level expertise in survey methodology and data archiving, and has been actively involved in development and application of survey research methodology and technology over 15 years in the Australian university sector. Steve holds a PhD in industrial relations from Deakin University, as well as a graduate diploma in management information systems from Deakin University and a bachelor of commerce with honors from Anosh University. He has research interests in data management and archiving, community and social attitude surveys, organizational surveys, new data collection methods, including web and mobile phone survey techniques and reproducible research methods. Steve has been involved in various professional associations and survey research and data archiving over the last 10 years, including vice chair of the expert committee of the Data Documentation Initiative, better known as the DDI, teaching with the Australian Consortium for Social and Political Research and an executive role with the International Federation of Data Organizations. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much, Sonia. And, and thanks to Gary for your, 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 your previous uh, uh, speaking as well. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. I, um, I'm actually dialing into you from uh, Bergen in Norway. Um, and my, my colleague, Janet McDougall, was, is well, was planning to be a co-chair for this session, in fact, but it's uh, nearly midnight in Australia. So um, I say I'm, I'm in a relevant time zone to be able to more, um, uh, uh, more effectively chair uh, in, a, in waking hours, as it were. Um, so welcome to you. Uh, to you all um, from uh, here in uh, Northern Europe. Uh, and I have the honor of uh, introducing our keynote speaker um, for uh, this morning's um, opening session or uh, whatever hours you happen to be in, I'm in the afternoon. Uh, Apiaki Bonnie Healy. Um, so uh, Apiaki is a registered nurse from the Kanai Nation. Bonnie's professional background is multifaceted. She's worked in numerous health capacities the local, national, and international levels. Active, actively involved in her, oh, I, I, that's going to challenge me, Blackfoot ways of knowing, Nitsia Yapi, I'm going to say my apologies, uh, ways of knowing. She's the former executive director of the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Centers, uh, Center. She's currently the Blackfoot Confederacy Health Director, and she's been fortunate to present research and community success stories to governments, institutions, First Nation communities, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, Bonnie fulfilled the role as the chair for the First Nations Information Governance Centre from uh, 2017 to 20, and her passion is to support First Nations communities and, and provide them with tools that they can implement to further support communities in information data sovereignty and Indigenous research methodologies. Uh, Bonnie's experience and expertise in First Nations information systems gives her a clear understanding and strong passion for using data as a tool for igniting change. Uh, her work with leadership and First Nations communities provides the ability to liaise and facilitate relationships between Western systems and First Nations identified priorities to support the recognitions of First Nations jurisdiction and governance in the collection and use of First Nations information information and data throughout research initiatives. Uh, Bonnie's an advocate, collaborator, and strongly believes that through partnerships, we can positively impact health, health outcomes for First Nations in Alberta and across Canada. So welcome to Bonnie, and I'll say I'll pass to you um, as the, uh, uh, to the um, takeover uh, as the presenter. Okay, Hidamik skanatani, nisto anagog aboyaki, nimtuto aganai, Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bonnie Healy. My English name is Bonnie Healy. And I'm um, calling in today from our Blackfoot territories. I'm in Montana, actually getting ready to go attend our International Blackfoot Research Conference. Um, and I'm uh, very, very um, honored and humbled to be asked to come here and share 
my understanding of Indigenous data uh, governance and sovereignty. So um, I'll just jump right in and um, maybe leave some room for questions or we'll take them in the chat, um, however you want to manage that. Um, so I'm joining you all today to discuss First Nations data governance and to collaborate on this exciting initiative that remains true to First Nations information governance vision that every First Nations will achieve data sovereignty within their distinctive worldviews. In Canada, um, and I've worked with um, uh, researchers in Australia, New Zealand, and the US, and having access to in our Indigenous data is, is usually very difficult. We're usually not the holders, um, but we're asked to make evidence-based decisions without actually having information in front of us. And during COVID, this was exceptionally difficult. Um, but with the work that I've done with the chiefs of Alberta and Canada for the past um, 18 years, I've worked and made progress within Alberta um, and somewhat in Canada to ensure that we had access. So it um, was very helpful for us during this pandemic. So I want to just um, pay homage and um, give special thanks to the organizers for the invite here today and to the elders that support me in their prayers and their blessings that guide and give me strength and hope towards implementing data governance um, with, with the ownership control and access possession of our information and traditional knowledge. And to explore the issues surrounding the use of our data and to empower true transformational change through data governance and management based on our free and prior informed consent. We've been, um, I guess uh, the way Linda Smith has explained it in the past is we've, uh, there's been an um, intense gaze on us. We've been, the term, I believe the phrase is research to death with no change. And, um, and, and part of that is, and I'll go into a bit more detail as to why that is, but um, when I talk to leadership and when I talk to chiefs and to communities, and they're, they're exhausted with research uh, because it hasn't provided any change, any policy change, any improved outcomes. And um, my belief is, is that we have to do the work as Indigenous people. And so, um, yes, we've been researched to death, but as Indigenous people, it is our responsibility to research ourselves back to life. So our elders teach us to have new eyes for each new journey, and it is my great honor to speak today about that vision and how we achieve data sovereignty together and in a new relationship based on shared principles and partnerships. Um, I want to, again, uh, thank the organizers for this conversation today to share our understanding on how Indigenous data sovereignty efforts of the First Nations in Canada and other parts of the world and our partners, technicians, leading thinkers, data experts, and academics are advancing First Nations data governance, management, and ethics. We all know there's a desperate need for First Nations data sovereignty. We are the fastest growing demographic, but as our numbers grow, so do our concerns about our socioeconomic conditions, our culture, traditions, and our health, education, and children's services. And of the growing disparity between Indigenous peoples and the rest of Canada due to historical reasons, including Canada's legislation and policies, especially the lack of legislation and equitable policy when it comes to our treaty and inherent rights. We all know about the challenges facing our First Nations communities, those affected by poor access to health care, prevention, access and treatment and collective services. Knowing those challenges are real and at times overwhelming, not just in health, but in education, children and families, safe drinking water, suicide, the devastating opioid crisis and other prescription um, misuses and, and research. So anywhere data is being used. Opportunities rise and all of us here must continue to share and build communications and relationships led by the values of open, ethical and moral collaboration and the ambition of our vision, our goals and our hearts. When it comes to holding the Western world accountable to our treaty right to self-determination, including data governance, it's not always about dollars, it's about opportunity and equity. 
especially relevant to First Nations is the call for data to respond to issues of equity and justice in key documents and commissions such as the Truth and Reconciliation and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and in Canada, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, such as gap closure and anti-racism. And I think Australia led a wonderful campaign on gap closure and the whole country became involved and they've had some progress. Um, uh, here, uh, anti-racism is the climate in Canada as it is in the, in the US. Um, I think COVID shed the light on a lot of the inequities and uh, we're doing a lot of work in partnership with uh, both provincial and, and federal government to address anti-racism using uh, data and understanding the inequities from our Indigenous lens and um, from our languages and, and telling those stories and those experiences with qualitative data collection um, and interpreting them uh, from our um, Indigenous analysis lens. So the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation, um, specifically calls for monitoring the progress of closing the gap in outcomes between um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and to report this progress annually. The, um, the Truth and Reconciliation was um, released in Canada um, a number of years ago, and we still haven't gotten to this piece. We still do not have surveillance data in Canada. And one of the uh, difficulties is, is we don't have First Nations identifiers within surveillance systems. And the identifiers that Canada has is the Indian registry. So the rights to call um, an, an Indigenous person a status Indian. And, um, and this registry is not naturally linked to vital statistics. So the cleaning up of the data um, on an annual basis is not done. So it has, uh, you know, the last time I pulled the data for Alberta, 10% um, of the individuals on the list were over 106 years old and the births, half of the births weren't registered. So when we don't have good data and we can't do accurate counts, we can't do accurate funding calculations. And so this has caused a, a major problem contributed to the gap um, as well as other pieces of legislation, but data plays a huge role. And I've been working with nations and communities on how to respectfully count ourselves. Um, and I've always uh, stated, if we want to matter, we have to count, but it's how we count that matters. And so how we claim our families and how we count our families in really has to be our responsibility for um, since time of contact and since um, um, the um, Constitution of Canada, uh, we have not been allowed to um, have that control. And so we're working together in partnership on how that's going to look in the future. So um, the Truth and Reconciliation has cited a number of, of indicators to focus on, like um, infant mortality, maternal health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, and birth rates, infant and child health issues, chronic diseases, illnesses and injury incidences, and the availability of appropriate health services. These are all uh, good Western indicators, and I think they're important to monitor over time. But what's more important, I think, to Indigenous people and to us as Blackfoot people is how far are we off our Blackfoot path? Prior to contact, the Blackfoot people were described by early um, settlers as the um, as the healthiest population group that they'd ever witnessed. And there was not a beggar or a hungry uh, individual to be found in the group. And um, very proud people described as lean and sinewy um, and very healthy. And Maslow documented um, and captured um, a lot of um, who we are in our value systems and how we um, self-actualize over time in his hierarchy of needs. What he didn't mention um, or what he got wrong is it, it was upside down. So we come in into this world as complete human beings. And it's how we progress through time that we, we become and carry those value systems of the Blackfoot people, like kindness, love, respect, and caring for the collective and asserting our rightful roles in that responsibility of that transfer of knowledge through the next generations. 
And this is um, <clears throat> the work we're doing at the Blackfoot Confederacy is developing those indicators of well being, but in Blackfoot, in our language, measuring through our value system how far we are away from being who we're meant to be um, and who our ancestors had prayed for us to be. I've always said um, my great great grandfather, um, Head Chief Red Crow, who signed uh, the Blackfoot Treaty when we negotiated um, to share this space and this territory. Um, I, I have to truly believe that his vision for me, you know, in the future was not to negotiate for me to live in a fence. He, you know, negotiated this relationship for me to share this territory with others. And so that it can give life and sustain life for all things living. And that is our responsibility as Blackfoot people for anyone that resides in our territory. We are, we are the custodians, the caregivers. And, um, and during COVID, some of you may have um, witnessed the medicine line vaccine clinic where we, our Montana community brought vaccine to our Canadian to the Canadian border and we were able to vaccinate about 3,000 Canadians um, not just our Blackfoot members but we shared that that vaccine when it was um, not readily available in Canada yet and that um, uh, confused a lot of people but it is our responsibility to care for the collective and that was a demonstration of how um, our value system is, and that was our value system in an action. So when when I look at data and I look at how data drives policy, you know, if for Indigenous people, we have to assert our right to govern our data. And by moving forward on the fundamentals of OCAP, the ownership, control, access, and possession of our information, and that we have to continue to build these partnerships and relationships and have the ability to act and have a sense of being involved in true management process and driving policy and legislation. One of my first data sharing agreements that I negotiated was with um, the World Health Organization. And it, it went on for a long time. Our lawyers went back and forth for over a year. Um, eventually, we we came to a mutual understanding and we created that safe ethical space where we could work together. Um, and it and it was a beautiful relationship. And um, I'm still very uh, humbled and honored from that relationship. And the work that we produced, we look at that cancer incidence rates in Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the US. Um, and in that work, it's uh, published in the Lancet Oncology Journal in October 2014, um, and it just started my journey into having a deeper understanding as to why our people were um, not having great survivor rates in um, when, with, can with cancer and having a deeper understanding of the inequities of care and the trajectory of care and where there is uh, complications of um, late diagnosis or um, uh, just uh, late starts of treatment. And, you know, I think when you, when you look at these things and you look at similarities of other Indigenous population groups, because there's a lot, um, it really helped to unite us. And, and unfortunately, it was cancer that really pulled us together in this relationship. But we've since worked all worked together. We've worked together to understand it. We've worked together to improve it. Um, but what that work helped me to understand most is Canada didn't have access to a First Nations cancer registry, only in Alberta. So I've been working diligently to try and change that, to try and support um, other provinces and territories to have access to, to a surveillance system that can work for them. And, you know, when we're, when I'm, when I'm working with data, there's always, um, a deeper understanding that the elders have always taught me because data is not new to us. You know, um, we as Indigenous people, we're, we're living history. We've always protected our sacred right, our way of life. And it's at me back to Bicini. That's our holy way of life, our traditional knowledge. Um, and for us, you know, we still sing the songs, we speak the language, we dance, we practice our ways of our ancestors and our grandmothers. Um, and we live through the generations because of that protection and stewardship. And we've always had that relationship with our spiritual and cultural knowledge 
and our data and our information. As Blackfoot people, we did something called winter count. So we would count on a hide, a buffalo hide, and you can see them in some of the archives and museums and um, took record and count for um, any individuals that um, you know we might have lost. Um, and this is how we documented things like the smallpox epidemic and, and the Spanish flu. So you cannot, um, when, when we have a relationship um, with our spiritual and cultural knowledge and our data information uh, through transferred rights, um, you have that right and that responsibility to carry on that knowledge and transfer it to the next generations. Um, and in our Blackfoot way, you cannot take what's not yours or tell someone else's story. So you can't speak to what you don't have the right to speak to. Uh, you need to have those transfers and able to, to speak to it. Um, and through, um, we have to tell our own stories through our lived experience, our transferred right to ownership, stewardship, control, access, and possession. We've always controlled our aspirations and rights to regain and retain our access to information and data and determined who accessed that cultural data through strict protocols and processes, which are still in place to this day. Um, some of you may have heard the, the phrase, nothing about us without us. It's still very true. I think that we can't be on tables um, on, um, we can't be on the menu, but not a seat at the table. If we want true transformational change, we have to be part of the relationship and the solution to create that change. So in the Blackfoot culture of transference and stewardship of what is ours, you can't take what is not yours and what is not earned. Those are the principles we live by, the principles of OCAP. When we talk about building relationships, we talk about creating ethical space, a ceremony where two worlds converge, the Western worldview and the indigenous worldview in a place of learning and understanding, a place of respect and discipline. Our elders carry forth our ceremony and teach us the goals, objectives and mandate of ceremony of a Gakstaman, our governance system. Our ethical spaces were passed on to us through the ancestors uh, concept of ethical space and ceremony. One of our partners and elders, uh, Willie Ermine of the First Nations University in Saskatchewan, explains that ethical order and ethical space involves a process of respectful engagement for research where mutual respect and mutual benefit exists. When these two worlds converge, Indigenous and Western, we can develop a space for respect where the practice and implementation of OCAP is being developed. In short, he says, ethical space and reconciliation are about how we treat each other as human beings. And so how it's worked for me in the past, whenever I've negotiated um, a data sharing agreement and working with provincial or federal government um, individuals, the technicians, uh, the data technicians and the data leads are always very respectful. We create that space. So, we always want to achieve the same outcomes. We want to close the gap. We want to work towards that gap closure. And um, so when, when we sit together and we're negotiating what this is going to look like, because Indigenous people don't possess the data and we're trying to navigate through privacy legislation to be able to be respectful and to get data to Indigenous populations so they can have evidence um, base decisions and have the data in front of them so they can set their priorities in a way that makes sense to them. And so we all sit together and um, the rules are um, we have a value system of respect, understanding, kindness, and love at the table. Um, we all remember the goal that we're mutually trying to achieve together. But what, um, what we do is we kick the legal teams out. Um, no lawyers, no talk of privacy legislation. We're not gonna talk barriers, but we're gonna really work together on how we're going to achieve it and why it's important. And then we'll demonstrate um, some examples of how that can work and how it can look. And so as hard as it has been to create those uh, data sharing agreements with governments, um, in these settings, it's been very, um, very respectful and very kind. And I still have those relationships to, these, to this day. And I'm grateful to them because of these relationships, 
I was able to support our communities in creating a data dashboard for COVID. So we knew our age groups, we knew our vulnerable population really quickly. We knew um, our priorities of our demographics for the vaccine um, and supported the communities with um, doing contact tracing um, with starting with the baseline of household testing. So that really helped us as the Blackfoot people on the Canada side to um, have you know, great outcomes during COVID when other Indigenous population groups didn't have such great outcomes. So um, really knowing the data and um, working together to achieve OCAP, and I know OCAP is a Canadian concept um, created by the First Nations Information Governance Committee. Um, and when I've worked with international groups um, and working with a statistical table internationally, um, I remember uh, a US, uh, the lead statistician of the US, he told me, oh, you guys don't know how to play in the sandbox together. <laughs> like, no, that's not, that's not it. It's, um, there's other things we need to address within legislation to ensure that there's, um, you know, the, the control um, and the way the, the data story is told is not manipulated in a narrative to um, understand it through concepts of only money and finances, but to really truly create those um, gap closures and those inequities in um, health outcomes and access to um, safe spaces like emergency departments. A bit of my work uh, um, recently is looking at racism in emergency departments, and I'm a, a nurse by training, so some of my background is being a risk, an ER nurse at looking at, um, uh, well, I worked in, in the emergency room in um, New Mexico, University of New Mexico Hospital. And so I know the environment of the emergency department. Um, but when we pulled the administrative data, we saw some great gaps in triage scores for Indigenous populations and non-Indigenous populations. And in order to understand those gaps and, and not just coming with one or two anecdotal complaints or, you know, but we, we really engaged the population group to understand their experiences and describe them in their language. Um, they, Indigenous people were generally not using the uh, process of complaint uh, through the ombudsman or other avenues of complaint. Um, you know, it was generally just, they just leave or left leave without being seen. So we had to understand one, you know, um, why, why the discrepancies are occurring and then why they're not using, you know, the system. And it's a, it's, it's because trust is not established. So the same thing with data, communities need to be able to establish trust and, and First Nations generally don't trust research if the story is not told by them or if they're not included in it. Research does a lot of really great things, but one thing um, that I've learned through my journey with um, research over the years is what we don't do well is knowledge transfer. So we'll take the data, we'll... Um, do the work, we'll do the engagement. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we do a publication, which sometimes the community never sees, right? Um, or is not even aware of, or will present on, on the work in world stages. And again, the community doesn't see it or doesn't hear of it. And, and then change doesn't occur. So anytime I do research or I do engage in any kind of um, relationships with communities is creating that trust and, you know, creating that relationship. They're equal players on the research team. They tell this, we tell the story together and, um, and we do it collectively. So the whole goal is collective well-being. And this is how we're advancing uh, data moving forward today. Um, and with this, you know, we have the ability to share our stories, ideas, and important information to implement these ideas and connections and to make informed decisions. And this understanding gives us voice to improve the health and well being of our people. And um, we, we know that our people are suffering from things like intergenerational trauma that are impacted by the destruction of our social structures and relationships. So it's 
so important that we gather today to advance the voice of the people and drive policy and not you know continue to per perpetuate this pathway of trauma and cultural harm that has occurred over time and we want to strive for that transformational change to make sense of the data streams and prevent that cultural harm from researchers and to take the ownership of our self-determination evoke cultural change and understand who we are where we are and how we are benefits of this mutual understanding include rebuilding that community trust and control over our own analysis building understanding of protocols and processes engaging our leadership researchers and communities on mutually beneficial approaches and ethical spaces using cultural parallels to come to the same conclusion and accomplish deliverables carried out um, research by our first nations people reflecting our worldviews and research that benefits our communities invitation and community consent to conduct research for free and prior informed consent so that knowledge transfer stays with the community it is the people who decide how to store and use that data and to impact policy and back up our requests for programs and services giving voice to first nations that's where we that's why you know i'm here today is to help individuals to learn or create that understanding on how that can work and um there are a growing number of First Nations scholars and elders, and I'm very grateful to Linda Smith and her uh, 500 uh, PhDs. Um, it was a huge accomplishment for the Maori people um, to take on that initiative, and we're looking at similar initiatives here in Canada. Um, being able to do this work and having the individuals trained um, in many facets of data collection um, um epi epidemiology uh, we need those human beings to be able to um, create those environments and those relationships and and help tell the data story that we need to tell and um and achieve true transformational change so um you know the gift of information comes with a great deal of responsibility and um in my in my recent years i've joined our sacred blackfoot ceremonies and societies and really um understanding you know the the sacrifices our ancestors made so that i could practice these ceremonies to this day and they're not changed and then my great responsibility and i'm i'm afraid i've joined much too late because um unlike the western world when you do your uh, you know your your four years of your degree or your your um, PhD uh, right right then you're called a doctor and you're that expert for us if we looked at the parallel um, I have to wait tr for transfer groups out which could be um, by the time I'm recognized as an elder or as that knowledge holder I'll be in my 80s so I'm really praying that my brain and my memory is intact so that I can um, carry on that great responsibility because I've been gifted and entrusted by the elders and the ancestors to transfer this knowledge to the next generations. And just like any information and in any data system, it is a gift and it comes with great responsibility to take care of the sacred information. The Western way of protecting information is not new. Um, it's critical to understand that both indigenous worlds and Western worldviews um, have ways of gathering and protecting information and and the way that we transfer that knowledge from one generation to the next um, for our blackfoot people it's intact but how we do it and how we ensure that indigenous people have access to the information or that um, nobody's telling their story in a way that is not understood from their worldview um, this is what ocap has helped us to achieve uh, here in canada and from the work that we've done so with that, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bonnie. That was, uh, let's say, a, a fabulous world tour of all the, <laughs> the sorts of challenges that we were, um, uh, say, that we're, um, we're hoping to certainly engage with in the, you know, the, in the first day of this uh, this conference. In fact, we have a series of uh, um, uh, presentations from, from a, a number of groups uh, and that, that capacity to engage in some of the 
the sort of questions you, you know you, you've raised and the sort of the, the, the challenges that are, that are faced there has been really quite helpful. Um, I wanted to say I, I've been compiling a set of you know um, uh, some points as we've gone through because the story you told um, uh, say I'm you know, uh, I'm not. An, I'm a non-indigenous researcher in in Australia operating a, a facility. But I say the a lot of what the um, discussions um, that you and points that you raise really, I've I've seen certain parallels. You know, certainly parallels in the Australian case. And uh, um, uh, you know, so it's you know these are themes that we're hoping with, within the international community that we have that we can certainly engage with, uh, and particularly. You know, as often service providers, you know, to a broad range of communities. You know, what, you know how do we incorporate that sort of thinking into our uh, our discussion? Become forms part of that. So I want to open up the the opportunity for questions from the the floor. As um, and if if colleagues could either raise your hand um, electronically on Zoom or um, and say drop a question into the the chat, that would be um, ideal. Um, while we while we have um, uh, so I'll, so I'll, I'll let uh, some of that accumulate as we go through. I might just start with a a, a couple of thoughts there, um, to, uh, sort of throwing up a first question there. And you, the interesting one I uh, kind of want to start with this is you talked about the idea of closing the gap, um, and as I say, it, the so in this so there's a very much a national strategy in Australia of talking about closing the gap, the gap, and you talk about sort of a similar language in um, in Canada. The that hasn't always been received entirely positively within the communities that you know um, uh, uh, that um, uh, within the indigenous community. Partly because of I think the the, the deficit model that it it, it, it presumes you know, and it, it would be helpful I think for some of colleagues to perhaps talk about the deficit model and rethinking that a little bit. And I really liked how you raised that idea of the Blackfoot path as another way of thinking about that. As I say, and you know, we, we get a similar sort of discussion here in Australia about you know, deficit thinking is the wrong way of thinking. Um, so I, it would it, it, be quite nice to sort of say, how do you think about that? Um, but following on from that a little bit, um, one of the interesting things I think is if you're taking a different way of thinking about well, what are the things we want to know about and we want to be following, the practical challenges that come along with that, because in some of the Western communities, you know, the, um, statistical systems, for example, we're not always following the right things. So, how, what are the practical implications of that on the ground when you're thinking about well, what might be the you know get, being off the path or on the path? I, I found that a really interesting way of engaging there. Yeah, no, I think it was a concept. So, um, for me, um, well, one is I wanted to um, have that connection uh, or have chiefs make that connection to why surveillance data was important. So I had created these health trends with the Ministry of Alberta Health Surveillance to look at the gap. And in Alberta, which is the wealthiest resourced uh, province in Canada with oil and gas and, and that history, um, the gap is quite wide. You know, um, Indigenous people in Alberta have um, the same life expectancy as individuals in Paraguay, Guatemala, and Cambodia. Whereas non-Indigenous people in this province have um, life expectancies of individuals in Sweden, uh, Singapore, and Australia. So when we're looking at that journey of gap closure, how do we get to Cambodia to Sweden? And how do we close that gap? And what's that gonna cost? So we costed it out and on the low end, it's about 454 thousand per person and on the high end it's 1.5 million per person and with 168,000 First Nations we're never going to see that amount of money to achieve gap closure but the concept of looking at um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals in Canada is looking at those goals to understand how to achieve gap closure um, and although those goals many of them are very good and they're very important, they don't have an Indigenous lens on them. The, um, the UN has um, quite openly um, shared with us that they need that Indigenous lens and they need it included in there. So when I started to have this conversation with the elders and I brought them together and I, I, I didn't want to contaminate their thinking by, by the phrase of gap closure or um, by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so I was working with Dr. Leroy Little Bear, 
here in Canada and to help me um, in our Blackfoot language explain to the elders what I actually wanted from them. So the first conversation was about, um, and it was all in our Blackfoot language and I'm not a fluent speaker, so I just captured pieces, but then when it was transcribed for me, they were sharing their lived experiences of residential school and, and the reserve. Um, and I had to come back the next day and I had to tell them no, um, and, and by, I by no means mean any disrespect, but I need you to push back further. What I need you to share with us is the stories told by you, by your grandparents before there was a fence of a reserve and before there was a residential school. What was life like for the Blackfoot people in that time? And that's what I, that's the, the, the work that we need to do together is to bring as much as we can back in those areas. So then we started to work together and um, our data analyst, um, who's Blackfoot, and you'll meet her soon, uh, Shiloh Healy, um, did the work for us and, and worked with Dr. Leroy Little Bear to pull out themes and what's important to us. And um, those themes, um, we're working together to develop those metrics. Um, and the way I can, I can, I guess, maybe have anybody understand it. So in our my home community in Kainai, uh, we've been monitoring the opioid deaths. We've been in an opioid crisis, declared opioid crisis since 2014. And during COVID, the first six months of COVID, we had 91 deaths of, of opioid overdoses because many things, um, you know, uh, treatment centers weren't deemed essential. So everything was closed and everybody was stopped at certain levels of care um, and just pushed back out into their environment and um, and using a loan. So, you know, all of that resulted into a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. So if we only focused on those 91 deaths, we would, you know, things would be really dark and bleak and feel a little bit helpless and hopeless. But I said, what we need to really look at is um, during COVID for the first time, we counted how many people came into the camp of uh, Sundance. And this is where our people come for prayers, for healing, um, come together to be with families and their clan systems. And there's over 100 teepees every year and always have been. And during COVID, it stayed the same. And we continued our, we moved forward. We didn't stop. Even though the restrictions were in place, we had to keep going and we had to keep going forward. So there was a couple of things that I looked at with the data from this uh, relationship. But there was over 7,000 people that came through that gate. So if I only focused on the 91, how come we're not talking about the 71 that are doing well, that are coming for healing, that are praying, that are thriving? Um, and those are the ones that are trying to be um, uh, coming back to their Blackfoot self. And, you know, achieving that Black, Blackfoot um, gap closure, I guess, and returning our thinking into caring for the collective and undoing a lot of the colonial thinking and value system of individualistic thinking. These are the things that um, we looked at during uh, COVID. And so a lot of the reasons why people chose to get vaccinated was to care for their elders, protect their elders and to um, have access to their elders and be safe. And so there was a collective um, uh, way of how we're still doing things. And those are the things that we're trying to capture in the data. And I'm so grateful to Shiloh because she worked with the Alberta Health Quality Council to um, develop the questionnaire with that Blackfoot understanding and those value systems. And it really showed us how there are still elements of who we are as Blackfoot people that's helping us to achieve wellness, but in a collective way. Um, and, and it's going to take time. We're not quite there yet, but, and I think Shiloh can speak to it so much better than me and eloquently. Um, and she's doing the heart and the root of that work. Um, I don't think um, I myself in my generation am going to be described as lean and sinewy. Um, I think I've passed my, 
my time of um, maybe I can, maybe I can hit the gym and start to eat better. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think, um, but the work and, and, and working on being Blackfoot in any space that I can, being Blackfoot without interruption and recognizing where those interruptions occur within legislation are really helping me to um, help, help others in government to understand the harms that that interruption um, happens and how it occurs and how it impacts our health and well-being. And, and we're really trying to understand it. Nobody likes to hear the word racism. Nobody wants to talk about it. Um, but we're here and um, deaths have occurred. Joyce Eshaquan videotaped her death, unfortunately. And, um, um, but for us, we, you know, it really opened up Canada's eyes combined with our, our research work at uh, research racism in the ED department. So it helped to understand that we need to talk about this and we need to work together to improve this. Um, so the way that we do gap closure and the way that we look at it, it has to be multifaceted. It can't just be from one worldview. Mm -hmm. And if we only do it from one worldview, then we're going to miss, you know, the strengths and resiliencies and, and, and how we can build communities up to, um, to focus on those strengths and really achieve well-being from a collective point. So I, I, you know, I think I'm very early in this work, but um, um, I'm looking forward to, you know, the future and what it's bringing to us. So I don't know if that answered a bit, but thank no, you. No, yeah, it, it's like it, not, it sort of brings together the, the set of, I say there's a whole set of challenges that you kind of have to be reconciling here. And I, I was, I've been sort of, you know, touching upon the, reconciling you know what are you there for in the first you know what are you trying to achieve in the first place plus the governance and the technical considerations that kind of come along with it um like it, it's but you know first and foremost well what is it that you're actually trying to understand measure and you know and follow seem you know has to drive that uh, as saying i think that's one of the more interesting parts of how to you know um you know where to engage in that discussion is well you know what's the purpose of what you're trying to do in the you know whoever it is that's providing a service or, you know, uh, is it, what's the point in the first place and coming back to that, you know, that, that notion of, well, you know, why do we want to know these things and how do we know these things is, you know, um, is a very useful part of that. Um, it actually, so we, we, we do have a question in the chat that it sort of starts to, um, I, I think, sort of look at that from a, um, a related point. So the, the question is, so how might a project like that diverse, which is, a, you know, collaborative community effort around technology development fundamentally, or but around data sharing uh, more broadly, and, 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 and Gary uh, certainly talked to some of the, um, the framework, you know, the, 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 the rationale for that, which is essentially open data sharing, you know, model being a, as a starting point there. Um, how might a project like Dataverse, which is trying to engage in that collaborative development and communities of practice achieve engagement with the you know, custodians of knowledge and address questions of compliance or engagement with you know um, relevant legal and, and other requirements and as I say and you kind of mentioned the uh, the OCAP model um, you know sort of a starting point there it'd be interesting to see how you can you know is it possible to reconcile some of the sort of the, the technology considerations with the you know sort of the governance models that are there well, well, and I think that um, for us, I mean, we've got a lot of learning when relationships break down and, and they're not, they haven't worked and, and how much harm that they can cause. Um, and, and one of my biggest teachers, and I had the great fortune of meeting individuals in the Havasupai community and understanding their experience of when their um, samples were um, you know, taken in secondary analysis was done that was very harmful without their consent. Um, so we have to be very cautious of academic institutions because they are curious places. Um, and if you don't have that relationship with the community and it's not the community's desire or wishes to look at something um, uh, that can be damaging and, and uh, harmful to the community, then I think, you know, learning from incidences like Havasupai and ensuring that we're mitigating all harms to communities, that should be the goal. And how are you going to do that in an open data, open government system 
is going to be very complicated. Mm. Um, uh, can, you know, having uh, the individuals um, always to be part of that relationship and oversee the governance of who's accessing it and why, and ensuring that the community is part of that relationship um, to mitigate those harms, you know, because for everything that I shared this morning, the research should always bring that true transformational change that communities also desire. Mm. Um, but it has to be their priorities and it has to be done in that respectful, ethical way. So I, I've, I've worked with the open data, open government. Um, there are concepts about it that um, I love. Like I love to pull the financial data from the federal government and how much <laughs> they've, they've helped us to widen this gap because of lack of, you know, or inadequate resourcing based on poor quality data and doing, you know, funding formulas based on this poor quality data. So open data and open government concepts for us, there are some good things, but we also have to be part of it. And so I'm really grateful to the Treasury Board of Canada. Uh, there's a group in there that are in charge of it and they always consult with us and work with us. And so when they're wanting to release data, like say from Indigenous Services Canada, you know, they'll consult with us and they'll contact us. Um, and there's and the data group, and I'm sure it's in every country um, of Indigenous people, it's very small, it's very intricate, and it's very uh, tightly compacted and together. So we've worked for decades together. Um, there's a tight group of us. Um, we all know each other. We all talk on a regular basis. And, um, and so really ensuring that you're tapping into those in those groups and those resources to ensure that you're guided in a way that's not going to create harms like what had happened to in the past to the Havasupai population group um, who are still recovering from that harmful research that was conducted on them without their knowledge or consent. So at the end of the day, however you work through Dataverse, um, those are the things that should be your priority. And with us, the harms are listed, but one of the most damaging harms is when ancestral harm is, is done. And it's very difficult to undo once you, um, and that's what happened to the Havasupai people. One of the studies is that they linked their DNA to China, which obliterated their origin stories of, um, they were, you know, um, brought to the base of the Grand Canyon to protect that space from the creator. And it had a huge impact on them and they're still trying to recover from it. And those are the you know, things that are really hard to undo. And will they ever trust you know, um, research again? You know, will they ever um, fully trust? Because we can all benefit to, to understand trajectories of care and improve pathways. But if there's no trust, you know, we can never improve those pathways or look at them ever again in the way that you need it, you need to, to achieve change. So I think, you know, really focusing on the ethics and focusing on mitigating harms and inclusion and relationships uh, with, the, with the First Nations or Indigenous people that the data is about, those are key. And if, you know, if they feel hard to create, then tap into the um, small groups that do exist in countries where they can help you to create those things, those relationships and those ethics and those protocols to mitigate harm. Yeah, and I, we're going to have we're going to have a couple of presentations on on those um, actually throughout the day today. In fact, um, uh, to you know to start talking about how some of that engagement actually might occur. So. I, but certainly appreciate the uh, um, you know, sort of the, the reminder there to, to to think about, and that that's I think going to be sort of core to what we we're, we're considering is well how does that engagement actually occur? Um, on that note, we we are running a little bit to time, and we actually have Kylo and and Sarah on the line now, so we're actually moving into um, uh, hearing more about the, some of the on the ground work. Um, so in I did want to thank you so much for your uh, for your time today, Bonnie, and as say uh, if I can get a, a round of virtual applause. Um, from from the uh, the community here, and thank you so much for your time. And uh, as I say, I appreciate all the efforts you've gone to today. <laughs> okay, Steve, you can 
go ahead with the introductions for Sarah and Shiloh. And uh, we've already yep. introduced you, so go ahead. Excellent. Uh, so we have, yes, uh, so our next session uh, is turning now to, and apologies, folks, I'm looking off to my iPad just to get a, a, a second screen for, for things appearing in here um, around Indigenous, you know, Indigenous data management, Indigenous sovereignty in action. That certainly is our theme for uh, the morning. Um, so we, so uh, Sarah and, 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 and Charlie are going to be uh, certainly presenting um, uh, on you know, some of the work they've been doing you know, uh, on uh, data in action. So let me just turn to the, the bios here. So um, Sarah Geisbrecht is the research data management librarian at the University of Winnipeg. Uh, previous experience working in both uh, data uh, RDM services and academic archives. She has dual master's degrees in archival study and library and information systems from University of British Columbia and advocates for greater collaboration between data, RDM services and archives for the long-term preservation and access of research data. Uh, Sarah is of mixed German and Indigenous descent and her family is family are members of the Kualapu First Nation in Newfoundland. Um, that she strives to apply her heritage, knowledge, education, and experience to advocate for and advance Indigenous information, sovereignty, and governance, along with the information literacy and access in accordance with the OCAP principles that uh, Bonnie has just been talking to us about. Uh, Kylo, sorry, I'm breaking my way, whoops, is... Um, uh, from Kanai in, in Southern Alberta. She graduated from Mount Royal University in 2016 with a Bachelor of Science in General Science with a minor in Biology. Immediately after graduation, she worked for the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Centre as a data analyst and research assistant. Through this work, she became very interested in the necessity to provide equity for access to information within underserved communities. Um, uh, it has become her personal project to understand how this inequity can be alleviated. Moreover, it's become her passion to find innovative ways to, to begin to build information governance capacity for First Nation communities within Canada and to learn from other nations across Canada and globally on how to in overcome information poverty. Currently, her work with the Blackfoot Confederacy Tribal Council focuses on developing Blackfoot-defined wellness indicators and improving data linkage and surveillance for First Nations and the opioids crisis in Alberta. So an, a, an excellent follow-on from our, um, our keynote presentation. So at this point, I will hand to uh, Carlo and, and, and uh, uh, Sarah, and uh, thank you so much. And I'm briefly gonna step away while I get a glass of water. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me and see our slides. Um, so uh, to help uh, frame our conversation today on Indigenous data sovereignty, uh, it is important to reflect on the land where we currently live and work. This map from the Native Land Digital is an excellent resource which illustrates the traditional territories of Indigenous people around the world, and I invite you to take some time to look up your local context. I am honored to be speaking to you today from the traditional territories of, um, or well, from the from within Treaty One territory and the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, in Inu, uh, OG Cree, and the OJT. Shako, uh, and as well as the birthplace of the and heart of the Métis Nation. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge that much of the work on the project that Shiloh and I are going to be discussing today was undertaken by Jamie Orr, who is currently on leave, and I am filling in for her as Research Data Management Librarian at the University of Winnipeg. And I hope that she will have the opportunity to pr present the finished version of this project uh, when it is completed. I'd also like to point out that much of our content is focused on the Canadian context, um, but Indigenous data sovereignty is not confined to colonial borders and boundaries, so please consider how the information we present today may apply to your geographical or contextual context. I also just realized that you can't see me, so I'm going to turn on my, my camera. Um, uh, indigenous topics are incredibly complex and compounded by centuries of colonialism and cultural genocide, and our presentation today provides a very brief overview of Indigenous data sovereignty. We want to acknowledge that 
Indigenous nations, community, and organization are unique and have their own unique histories, cultures, and protocols. And to understand Indigenous concerns in your area, uh, we need to work to learn more about our local Indigenous communities and build trust through reciprocally beneficial partnerships based on respect. So um, as Bonnie mentioned, Indigenous data sovereignty rights are not new and Indigenous culture and intellectual property rights have always included the right to own and control Indigenous culture and intellectual property, ensure that any means of protecting Indigenous cultural and intellectual property is based on the principles of self-determination, uh, be recognized as the primary guardians of and interpreters of their cultures, authorize and or refuse to authorize the commercial use of Indigenous cultural and intellectual property according to customary law, maintain the secrecy of Indigenous knowledge and other cultural practices, and give full and proper attribution, and uh, as well as control the reporting of cultural customs and expressions. What is new is the growing acknowledgement and respect of these rights by academics and academic institutions. And this growing acknowledgement and respect is a key step on the path to reconciliation, decolonization, and affirming the United Nations Declaration of, on the Rights of Indigenous People, or also known as UNRWA. The global RDM movement uh, and adoption of the FAIR principles uh, unfortunately threatens Indigenous data sovereignty by prioritizing openness and reuse, which sound great, but uh, harm in may cause harm to Indigenous uh, communities. In Canada, the Federal Tri-Agency Research Data Management Policy recognizes that data related to research by and with the First Nations, Métis, or Inuit must be managed in accordance with data management principles developed and approved by these communities and on the basis of free, prior, and informed consent. These agencies recognize that a distinctions-based approach is needed to ensure that the unique rights, interests, and circumstances of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit are acknowledged, affirmed, and implemented. Indigenous data uh, are defined as data involving Indigenous communities, beings, and land. And these include data on Indigenous resources or environments such as land history, geological information, titles, and water information, data about Indigenous dem demographics or social data such as legal, health, education, the use of services in Indigenous created data, and data from Indigenous communities such as traditional cultural data, archives, oral literature, ancestral knowledge, and community stories. With this very broad definition, researchers and research institutions must be mindful of the extent of Indigenous data and consider the OCAP and CARE principles to respect Indigenous data sovereignty. And I'll uh, touch on those more later. Um, okay, my name is Shiloh Healy. Um, I um, I guess the health researcher and data person at the Blackfoot, Blackfoot Confederacy Tribal Council. Uh, I'm from Ganai, uh, which is in Southern Alberta. It's part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Uh, we're made up of four um, communities or nations. So there's Bikani, Siksika, Ganai, and then uh, Apsapi Bikani, which is in Browning, Montana, which is where I currently am. Uh, and then also, too, it should mention that Bonnie Healy is my mom. <laughs> so she's really a trailblazer of that governance piece and really, uh, I guess, laid the groundwork of that relationship building um, for uh, my generation to come through with that technical piece and really putting that governance and those recommendations that they have and that they felt um, from the inequities in data, in access to services, um, really trying to navigate the path forward on how we could do that together. So one of the things that we've done or um, how I became involved with this work was with our, our Indigenous Data Management Toolkit. 
Um, so it was based on a six part webinar series. Uh, and it, what the, the goal and the intent of the series was it was really to um, invite speakers that were either themselves Indigenous in these spaces, uh, working um, with the technical aspects of, you know, getting data sharing agreements together, um, you know, wise practices that um, Sarah will speak about um, uh, in the upcoming slides. So we really wanted to get, or, or, our, and then the other people that were invited to speak were also allies that were working in the institutions, uh, and just really, you know, saw the 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 things or the, I guess, the um, places where uh, first Indigenous people were having, um, I guess, trouble or navigating or even being represented properly in those spaces. Um, so we've invited them to come together to really um, give us their experience or share their experience uh, of how to get those recommendations, those governance tools like OCAP, and um, look at the care principles. How do we put that now into action? And so that's really where these webinars, they, they started that sharing of knowledge and the toolkit is really that um, bringing it all together with the intended target audience to be for communities or for First Nations organizations working with communities. So really, really, um, you know, dedicated to like there where they would be so we wanted to use very simple language um, instead of that technical piece uh, it's still in there but we wanted to really put that indigenous perspective on it uh, and, and as well really giving that um, those I guess templates that could be available uh, and then um, in providing it in a way where you know internet connectivity is still an issue in some communities so having like maybe a pdf format of this toolkit so that they can still continue on in, in research in in a in a better way than that's been done in the past next slide uh and so yeah just really touching on that um the treaties of non-interference you know bonnie really spoke about it um touched on it uh, in her keynote um, uh, speech. And what was really um, the intent of these treaties, you know, they were signed before Canada was even a country. You know, I know I'm from Treaty 7 area. Um, it, that's the number that was given with the colonization of the treaties. Um, we've, we called it the Blackfoot Peace Treaty. We saw it as a, a a time we where we were we were going to share we we're going to learn how to you know occupy the space um that could mutual benefit mutually benefit everybody um so that was our and i and i show this other um uh, example of a treaty uh it's not mine so i don't want to speak to it at all because i i might misinterpret it but i it's really showing that the same concept from two different Indigenous um, groups, uh, one from the East End and one from sort of the West by the Rockies, which was the Blackfoot. And they both had this idea of non-interference. We we're gonna walk along beside each other and understand how to work that way. So that they completely came to those conclusions, those two groups. However, on the, on the colonizer side of it, of, um, it was completely not written down as it was intended. Uh, and also too, like with our Blackfoot Treaty, it goes, yes, there's a, a date and, uh, on the piece of paper that was signed. However, in our oral traditions, we go back a whole year. So there are people that are really well-versed in the, in the treaty language from like Blackfoot, treaty from that side from our our indigenous perspective and i so i don't know i don't know the level of treaty that they do they live and speak it so just even to having that respect and understanding of those two worldviews, uh we're meant to walk alongside i just i thought that was interesting because it was just two completely different groups on completely different sides of canada and they still kind of came up with that understanding that we were going to walk along beside each other next slide I'll hand it back over to Sarah.
Um, yeah, uh, thanks. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about the legislative barriers and um, I am by no means a legal expert. And so I'm probably oversimplifying this a bit, but um, I think these are some key points to be aware of that Canadian and other colonial legislation prioritizes the individual with personal information, personal privacy, and ownership of personal intellectual property. Whereas Indigenous rights and governance prioritizes the collective, the nation, band, uh, community, et cetera, and through uh, generations. So collective privacy, generational knowledge, ownership, and collective information governance. The Canadian Copyright Act protects knowledge and information that's often affixed to or affiliated with a medium and often by a single author. In some cases, such as with film, photography, and audio, it is the owner of the medium that holds the copyright rather than the content creators depicted. There is a long history of Indigenous cultures and traditional knowledges, or in other words, Indigenous data, such as the dances, languages, stories, songs, oral histories, etc., that have been recorded or published by outsiders. And then Indigenous communities have often had no legal grounds to own, control, access, and possess their own data or cultural property because they are not the copyright holders. Copyright legislation is not intended to protect the collective and, gener and generational ownership. And similar to copyright legislation, privacy legislation in Canada prioritizes individual privacy over communities' collective privacy. When a community's data is easily identifiable and not protected, information about that community is often taken out of context, as Bonnie mentioned, and has been used to justify policies that have caused harm to the community and its individual members. Due to these legal differences, the, er, to completely own, control, access, and possess their data, ideally, Indigenous data should be physically stored within a community's own jurisdiction, but this presents extensive logistical challenges, including digital infrastructure challenges and funding. And now back to Shiloh. Thank you. Um, I just, yeah, I really wanted to touch on that collective knowledge piece um, and what had happened that came up in um, one of the, I guess it was a, a, a gathering. So a, a, basically a focus group that we had and we were going over um, the, you know, the consent form. So we're, we were um, explaining, you know, the risk and benefits, what you need to be informed. And, you know, when we think when we talk about collective knowledge, too, from that Indigenous perspective, we as Indigenous people, we can recognize when that there is collective knowledge. We know, you know, there's a story, an origin story, a creation story. We have not be stories. We have songs that are tied to certain societies. We recognize that as, as, because, you know, they are a part of us. Um, so, when that's shared in a space, like a public setting, um, how it's done with our protocols is, you know, we say who told us this story, where they told it, and how, you know, what were the circumstances around um, kind of citing our references of that collective knowledge to say this is, you know, I'm honoring this person for giving me that knowledge and I'm acknowledging them and respecting them. So in this whole entire process and this research process, we were, we're trying to get the lived experiences of our elders and, you know, that collective memory of before colonization, of before a residential school, you know, what did things look like? So we were tapping into the collective knowledge. And when we were in the space and we were going through the consent form, uh, we were, I was stopped and corrected by an elder right then and there. And they said, they, they reaffirmed and reminded me to, to, you know, like, no, that's not what we do when, we, when we're sharing knowledge like that. Um, that's our social mechanism is to share it in that public space. So, you know, you have that accountability to the story, to the people that shared it with you. Um, so that's what they were really um, correcting me there too, and to remind me in that, in, in the consent form, um, to really acknowledge them when it, it, it is that collective knowledge. Um, if it's a lived experience, that would still be that case by case, you know, 
there are instances where our elders do want to be acknowledged for that lived experience um, because you know that's our protocol uh, as well too you know I, I wanted to share that with you because um, that is I guess this data sovereignty in action that was a Blackfoot protocol that we had to incorporate into the research process right then and there so that's how you um, the adaptability has to be there when working with those communities, because you know you can share what you've been doing so far for collecting knowledge for labeling things. Um, but if you're stopped by an indigenous person about that that knows about that indigenous knowledge about that piece, you really have to respect it and adapt and how you're going to. Um, take that into your process of uh, of going forward in that gathering of information. Next slide. Um, and then also too, this was just another, uh, it's funny because I did not tell Bonnie I was gonna talk about this opioid data and she did anyway. So it just goes to show how in sync we are. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to really, you know, hammer that in um, that, uh, our information really, as of right now, because we never had the space to share our uh, context, our history around those circumstances, we have to have that opportunity to do it right now and to really like set that precedence because um, how, I guess, from that Western perspective, from that epidemiology process of health, it's always determined on an individual basis. Like, I, I made this decision on a personal level, therefore, that's why my health is affected so much. Uh, and, you know, as we're uh, getting epigenetics involved, oh, we're finding that's not really the case. You know, we are a part, a product of our environment. And this is exactly the case in point with um, First Nations. You know, there's a lot of harms that are ha have happened to us, intergenerational trauma. Um, so, and like inadequate, inadequacy in, um, in basic access to services such as healthcare, like primary healthcare. Um, so I wanted, this is an open data, open access report. It's the Alberta Opioid Surveillance Report. It's um, put together by the Ministry of uh, Health for uh, Alberta. And it's, it's just, it's trying to, um, you know, just present the data uh, as is. Um, but, you know, it's from still that value system of that Western institution. So it's still that, uh, I guess, that uncalled for bias within the data just by how data is collected. It's collected within that value system. So for um, just returning back to the opioid data, and this is from the most recent report, jump in the 2020 uh, rate uh, between non-First Nations and First Nations. And so if you were just to take this as it was, uh, without any con Indigenous context or an Indigenous history, you would just think that this is just a perpetuated story of, uh, you know, Indigenous people dealing with trauma, but with addictions. Um, so, and that's not the case. So much here. This is really reflective of what was happening around um, the opioid crisis in a whole. So for case in point, it's the year of the pandemic. It's 2020. Uh, the first six months, um, those, those harm reduction pathways were deemed non-essential. So things like naloxone kit distribution got dis, um, got uh, interrupted. Um, also too, uh, there was a harm reduction building in Lethbridge that was um, shut down in that first four months of the pandemic. So that's where the huge spike comes from. It's not from, oh, we're in a pandemic, this is depressing. These, these, these social uh, inequalities are even highlighted more. It's also too, there was that more contextual things that we had no control over. We were pushing for harm reduction. Uh, the pandemic stopped that and the building closed. And so we're dealing with this other 
contextual history stuff that if you weren't in that area, you would have no idea that was part of what was happening in this um, in this chart in this data set. Um, thank you. And uh, just to put our um, our work sort of in the RDM context, we all know the fair principles of making data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, however, these are not the wisest principles when working with Indigenous data. And so for that, I'd like to highlight the care principles developed by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance uh, for uh, the data, research data must have a collective benefit for Indigenous communities and that Indigenous communities have the authority to control that data, that researchers are responsible to work with Indigenous communities uh, to um, have that collective benefit and authority to control, and uh, that uh, current and future ethical benefits and harms should be assessed uh, from the perspective of the Indigenous community uh, to whom that data relates. And then for First Nations peoples in Canada specifically, we have the OCAP principles uh, developed by the First Nations Information, Information Governance Centre, which is um, that a community or group uh, owns the inf information uh, collectively in the same way that an individual owns their own personal information and then First Nations, their communities and representative bodies are within their rights to control, uh, to seek control over all aspects of research and information management processes that impact them throughout all stages of a particular project from start to finish, so throughout the entire research data life cycle. First, First Nations must have access to information and data about themselves and their communities, regardless of where it is held. And First Nations communities and organizations have the right to manage and make decisions regarding access to their co collective information. And finally, possession, uh, which might seem similar to ownership, but, is actu but actually refers to the physical control over data, which is the mechanism by which ownership can be asserted and protected. And beyond these more general principles, each Indigenous community may have their own specific data protocols researchers must agree to and, and follow. Um, and then in our toolkit as well, uh, taken from all the, uh, the points that we've stated so far, we also highlight um, research data management tools and resources that have already been developed, developed and are available for communities to use. We try to highlight uh, open source tools and uh, resources that have been designed by or in partnership with Indigenous communities, such as the traditional knowledge and biocultural labels developed by the local context team and um, collective or collection management software our collection management system software, uh, such as Bakertu, that allows for tiered access and control. Um, but with all these, all these tools, there's still the challenge that uh, most of these tools and resources and even programming languages um, were not always developed by or in partnership with Indigenous communities and therefore carry an inherent bias and often lack certain features which are essential for Indigenous communities. Um, and, uh, and they might have some language bias as well. So uh, for this presentation, we wanted to have, allow you to have a discussion in small groups and I'm hoping that we still have time for that. So yes. uh, we'd like to, um, set up some breakout rooms and for you to discuss these questions, which I'll put in the chat so for your reference. Um, so if we could get that set up. Welcome back, everyone. I'm going to share the notes document again. If you don't get a chance to discuss your breakout room session, please put your 
a summary of what you discussed in the notes document because we don't have a lot of time between now and the next talk. Um, so thank you very much. Go right ahead, um, Sarah, Shiloh. Thank you. Well, I hope everyone had uh, some uh, fruitful discussion uh, in a few minutes. Um, and I want to invite you to share anything that came up. But uh, before that, I'd first like to thank everyone who is who has been involved in this project so far, uh, because it's definitely been a team effort. And we are uh, just hoping that this this project and this toolkit will be useful for a wide audience. And uh, also, thank you for your time. Um, so I'm just going to go back to the, the slide with the breakout uh, room discussion questions. And uh, yes, and I invite invite uh, anyone to comment on on anything they discussed. You can just unmute yourselves and and um, discuss your your breakout room. Okay, I can share quickly mine, but because what I shared uh, is that I am not uh, quite um, into this uh, topic and uh, I'm not, uh, maybe I should be more uh, aware of this, uh, but it's it's a kind of uh, reality and the priority. Sometimes we don't pay attention to what we need. And I was lucky because I had two uh, persons in the room that can provide me some input from Australia and from Canada. Uh, which I think, in fact, uh, every time that I heard about um, this topic is more from uh, Canada, the States and Australia, not um, really from, from, from Europe and uh, particularly from my, my country, not too much. So this is why uh, so this is, the session was, uh, was important for that, the breakout room. <laughs> Janet was, was also giving some, some tips and some input. So. Oh, that's good to hear. Excellent. For my perspective, personally, uh, one of the things that I struggle with is um, when I'm working with researchers and they've been through the ethics review process and their project is good to go, but I feel like there's an ethical component for the Indigenous data uh, aspect of their project that I think hasn't really been addressed in that ethics review process. So I'm wondering if anyone else has up with that or if they have any uh any insight on, on how they what they do when they're faced with this issue i had one uh, can you hear me yes okay sorry um i did have an experience a year or so ago steve and i were in a meeting and a researcher um asked us how we could implement or how we would all approach care to um, for their project that was coming up. And the, the plan was that the data would be withheld from the participants for three years while the researchers were doing the work. And for me, I, I just said, well, nothing's changed. You know, you're, you're researching people and they're not part of that process. For three years, they, they know nothing. They're not contributing. They can't use that data. You hold it up for three years. And that's actually the last exposure I've had to, uh, you know, talking about someone's actual research project. If that's any help. I think, yeah, no, Jan and I, I, thank you for sharing that. I think you bring up a really good um, point. Uh, you know, there is a lot of that lag time too with returning data back to communities. Um, I know with our opioid, with the opioid work we were trying to do, we were trying to help communities really get that, you know, they're, they're the data collectors. They're the ones that are in these technical spaces that are collecting data, giving it to government, and then they have to wait for it to get, it into any type of uh, workable format that they could use. So that's hard because, you know, what do, what, 
we're dealing with opioid deaths on like a monthly basis, like a weekly basis, and we need this data now. And so it takes two years for us to get that data. So I think even too, not only with research, it's with government, we, you know, we need this data, and but we need to have our, our stamp on it, and we need to have our context around it. Um, I just thought I would add something to um, to that. And um, I'm also from Canada. Uh, I'm a librarian at Queen's University in Kingston. And the one thing that I think bothers me the most, and I think it's one of the biggest aspects of resistance, is the fact that um, the governments say one thing in terms of, you know, oh, we support an Indigenous data sovereignty and Indigenous sovereignty. and you know, whether it's the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or um, right now with um, the unmarked graves at indi uh, residential schools. And they seem to hop on board whatever is the thing that's most in the media um, at the moment, but then they don't actually make any real changes. So if they were really interested in in helping Indigenous communities advance in terms of research and data sovereignty, then they would do things like change the Privacy Act. And they would make these changes legitimate and permanent so that everybody could then use the data that they've collected in the way that is best for them. Thank you for saying that. That's that's exactly how I feel. I'm like, I need legislation change. I I don't need a a report. <laughs> well, um, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but uh, if you have any questions for us, um, or any final thoughts. I, I might take the chair's prerogative and, and possibly ask a question there, which uh, say, I mean, we've got about three minutes. So I'd say a, a quick response there, which, which is, uh, I mean, the interesting, one, one of the interesting experiences we've had is, is dealing with collective ownership um, is, you know, and, and understanding the role of collective ownership has been, you know, is, is a really important and it holds in the Australian case as well as um, from a, from, from a provider point of view, then the question is, how do you actually manage the process of collective ownership in decision-making? Like, so by that I mean is how do you have the, the process of actually making the decision? I don't think people particularly understand, and you know, having done this work, I don't understand it particularly well, but the process of actually making decisions over access and you, know, you talk possession and ownership, how does that play out in the communities themselves? Because say collective ownership means collective decision-making in, in, in that way as well. Um, and I think, well, we've always had those kind of social mechanisms really built into our Blackfoot protocols. And like, that's mm. where Bonnie and I really speak from is that Blackfoot way of knowing mm. and our yeah. way, are those protocols that we have in place. Mm. So like even to like how we would share collective information, it was shared in a public setting. Um, there is a hierarchy of sharing. That's just, you know, that's we mm -hmm. That's practice. So if you were to join one of our ceremonial societies, you would have access to more of that um, yeah. collective knowledge just by the process of, you know, exposure, like you're there, you're in the yeah. process, you're sitting with those Indigenous people. So mm -hmm. when you are making those and how it used to be is when you were making collective decisions on that collective knowledge, it was uh, a group of people it was you know those representative people of the clans like those they were already recognized by their family groups to be the person to make decisions on them based on their past lived experience and how they had you know we had hereditary chiefs these people had these things built in their genetics of how you know they held themselves and they could articulate and speak public speaking very well so these there was already things that were in place that colonial interruption has kind of swept aside and you or said you know they had put their own hierarchy of sharing and who was the expert. So we're just in the process of reclaiming that and in that decision-making, that's what we really do is we, those are our knowledge keepers. Those are our decision makers. Anytime we, uh, like even too, as a young um, person who is 
trying to walk in both worlds. Uh, when I have a um, sort of Western concept that I can't wrap my head around or a decision I have to make um, based in those spaces, I always go and talk to my elders. I always ask them of their and not just one, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go to as many as I can, my trusted elders that have guided me through most of my life to up to this point, I always engage with them. So it's a collective decision that's based on more, like you're, you're basically given like a bibliography from your elders collective knowledge, and then you yourself take those things that align with your value system to put those forward. So it's almost like a collective decision making is already made within our DNA. We're just tapping back into it. Yeah, I think that's one of the most, you know, the most challenging parts of how to understand how that governance process in a sense really works because it is it is so discontinuous with the Western experience, you know, in fact. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, we, we've run out of time and say so we, we do have to move through to the next session, but I wanted to thank um, uh, Sarah and Shiloh so much for the, the presentation there. We're going to be returning this afternoon for some more um, uh, uh, hearing, in fact, about the the, um, uh, the, the local context group uh, and you know the, the implementation of um, the traditional knowledge labels. Um, so, but for now, can I please have, a, again, a round of applause and, and thank yous from our, uh, for our colleagues this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to, uh, we have a talk that was supposed to start at 1115. So thank you, um, Julie and Melissa for your patience. Um, the discussion is moving along well, which is sometimes, so we have to take the time to acknowledge and keep that going. So our next talk is going to be on the NIH GREI uh, DMPRDM updates. Um, where from, could later be picked up? So uh, I'm going to be introducing Julie Goldman and Melissa Renee Korf. Julie is the uh, Countway Research Data Services Librarian. She is part of the Harvard Library Research Data Management Program. She works with students and faculty researchers in the sciences and partners with them to plan for the management of their data through the life cycle of their research project. She also consults on research data management issues and assists researchers with citing and publishing their data. And I'm going to also introduce Melissa while I'm here. Melissa is a research administrator with more than 20 years of experience, of experience and currently serves as the director of grants and contracts within the Office of Research Administration at the Harvard Medical School. In this role, Melissa leads a team, of respons uh, a team responsible for award administration, negotiation of a wide variety of agreements, administrative support for internal award-making programs, research security, and research day of compliance. Prior to joining Harvard in 2012, Melissa was at Boston University for nine years in various research administrative roles. So welcome to you both. Thanks so much, Sonia. Uh, I think I'm up to kick us off. So uh, Julie, next slide, please. I think it's Julie that's showing us. Um, so we're going to start with uh, just an overview of the new policy um, and a little bit of kind of how we got here. Uh, you know, NIH didn't just pull a policy out of thin air. There has been a lot of development in this space over time. Um, NSF launched their, their data management policy, uh, you know, 10, 11 years or so ago, requiring that uh, every proposal would include a two-page data management plan. Um, subsequent to that, uh, OSTP issued what's sometimes colloquially referred to as the Holdren Memo, requiring the major federal funding agencies to develop plans for uh, greater public access to the results of federally funded research. Um, so that's where we see uh, open access publication policies originating from, as well as some of the policies requiring data management and sharing plans. Um, and then most recently, uh, with the, the sort of regulatory authority to mandate data sharing provided to NIH in the 21st Century Cures Act, NIH went through an iterative policy development process to develop the final NIH policy for data management and sharing, which will become effective uh, as of January 25th, 2023. Next slide. Uh, so just some highlights of the policy requirements. 
Uh, as of January 25th, all new and uh, competing applications will be required to submit a plan uh, for how research data will be managed and shared. Um, this is distinct from previous NIH policy, which only required a plan to be submitted with proposals that requested $500,000 of direct costs or more. Um, upon approval of the, of the plan by NIH, it will become a term and condition of the award, meaning that researchers will be expected to actually do what they said they would do in the plan. Um, though we're expecting these plans need to be submitted for the policy effective date in, in January, uh, given the usual NIH application timeline, we're expecting that the first award subject to the new policy would be received sometime in the September or December timeframe. Um, those are the usually the earliest possible start dates for cycle one applications uh, and, and under the normal NIH cycles. Um, the policy, you know, if anyone has taken a look at the policy and you think, man, this is broad, um, you are not wrong. Uh, that is done on purpose because the NIH funds a wide range of different fields uh, and programs, and they needed to leave the policy broad enough in many respects that it could be adapted to fit the needs uh, of program requirements. And so we may see individual NIH institute centers and offices or ICOs developing their own um, individual requirements or programs developing their individual requirements. And in fact, we've actually seen this in a couple examples already. I think, you know, maybe one of the most well-known is NIMH's existing data sharing policy um, that requires uh, human subjects data collected using NIMH funding to be deposited into NIMH's repository um, on a pretty regular basis. NIH's overall goal uh, with implementing this policy is to promote positive change in data management and sharing culture. They want um, data not to be viewed as some sort of byproduct of research. They, want, they don't want data management and sharing to be thought of as, as sort of something you do after the research happens. They want it to be recognized as an integral part of research, that data is a critical output of research and it needs to be treated and valued as such. Next slide. Um, a few more highlights, um, again, so the, this is going to require a, a plan for every research award uh, that is uh, submitted to the NIH uh, versus the old policy, which only required a plan for projects over $500,000 or so in annual direct costs. Um, some initial bank benchmarking uh, across Harvard and our colleague institutions suggests that only about 10 to 20 percent, depending upon institution, of researchers already had to comply with this plan. So we're, we're looking at in terms of NIH funded researchers, 80 to 90% uh, maybe have never done this before. Uh, NIH has indicated that costs associated with data management and sharing may be considered allowable in proposal and award budgets. Um, one of the challenges in the community though, is that NIH has certain caps. So for a modular budget, you can request up to 250,000 direct costs. And in other uh, more detailed budget uh, proposals, you can request up to 500,000 uh, per year in direct costs without having to ask for prior approval. And those, ha those caps haven't changed in at least the 20 years that I've been working in research administration, um, which means that you know, researchers are trying to cover ever increasing costs associated with their research activities within the same cap. You know, they're, 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 they're trying to eke out, eke out the funds uh, where, their, where their limits haven't increased. So that will be one challenge for them in actually uh, introducing these costs into their proposal budgets. Um, there is an expectation that as research evolves, plans so too may need to evolve. Uh, you know, a repository, if you're looking at a, a five-year uh, competing NIH award, a repository may be developed within that time frame that did not exist at the time that you submitted the proposal or other types of developments. Um, and so plans may need to be changed, although, uh, you know, we may need to seek NIH prior approval before making certain changes. Um, what's one of the things that we're waiting for a little bit more guidance on what are the triggers that would work that would um, require prior approval uh, plans uh, we're actually expecting or hoping that they'll be made publicly available perhaps via some mechanism such as the NIH reporter which already includes information on NIH funded awards and so we really should not be including information in those plans that we consider proprietary or private 
uh, plans uh, kind of similar to the NSF requirement, you know, two pages or less in terms of a page limitation, and practices should be consistent with FAIR principles. NIH is continuing to work on additional implementation resources. They released an initial set of FAQs uh, in January 2022, uh, and in April recently released their scientific data sharing site, which is a, a much more comprehensive resource. Next slide. Uh, just to give a little bit of a, of a timeline of, what, of the life of a data management and sharing plan under the new policy, uh, a brief plan is included in the budget justification section. Uh, it's a little unclear exactly how NIH made the determination on where to put it. I think that it being part of the budget justification causes a little bit of confusion, thinking that you know people are only looking at how much you're budgeting. But I suspect it's something more along the lines of that's a section of the proposal that is only commented on by peer reviewers and not part of the score. So then, you know, when the proposal goes to peer review. Uh, they were very careful to make sure that the, how good uh, the plan is isn't necessarily going to be factored into whether or not a proposal is funded, uh, but peer reviewers will comment on whether or not it's a satisfactory plan, whether or not it's consistent with field standards. Um, once an award is selected for funding, the NIH program staff is going to review that plan to make sure that it is consistent with program requirements and it is reasonable and reasonably justified. Uh, it may request revisions at that just-in-time phase prior to award. Once the final plan is approved, it is incorporated into the terms and conditions. We will be required to monitor adherence to that plan on a regular basis, perhaps providing a report during the annual uh, progress report submitted under NIH awards. And then compliance with the, that, that plan may factor into future funding decisions. If we promise the world in a, in a data management sharing plan and we're not able to achieve it, um, that, that may fa factor into whether or not we get that next award. Um, in other scenarios, uh, NIMH in particular has said, you know, we require deposit uh, every six months. And if you are tardy, too often, we may hold your next continuation funding increment until uh, you catch up. So uh, they're definitely uh, considering um, compliance, uh, although it, it may be that they, they wait a little bit of time and let us get used to the new policy before uh, bringing out too many sticks. Next slide. Uh, in terms of timelines uh, for when uh, data is expected to be shared, uh, policy basically says no later than publication or end of award. And I think that there are, you know, going to be op opportunities to talk about um, when maybe a different timeline makes sense when it comes to things like privacy or needing maybe to share that data back with the, the population that it came from, kind of trying to uh, relate back to some of the earlier conversations. Um, as long as you've justified the decisions that you're making and program uh, specific programs may require deposit more frequently than that or sharing more frequently than that. Um, how long to share data? This is another one of those spaces in which the policy is sort of intentionally vague. If you think about something like the, the, the data from the Framingham Heart Study, um, that data is of such high value that maybe it's never appropriate um, to uh, consider getting rid of it. Uh, and we wanna keep it forever. Uh, and other, other data, uh, we have to make some decisions on how long that data is going to continue to be useful. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, again, you know, costs associated with uh, data management and sharing activities may be considered allowable in budgets. Um, many institutions that are NIH funded are going to have to be making decisions what's included in their indirect cost rate already versus what might be included as a direct cost in the budget. Um, data deposit uh, deposit fees for repositories um, are a good example of something that is, is probably going to be considered allowable. Maybe hiring uh, a data librarian or other data management support, uh, sort of FTE assistance with some of those activities. Um, Infrastructure costs typically included in our indirect cost rates, such as uh, if we are usually using indirect costs to co cover our data storage, um, that would not be something that we could include in a budget. And uh, some uh, US agencies that are working on this particular issue right now, uh, Council on Governmental Relations, COGR, Federal Demonstration Partnership, and the Association of Research Libraries all have active working groups trying to tease apart the costs associated with making data publicly accessible, compliance with this policy, and providing guidance. 
Next slide, please. Um, this just gives uh, an overview of the required elements of an NIH data management and sharing plan and the, the next couple slides. Uh, so next slide, please uh, give a little bit more detail in each section. Uh, so within data type, we want to estimate the type and amount of data that's going to be generated. Um, you know, are you generating terabytes? Are you generating uh, smaller amounts? Um, what's the amount of processing that's going to be required to, to use that data set? Um, which data that you're generating do you feel is going to need to be preserved and shared? Um, you know, raw data up to, up to certain uh, process data. What kind of accompanying metadata are you going to be collecting? Um, they also want to be uh, sharing information on tools, software, and or code that are going to be needed to access and manipulate the data, uh, as well as the standards that are going to be applied to collection of the data and the metadata. Next slide, please. Uh, data preservation access and associated timelines. I think this is sort of where we really get into how are we gonna share the data? What's the proposed repository that we're gonna use? How are we gonna make sure that the data is findable and accessible? When are we gonna make the data available? How long do we anticipate that it will be appropriate? Uh, and, and things of that nature. Um, access, distribution, or reuse considerations. This may come into, well, I need to require uh, um, secure access versus really being able to make the data more publicly available. Will I need to ensure that there's a data use agreement in place before sharing the data? How will I protect the privacy of any human subjects that may be involved uh, in those types of uh, other ethical considerations? And then finally, we have to comment on how we're gonna oversee our compliance with the plan. Um, how will we make sure that we're doing what we said we do? How often will we monitor? Um, and who will be monitoring? Um, next slide, please. All right, I think I'm gonna pass this off now to, to Julie to start talking a little bit about repositories as well as some of the resources that are available at Harvard. Great, thanks so much, Melissa. Um, so moving on to repository selection, a major component of the plan and the policy is indicating uh, where researchers plan to share their data. Uh, the policy is clear in strongly encouraging the use of established repositories rather than, you know, for example, retaining a copy of your data, uh, which will be made available upon request. Uh, the NIH has provided supplemental information on selecting repositories that provides um, desirable characteristics, which I'll share in a couple slides. Um, NIH also makes available a list of the NIH supported domain uh, or program specific repositories, as well as some generalist repositories like Dataverse. Uh, but the po policy does not you know, require uh, the specific use of any specific repository. However, as uh, Melissa alluded to, certain institutes and centers more specific programs uh, may go beyond the policy and designate a specific repository, uh, like the example of the NIMH uh, data archive. Uh, so NIH does encourage selecting a repository that exemplifies the desirable characteristics. Um, and these characteristics aim to ensure that data are managed and shared in ways that are consistent with the FAIR data principles. You're probably all very uh, familiar with the FAIR principles, and we saw them in the previous um, keynote. Um, so FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I do want to mention, you know, call out those other principles like the CARE principles um, that we discussed earlier. Uh, so researchers and repositories may, you know, want to and need to consider those moving forward. Um, NIH is definitely thinking about responsible data sharing uh, through their recent uh, request for information on improving research specifically um, for tribal nations and um, thinking about tribal sovereignty. So we all know data sharing is more involved than just simply uploading files somewhere for others to find. Um, it does not necessarily mean making it um, fully open or publicly available. So the methods you use to share your data will really depend on a number of factors, including the size and content of your data, um, mandates from entities that uh, fund and publish your research, um, as well as assumptions and requirements um, related to future use. Um, so we don't wanna just make our data available. It should also be usable. 
Uh, we wanna make sure that data is accessible and can be um, obtained with minimal effort. Even if that data is restricted, we wanna think about how we can open up some metadata records um, so that researchers could review what that data set um, includes and request further access, for example. Data should be in an appropriate format using common uh, standards and controlled vocabularies. So this ensures we can integrate data across platforms. And then finally, we wanna ensure that our data is well-documented and has clear usage um, licensing. So I do just wanna pull up quickly um, the NIH supplemental information on desirable repository characteristics. Um, this is the list that NIH um, provides. And they also provide um, a list on uh, working with um, human subjects data. Uh, so these characteristics also apply to repositories that store um, only de-identified human data um, as preventing re-identification is often not possible, thus requiring additional um, considerations to protect privacy um, and security. And these are um, you know, expanded upon in the supplemental information. Uh, so it is useful uh, to, to review these. So our next section is just gonna touch on some of the work that we are currently doing at Harvard University and some uh, resources that we have developed um, for our community, um, not just our local community, but we are sharing these you know, more widely um, for others to, to take and adapt. Um, so at Harvard, um, specifically on the Longwood Medical um, campus, we have a research data management working group, and we have a website uh, with tons of information and resources related to uh, research data management. And our group provides guidance and practices for working with data, um, links to policies, um, service contacts, lots of video tutorials and trainings, um, and so much more. So we invite you to check out this website um, and see uh, we encourage you to um, engage with us um, if, if, you're, if you're interested. And there, as I mentioned, the resources are openly available on our website um, and also in Open Science Framework, and we encourage others to use and remix for their own purposes. Um, so I'm gonna let Melissa jump in quickly to talk about our services or resources for DUAs. DUA is one of my favorite topics. Um, so at, at Harvard, we have a, a policy on data use agreements for when a DUA may be required. Uh, and we do try to limit that when they are sort of regulatory uh, or legally required um, versus doing a data use agreement for something that doesn't need to be so protected. Uh, or when, of course, a data provider requires us to have one in place. Uh, we do have the, the negotiation and signing authority localized within uh, our three sponsored offices. So at Harvard, that's OSP, HMS, ORA, or SPHORA. Uh, and uh, we have a, a system, we use the Huron uh, agreements module for routing and uh, tracking of data use agreements. So we invite folks to either just submit us a DUA or reach out to one of the negotiating offices to determine if a DUA is needed. Back to you, Julie. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, so we just we saw how the data management plan is a cent is central to this new NIH policy, um, creating a plan that describes how data will be managed and shared throughout the course of a research project is an important step in ensuring that you, uh, the, the project collaborators, and potentially future researchers can you know find and use um, that data. Um, many of you are probably aware of the DMP tool, which is a free tool that can help researchers create data management plans that fulfill the requirements of many different funders. Um, this is created by a group of institutions led by the California Digital Library, um, and it's really designed to create those high quality DMPs that meet uh, the requirements of uh, specific funding agencies. I'll be doing a presentation um, with um, a representative from um, CDL and DMP um, later this week if you're interested in seeing some new features of DMP tool. Uh, but anyway, anyone can use DMP tool. Um, if you do have an, um, an institution affiliation like Harvard, um, you could log in with credentials and um, 
Maybe there's some added uh, university specific guidance, which we have done at Harvard. Um, we have some tailored um, templates and examples and guidance for our researchers um, at Harvard. Specifically, um, I think I shared the work on our templates at last year's um, a dataverse community meeting, but we created a template for uh, biomedical research projects and um, more general um, uh, research projects. Of course, now we are definitely pointing our researchers directly to the um, NIH template um, that is already um, within DMP tool on how they can get started on writing a DMSP for um, NIH funding. Sorry, why? Um, the next resource we do want to mention, um, so we talked about data repositories and sharing data. Uh, so while the policy is clear on encouraging the use of repositories, they don't um, tell you exactly which one. So deciding on which repository to use um, may be a barrier for, for our researchers. Um, so encouraging them to you know, see what's out there, see what their um, subject area um, uses, um, the domain, um, platforms available. And then of course, thinking about are there um, generalist places that uh, may be suitable um, as, as, as well. So we do have this um, repository comparison grid on our website. It is a little outdated. I will give that, that caveat. Um, so uh, it does need a little bit of updating. Um, and, and there's other resources out there, um, such as the FAIR sharing collection and um, read 3 data, which are great places to point researchers to find out um, on their repositories. And I do just want to address a comment um, in the chat from Sherry that I meant I thought I um, would mention on the previous slide, but I forgot um, that DMP tool is just one um, data management plan creating platforms out there. Um, it's highly um, heavily used here in the US. So of course, um, in the EU, you may be using something um, like DMP online or DMP assist that um, Sherry put, pointed to um, in the chat. So thanks, Sherry, um, that we are we are focusing on some US centric um, policies and resources here, um, but you may have other um, policies and tools um, in your um, local areas that are more um, relevant. That brings us to um, our last um, section of our presentation this morning, uh, where we wanted to talk about the Generalist Repository Ecosystem um, Initiative. Um, so this is a larger five-year project that the Dataverse project, um, including the local Harvard Dataverse and uh, library teams are a part of. Um, so the NIH Gray Generalist uh, Repository Ecosystem Initiative is bringing together the six generalist repositories to supplement um, those NIH domain specific data repositories. Um, so they include, as I mentioned, Dataverse, Dryad, Figshare, Mendeley, um, Open Science Framework, and Bibli. Uh, so we know certain data types may have designated homes and NIH centers and institutes may designate specific repositories um, for their funded research, but these general repositories really fill the gap uh, where researchers do not have uh, a designated place or they just may need to share um, some aspect of their project that does not um, need to go into a domain specific uh, platform. Uh, so therefore, we think this initiative will be crucial for researchers to comply with this new NIH policy uh, and make their data available uh, where possible with you know, those, the lowest barriers to, to access that we mentioned. So overall, the platforms plan to address and implement a common set of capabilities that comply with those desirable uh, repository characteristics as define, defined by the policy that we looked at. Um, and we have a couple of working groups tackling specific goals of the grant. Um, so those targeted goals include establishing metrics to better measure usage and impact, and that's connecting with the Make Data Count uh, project. Uh, next is developing use cases for data sharing, including working with different types of data. And again, perhaps where one would choose a generalist repository over a specialized repo. Uh, we have a group focused on uh, training and education. 
Um, so training and educating researchers on fair data principles um, and the importance of data sharing and when you know one would choose um, their um, a certain platform and we know certain platforms have um, already scheduled lots of um, webinars um, already this summer. And then finally, there is a uh, working group looking at improving discoverability of data within and across participating um, journalist repositories just to hopefully accelerate reproducibility and reuse of data. Uh, finally, we want to uh, take this opportunity to um, for a call to action for repositories, including the uh, broader Dataverse network. Uh, it would be beneficial for us to provide guidance on how the platform meets those desirable characteristics of applicable, of applicable funders um, and publishers. Um, so I'm thinking more broadly here, but for example, outlining how Dataverse meets those NIH desirable characteristics for all um, data repositories. Um, pulling from community examples um, and experiences can really help align Dataverse features uh, with those NIH outlined characteristics. Uh, also providing guidance on writing sections of a data management plan for meeting data share, sharing requirements. So for example, we have uh, created example language for our researchers to use um, in certain sections of um, a data management plan. Uh, we could see creating boiler boilerplate language um, about Dataverse that researchers can use in an NIH data management and sharing plan under that preservation access and associated timeline section would really save researchers, librarians, um, and other um, consults lots of time. And maybe many of you in the network have already created these resources. Um, so bringing those um, to the surface uh, would really enhance um, uh, researchers, you know, complying with this policy and maybe bring down their uh, their heartbeat and stress level from having to comply with with such a with such a repository. So yes, we would love to hear if you have um, some some guidance and examples um, already written um, at your local institutions. Um, just to wrap up um, our quick talk this morning. Um, the message we want to communicate with researchers is the need to plan ahead uh, the process and the costs associated with publishing research um, articles and data sets is well known. Therefore, we should be um, including adequate resources within research proposals to ensure that data is sufficiently managed, prepared, and shared. Uh, in addition to costs, just as you know, with publishing articles, we need to ensure that um, all parties who have contributed to the data um, are credited and agree to publish that data. Uh, making sure that researchers request those adequate funds um, for proper management and curation of data in order to make it um, open. Uh, for the NIH policy, uh, again, researchers will have to indicate the repository or repositories they plan to use. Um, so ensure that they have you know, proper permissions to make their data um, open from their institution, their colleagues, um, and the uh, research subjects. Um, and then finally, considering not only that primary data, but any of that background or supplemental data, what data really needs to be um, preserved and shared um, I think we're going to receive a lot of questions um, from researchers uh, regarding um, those, those pieces. Um, so bottom line here is plan ahead and write a plan out that everyone on the research team um, understands um, and can follow throughout um, the project and modify um, as, as needed. Um, we have a final slide with tons of uh, sources and, and references. And I think we have some time for questions, Sonia, um, but I don't know. You absolutely do have time. And then what follows this is lunch. So if people want to hang around and discuss during lunch, absolutely welcome to do that. And I'm going to quote you, plan ahead and write a plan. I like that. So, so Julie, we've had a little bit of um, chatter in the chat. Yeah. Um, about um, whether or not the Dataverse platform itself is compliant with the NIH requirements. 
uh, or, or it's just individual instances. And I think part of the GREI is that the entire platform would be um, consistent with the NIH requirements and desirable characteristics, right? Yes, that is that is correct. Kind of those those six um, platforms were, were were kind of chosen and you know approved uh, by by NIH to um, to serve as one of those uh, approved repositories. Um, um, I assume there's many other of our our Gray Initiative colleagues on the call, so please feel free to jump in if you know more about the initiative than than I do. And we do have a, a, a couple of people to chime in. If the question is related to the answer, we had Robin and Stephen, but um, so that's actually a good question. I know we're building the tools for the dataverse. And I, then I think each installation has to uh, basically um, integrate the tools. Uh, so Globus, um, et cetera, would have to be integrated into their installation. And I know Harvard Dataverse is already planning to do that. Um, so other installations would have to speak about about what they're planning to do. Um, can, I, can I step in, Sonia? Yeah. yeah. So, because I think we need to respond exactly to that. I mean, someone who runs a you know runs an instance. I don't. I say I think probably a delineation needs to be made between what the platform can do and what the specific installation does do. I, I don't. I don't see how you address both. So. You know, file you know file sizes, total data set sizes, and things like that. There are going to be policies that occur at particular installations that define the you know define these limits. Even costs, I can imagine. You know, you know, right. So I was just flicking up the uh, um, the profile of what was in the you know desirable characteristics. As I say, you know, certainly there are these desirable characteristics in Dataverse can do all of those things. But my specific installation may or may not accept you know, all of those things. So, you know, I, I think it's probably worth, uh, maybe this is an effort for the community as well, which is of those desirable characteristics, which of do each of us, you know, possibly deliver as well, um, you know, um, so so that we can be kind of accounting for that too. So, you know, as I say, we, ideally the platform as a whole should do all of those, these things. What instance installation specific variations might there be is something we probably need to be able to present on it might be interesting discussion for questions of configuration and installation metadata fundamentally there might be an, actually a technical way we could kind of present that too okay and robin um you can go right ahead oh hi thank you um yeah it it, it was a question um it, it, I'm not sure which of the two speakers were speaking at this point, but um, regarding the the cost, the cost recovery, uh, you know, it says these kinds of explicit costs can be included, but these background infrastructure costs cannot. Do um, do you see any way that uh, some of these costs could be passed on to the hosting repository, um, for example, at your institution? We're we're trying to think about that at our institution. You mean by a repository being able to uh, charge a user fee or something like that? Um, or, um, or or even if um, even if a fee isn't charged, but if um, but have some kind of policy where if the researcher is submitting a proposal where those kind of costs are covered that they might um, include specific costs for the repository that go back to that service provider, but I don't know if the, from the bullet points, whether that kind of cost would be allowed. Yeah, and, and so I think the infrastructure is uh, related to just sort of the way that most US institutions um, deal with their costing for grants, right? So we have certain costs uh, that are like the lights, uh, buildings that are considered real infrastructure costs that can't be directly allocated and directly charged to a grant. And that's part of our indirect cost rate that gets charged, uh, you know, associated with expenses. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a reminder that those types of infrastructure costs, if they're part of this indirect cost rate, can't also directly be charged. Um, but there are uh, methods for developing sort of like service center or cost center rates, which a repository could easily be structured in that way that would allow a repository to develop a rate. Um, you know, one of the challenges may be, is it totally based on size? 
you know, as type of the data going to play into that in some way? Might there be a service that's layered on top? Like we can help you clean the data and also put it in the repository. Like what are the, what are the services and what are the units? And then developing a, a rate that's compliant with federal cost principles. I think that mo most US institutions at least um, would be able to, to come up with a costing methodology for that. Thanks, that, that's really helpful. Although, although, although we, it, it probably couldn't pick and choose, right? Because you, we also wanna keep the repository free to encourage the right incentives to share openly. That is definitely a consideration when we talk about different costing. If we charge for a thing, then we're, we may be influencing behavior not in the direction that we want it to go, uh, where if, it's, if it costs, uh, it may not be utilized as much as if we make it uh, an invisible or, or free uh, service. There's still some questions in the um, chat. Is there a requirement for machine actionable DMP at NIH as a funding requirement? Uh, NIH is not currently requiring machine actionable DMPs. That may be something that we see in the future once the culture evolves to a point that that's supportable. Okay. But I think right now they're just trying to get people to share. <laughs> right. And Amber uh, wrote that many researchers are not compliant with their published sh data sharing statement and the published research. How can this be improved? Seems like these statements need to be actionable, fair. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how we can, um, you know, really address that um, right, right, right now. But yes, I think as we kind of mentioned throughout the presentation, you know, NIH is trying to shift the culture a little bit, get away from the data available upon request um, that we that we frequently see, um, and move towards. Uh, submitting data to a repository as the as the norm as the standard. Uh, so hopefully, as we shift the culture to to have that happen, uh, we will get away from you know researchers um, not sharing you know changing the way they they share their data and make their data available. Okay. Um, okay. If there are no other questions, we will let everybody take their lunch break, but feel, feel free to use the open notes document to also include any other questions you may have um, and help to take notes. We will see those that are leaving at 1230 for the next uh, keynote. So thank you very much. And we are here if you have any questions. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so, so we're into the afternoon session of, of keynotes and uh, uh, presentations, continuing our theme this afternoon around Indigenous data and Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, so uh, for those who weren't here, here earlier, I'm Steve McEachran. I'm Director of the Australian Data Archive based in uh, Australia, but currently in Gotham. No, where am I today? At Bergen in Norway. I was in Gothenburg last week. Um, uh, so as I say, um, I'm very pleased to be chairing this session um, where we're going to have presenting uh, Jane Anderson. Um, so Jane is an associate professor at uh, New York University in Lenape Coking. I'm going to get so I'm going to take it take a guess uh, at New York and ah and that's it's the local local name for New York I see um, and. Uh, a global fellow in the Engelberg Center for Innovation, Law and Policy at the, in the law school at uh, NYU. Jane has a PhD in law and works on intellectual and cultural property issues, Indigenous rights and the protection of Indigenous traditional knowledge and cultural heritage. The last 20 years, Jane's been working for and with Indigenous communities to find access, control and regain authority and ownership of Indigenous cultural and intellectual property collections and data within universities, libraries, museums and archives. Jane's co-founder of Local Contexts, uh, uh, which delivers tr the traditional knowledge and biocultural labels and notices. She's also the co-founder of Enrich, 
Uh, so Jan will be say, um, talking to us today about uh, some of the, the work she's done. We've got a, um, uh, I'll be following up with a little bit from experience we've had, you know, in the Australian case, but Jane, I say people need to hear less from me and more from you. So please feel free. We've got about an hour and a half in total. Um, so as I, um, as I'll leave it to you to, to, to time and we'll, uh, and, um, we'll have, uh, some time, plenty of time for questions afterwards, and then I'll give some Australian reflections. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and I also want to thank um, Janet McDougall for the invitation to be here with you today. Uh, I'm here in Lenape Hoking uh, in New York and I want to begin by paying respects to the ancestors, to the elders and to the present and the emerging leaders of these lands and waters. I also want to do that and acknowledge that I'm a settler scholar uh, and that part of my responsibilities and obligations uh, continue to be uh, addressing the long structure of uh, settler colonialism and it's the way in which it continues to perpetuate violence and dispossession upon Indigenous peoples. So my role is really um, here working to support Indigenous futures. So I'm going to uh, share my screen if that's okay. Let me see if I can do that. Um, and then, yep, great, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, which should hopefully um, give us enough time for a conversation post. Um, sorry, I'm just getting all the people coming into the room are popping up on my on my screen it's so great to see so many of you from so many different places welcome welcome um so i'm going to talk about local context and the traditional knowledge labels and notices and i just want to acknowledge that this would be a talk that i would normally be giving with my co-directors uh all my amazing team some of them are here today uh and so there'll be a lot of um links to some of the projects that I talk about. And I don't know, Corey, you might put some of those into the chat as we're going, um, as we're going through. Let's see. So I'm just going to kind of frame this talk with kind of five of the kind of key larger questions that led to both the development of uh, local contexts, as well as the way in which it starts to raise particular questions around Indigenous data sovereignty and the ways in which uh, the traditional knowledge labels and notices support Indigenous aspirations for governance and decision making over Indigenous data. Um, so these kind of five uh, big problems tend to sit firstly within the, the fact that every Indigenous community has enormous collections of data in archives, libraries, museums, repositories and other online databases. However, significant information about these collections, including community names and proper provenance, is just missing. It wasn't uh, thought to be important uh, when a lot of these Indigenous collections were being created. Uh, and that means that it makes it very, very difficult to find these collections. So it's kind of going to come back to that particular problem in a minute. Uh, one of the areas that has always kind of been part of what my interests have been, largely because I have an intellectual property law background, is Indigenous peoples and communities are largely not the legal rights holders of these collections. And if you're not a legal right holder, you have very, very limited capacity for control or decision making over the future of how that material gets utilised. Um, and so these issues of responsibility and ownership, as well as kind of the incomplete and significant mistakes in the metadata, continue to enter the digital lives of this material. So as material is uh, digitized, because it's missing important provenance information about Indigenous communities' names or Indigenous individuals, those mistakes continue into the digital lives of that material. Um, and then, of course, we move into the kind of contemporary present where there are actually more researchers working and collecting information and data and samples from Indigenous communities than ever before. And our practices around including proper Indigenous uh, provenance and, and, and including different kinds of attention to Indigenous methodologies have not largely changed across multiple disciplines. Um, it's still something, it sits as, it's still, it still sits on the margins and that's a kind of a major problem to be dealing with as well. 
So, um, and I'm sure this has been something that you've already talked about today. So I'll just um, I'll just briefly uh, introduce this and where that kind of sits with the labels is the, the care principles for Indigenous data governance that were established in 2019. And these uh, care principles were really developed to sit along the FAIR principles uh, to kind of make data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. But instead of kind of focusing, well, instead, I should say probably, um, the incentive behind the care principles is connections between people and data. So the principles that, that, that are part of care really focus on collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics. So in that way, they bring people back into the management of uh, data and particularly Indigenous data, which is kind of key to the care principles. So within the care principles, a lot of the conversations since 2019 have been how do we think through the operationalization of care? They sit at a kind of a high level policy framework um, and, and kind of a, 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 the incentive is to embed them into policy frameworks, but then it's kind of like, what does that mean to operationalize care? What does that look like in, in, in practice? And so there's a lot of work happening across multiple Indigenous contexts around uh, thinking through uh, tribal codes or Indigenous codes of governance internal to communities. So a lot of uh, Indigenous data governance work going on. I know you've had um, earlier today a couple of uh, panels thinking about that. Um, there's also the development of uh, Indigenous data sharing agreements, Indigenous data governance. Uh, tribal uh, institution review boards, changes at kind of internal uh, Indigenous community governance frameworks, as well as kind of pushing into institutional guidelines and the work that needs to happen within institutions and repositories uh, to address and to implement care in an effective way. Um, that means that Indigenous data is part of a conversation and, you know, grateful to, to for the invitation to be here because clearly it is part of an active conversation um, as all of you are here present today. So uh, the labels and the notices that I'm going to talk about presently, we kind of identify as sitting under these kinds of principles of collective benefit, authority to control and responsibility. Primarily the labels sit under collective benefit, authority to control and responsibility, and the notices, which are really an institutional tool, start to sit under responsibility and ethics. Just want to also add that some of this work that's um, also uh, going on is around the development of uh, indicators to assess researcher and institutional implementation of the care principles. This is a new grant from the Luce Foundation that we have with the Collaboratory for Indigenous Data Governance at the Native Nations Institute. Um, to kind of think through what those indicators to assess the uptake of care principles look like, as well as creating tools and resources to further the to further facilitate the implementation of the care principles. So, so much of this work comes uh, into uh, play because of the histories of documenting Indigenous peoples and communities. Um, these are very long colonial histories. Uh, that kind of documentation is found in so many different repositories and archives and libraries. These are just some examples from the Lewis and Clark expedition that's held in the American Philosophical Society. And from this kind of very uh, moment of this expedition, which was only possible because of uh, native knowledges and through the support of native nations that uh, were integral to this expedition, um, Lewis and Clark uh, documented a lot about indigenous people across that particular expeditionary project. Um, so kind of these, these histories of documenting indigenous um, peoples and communities are intense and intensive. Um, and this, it means that, these, that this information is spread across uh, institutions worldwide. A big challenge for the care principles is if you can't, you can't govern Indigenous data if you can't find Indigenous data. One of, the, um, one of the legacies of the documentation of Indigenous communities is how it sits within repositories but is not particularly findable. Um, this is just kind of a, an example of that from uh, some papers at the American Philosophical Society, um, which uh, has buried in it Indigenous data. Um, I, when I was down, and you could only find that out by being in the stacks themselves, in, inside the institution and being there and looking at the label. And I asked the archivist who was there how an Indigenous person from um, 
um, the Kiapo who might have an interest in this data that was collected would find these collections. And he said they couldn't. They would only be able to find it if they were down here in the um, in the stacks looking at these um, documents. And I wasn't even there looking for these documents. I was looking for um, Penobscot language materials, actually. Uh, and so this was just in the box next door. And so this kind of like challenge, this great challenge of actually finding Indigenous data um, sits as kind of one of the, the, the biggest challenges because Indigenous data currently isn't fair. Um, under the kind of idea of the fair principles. It's also a challenge for Indigenous communities to identify Indigenous information and, and data that's held by third parties. So in particularly within uh, particular data repositories. So for example, when uh, in communities are wanting to do different kinds of assessments, they often need access to data sitting in third party repositories. Uh, they need a lot of advice about how to access that data, what the responsibilities and obligations are, particularly if it's held, uh, it's, if it's in a proprietary third party um, uh, repository. And so it kind of just starts to speak to the myriad of challenges for Indigenous communities in governing and making decisions about how to use that data into the future. So my background is uh, in intellectual property, as uh, I kind of mentioned at the very beginning, and this is really where the labels uh, and the notices as a particular kind of initiative began. Um, and this is in response to multiple communities across multiple uh, countries asking for particular kinds of tools that sat outside the already existing kind of copyright or creative commons licensing frameworks. This is partly because if you don't have legal rights to information and to the kind of collections and to data, you can't do anything with it. You can't exert control over it, nor can you create a license to use it. Uh, and so this kind of pushed us to create the traditional knowledge labels and really moving from a paradigm of property and ownership into one that is really focused more on establishing Indigenous cultural authority over these collections and over the data. So the traditional knowledge labels were developed over the last 10 to 12 years, um, really with community partnership, uh, both identifying what are the interests that communities want to have uh, connected back to their collections. Obviously names are very important and having the proper attribution is uh, critical to uh, uh, Indigenous, assert asserting Indigenous cultural authority, but also understanding that there are a range of protocols for sharing information, sharing data that Indigenous communities want to see kept with their collections and part of decisions and bringing communities back into uh, decisions about how that material can be utilised into the future. So this is just an example of three of the traditional knowledge labels and I should say that it's important that they're machine readable and human readable digital tags um, that allow for uh, cultural protocols, but also provenance information and also uh, permissions to sit differently within the metadata. Um, these are just three, the TK attribution label, the culturally sensitive label and the traditional knowledge seasonal label. All communities that we've worked with in this project thus far uh, tend to always use the attribution label asking for their names to be properly cited for people to know to, to make that connection between people and knowledge in a different kind of way. Um, but the culturally sensitive label does something different. It starts to make visible uh, concerns that communities might have around certain sensitivities that might sit with certain kinds of information. Um, this could be because communities haven't had access to that material, they haven't been able to assess it for uh, what kinds of cultural information sit there and therefore are concerned about its circulation. But also it kind of speaks to um, some of the derogatory uh, language that is often utilised by people who were documenting and studying Indigenous communities from um, missionaries to Bureau of Indian Affairs agents where, and to census record keepers. Um, and so kind of making sure that there is a, a way of making any users of that data and information clear that there's cultural sensitivities from an Indigenous community's perspective that might change how that material gets utilised or circulated. 
The traditional knowledge seasonal label does something else again. It connects knowledge to place. Uh, it, it, it starts to create this uh, connective tissue uh, between where knowledge comes from and where it's held and what the responsibilities and obligations around that are. Uh, for instance, within the uh, archives, libraries, museums of the world, there are enormous collections of songs, of dances, of um, different kinds of Indigenous information. Um, but some of those songs and some of those dances should only be done at certain times of the year. Uh, and it's the, the environment around uh, the community that actually creates the conditions for singing a particular song, for instance. So sweet grass harvesting happens at a particular time of the year. That's when certain songs are sung. There are some stories about particular animals and relations that should only be heard at particular times of the year when the first on, on the first snow, for instance. And so this label brings people in place back back into a conversation with each other. And in doing that kind of changes how we understand these records and how we understand this material that's sitting publicly available in archives, libraries and museums around the world. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples of how the labels have been utilized by First Nations and uh, Native Nations and uh, Aboriginal communities in Australia. Um, but this is uh, what's unique about the labels is they allow for customization. Uh, every community has the capacity to define uh, the, the, the contours of the label themselves uh, according to their own interests and according to their, their sovereignty. Um, so this is the attribution label that has been customized by the Scarlet's uh, Band of the Stolo First Nation in British, what is now British Columbia. Uh, and you can see that there's space for uh, Indigenous languages to be incorporated into the labels. This label was translated into Hull Kamalem, um, really literally meaning name and place. And then also then customised about why, this, why Scowlitz are utilising this label. What's interesting in this example is this is, was uh, for a, um, a digital website uh, that the Scowlitz created according to Scarlet's uh, community protocol in terms of who was involved in creating that. They do hold copyright in all the content that is shared in this website, but they decided that they wanted to use of the traditional knowledge labels to really orient people towards Indigenous protocol about how to share this material into the future. And this is kind of why they decided to use the attribution label, they decided to use the outreach label, they decided to use the non-commercial and then also the verified labels as well. But what this has done has created kind of a framework or a scaffolding that, that meant that uh, community members felt comfortable sharing their information. Uh, they don't share anything that can't be known publicly, that's all kept uh, within the community, but they have shared stories that have particular for family responsibilities in terms of how they're shared, as well as particular kinds of relationships to place and to repatriation. Uh, and so the labels are being used to kind of, again, create that kind of framework for somebody who comes to this site and explores what Scarlet's have decided to share. The labels help guide and orient that around the Scarlet's protocols of sharing and responsibility. This is just another example of uh, the labels being utilized within a digital publishing context within Raven Space at University of British Columbia. Um, this is a digital story that is told by a Slaman elder, Elsie um, Paul, and they utilize the labels across different kinds of chapters of, um, of the digital publishing book. Um, so there's a protocol for being a respectful guest, and you can kind of see in the top corner there is um, an attribution label. And then in the different chapters of the book um, around territory, colonialism, community and wellness, the labels are really used to kind of guide and orient um, uh, people uh, towards the, the, the way in which, uh, well, the kind of and the ex expectations about how this material should be shared and under what conditions. This is an example of the labels being utilized within a curriculum context at the University of Tasmania. Um, this was a context where uh, uh, 
there was an effort to indigenize the curriculum so that all uh, undergraduates had to take um, this particular course on indigenous life worlds. Uh, the, the, the course was developed with Palawa elders. Um, Palawa elders really wanted to make clear what the responsibilities and obligations of people not only teaching this course, because of course it's not only um, it's not only Indigenous lecturers teaching this course, but also to the students in terms of thinking about, you know, what does proper attribution mean and what how is this being this information is being shared within a learning context and it's being done according to community protocol. Uh, and so this is kind of just another example of how the labels have been utilized within um, another context. This is uh, within the Uruk Justice Commission in Australia as well. Um, this is a more recent example coming out of this uh, important Justice Commission, the first in uh, Australia to look at the histories of colonialism within the Victorian context. Uh, what has been very key to any submission of evidence within this uh, Justice Commission has been uh, Indigenous data sovereignty and data governance, and that has been built into the Justice Commission from the very beginning. This is the first time in the history of a Justice Commission that Indigenous data sovereignty has been built in as a kind of a, a key uh, cornerstone of the evidentiary process. Um, and the, the Europe Justice Commission is also utilising the traditional age labels as part of a way of marking the metadata for those submissions as they come into um, the, the Justice Commission. So the example I want to kind of talk about now, so they're just kind of like some of the, the, the more public facing examples of the ways in which the labels have been utilised by Indigenous communities. And they're, it just kind of speaks a little bit to their flexibility across kind of multiple sectors. But this example is a little bit more around um, the ways in which the labels enter into digital infrastructures themselves. Uh, and so this is an example of the Passamaquoddy um, tribe in Maine uh, and the first sound recording recordings that were made on native lands in March 1890 by Jesse Walter Fuchs. So this is the record as it set, sat before uh, doing the work with Passamaquoddy and with us at um, local contexts. This is a record that is an impoverished one, uh, has very, very little information from Passamaquoddy in relation. In fact, we know nothing about the content here. Um, we only know a little bit about the, um, the sound recordings, uh, how, how long they are, um, but we know little about the, the content itself. Um, and we also see, you know, clearly there's a rights advisory, um, the rights being held by um, Harvard in relationship to those sound recordings. This is the updated uh, record in the Library of Congress now. So there were 31 wax cylinders. And so this kind of updating of those 31 records has um, been slowly happening from the work with, at, um, with elders at the Passamaquoddy uh, tribe. And this is kind of the updated record and there's pages more of information that has been shared by Passamaquoddy in relationship to what these songs are, what their content is. You can see that the title has also been changed to include the Passamaquoddy title. Um, and you'll see that the traditional knowledge labels are, um, are as, as high as they can be in relationship to uh, the, the recordings themselves. So the Passamaquoddy decided they wanted to use three uh, traditional knowledge labels in the work with the Library of Congress, the attribution label, the outreach label and the non-commercial label. They really wanted to communicate their cultural authority over these recordings um, and to make sure that any uh, public that comes to these recordings knows very clearly where that authority sits and that Passamaquoddy is a present day community that retains that authority. So as we were kind of working through this project with the Library of Congress, this became a question about where should the information about the labels sit? Um, we were very emphatic that this information doesn't go into an other field uh, because Indigenous people have been so thoroughly othered. Uh, so it needed to be kind of another field needed to be found. And so 
the result of that dialogue with the Library of Congress was placing the labels in the rights advisory itself, uh, functioning as first rights, as cultural rights, and sitting there as a conversation with um, the legal rights holder. Um, and so you can see that they've been added there in the rights advisory, very clearly kind of pointing back to um, Passamaquoddy rights and interests. Um, this is the labels, of course, this pushes into, this starts to push into um, the different cause. Uh, so they decided that it was in um, Mark 540, uh, which is where the, the labels would sit within the kind of the library system. Then within the Dublin core, they would add them to the rights field down the bottom as well. So kind of moving from, you know, what, what the public facing placement of those uh, labels within the rights advisory, how that then starts to move into um, the Dublin core system itself. Uh, and so this is kind of currently where um, the standard practice for including the labels currently sits through the Library of Congress is, in, is its placement within the rights field. Probably the biggest um, intervention within this project from the Passamaquoddy was in transforming the digital infrastructure itself. So this is um, a JSON file with the uh, new field of traditional knowledge labels that has been included. Um, what this means is that any Indigenous community can now add their traditional knowledge labels to the Library of Congress. Uh, and so what the Passamaquoddy worked to do on 31 wax cylinders has now opened the possibility of any Indigenous community with material at the Library of Congress to add their traditional knowledge labels into that institution. And given it, given it is one of the largest institutions in the United States holding Indigenous cultural material, this is kind of a really significant contribution that Passamaquoddy have made to other communities across the country and across the world. So if the traditional knowledge labels were largely developed to think about uh, cultural heritage material and collections that are held in libraries, archives and museums, we also understood that um, the work that's happening within uh, data communities around genomic sequencing, around uh, uh, genetic resources was an, also an area of uh, intense Indigenous interest. So over the last uh, four or so years, we've been developing the biocultural labels, which really do a kind of a similar job. They really more sit, however, less in the protocol space, more in the provenance in terms of creating the possibility for Indigenous data provenance to be associated with data as soon as it's collected, as well as the kind of the commissions that communities want to have in relationship to how that data travels and how they want to be kept and involved in any kind of future research that might emerge around how that data um, is utilised. So these are the biocultural labels, again, kind of speaking to different forms of consent, but also uh, desire to be part of collaborations and research around and using that data into the future, particularly if there is any kind of commercialization opportunities that might arise. This is an example that Maui, um, our partner in this project, often um, speaks to. This is from his uh, community in Whakatohia, which is in, um, in New Zealand. Uh, and they are using both the traditional knowledge labels and the biocultural labels, recognizing that there is traditional knowledge that sits in particular places where the data itself is being sequenced. Uh, this is around uh, green lip mussels and kind of marine heat waves is the kind of uh, research because uh, Fakato here have um, offshore uh, mussel farming interests and they kind of want to know about the kind of genetic sequencing from the mussels that happen uh, that, that are on their um, on their waters <clears throat> excuse me but they also have particular songs and particular chants that are all along that coastline and as part of a relationship between the species and the songs and the communities and so the traditional knowledge labels do a lot of work of kind of connecting that knowledge to the data that's actually coming out of the sequencing of the um, of the the muscles themselves. Um, I think there was something else I was going to say about that, but I can't quite remember. Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, I remembered as I was drinking too fast. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, within this project, I think there's something really um, important about what does it what does it mean to think that data might have a song that goes with it. <coughs> Okay, back on track. Um, so uh, the labels really communicate three key things. They communicate provenance, where does this data come from? Uh, how are Indigenous names and interests and family relationships and multiple community interests to be kept with that data into the future? How does it travel with that information? Uh, protocols, the uh, expectations for how that Data, data and information should be used according to whether that's seasonal information or whether there's gendered restrictions or whether there's community restrictions around how this material would have traditionally been shared and used. And then also different kinds of permissions. <coughs> I'm having a human fail, not a, not a computer fail um, today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, so the different kinds of permissions, including uh, how certain kinds of consents have been entered into, often that information isn't visible. Uh, and this, what, what the labels do is starts to make that visible and that benefits Indigenous communities as well as researchers who have worked to get that consent and worked to really hard with communities around making sure that the right permissions are in place. And that is a responsibility that comes through, um, you know, working according to uh, Indigenous methodologies, Indigenous standards and ethics. And so kind of making the, this uh, a system that researchers as well as communities benefit from having transparent. So if the labels, and this is kind of important as we've developed this project, um, the labels are really for Indigenous communities. They customise them and they provide them to repositories or to archives, libraries and museums. But as we developed this project, we also understood that researchers and institutions also need tools to help them meet the care principles, but also meet their obligations to uh, Indigenous communities. This is at a level of both um, making it clear that community, that institutions and uh, researchers are open to do collaborative work to help find collections within institutions. Uh, that labour uh, often falls onto Indigenous communities to find those collections. Um, so how can you kind of shift the balance of that labour back into institutions where that material sits? And honestly, with um, staff who know much more about those collections than communities do. Um, as well as how can you mark particular kinds of Indigenous information and data as not having the right attribution yet or having attribution that's incomplete and it needs some work done on it, needs, so it kind of pushes it up so it can be more easily found and engaged with. So just a couple of examples of these notices uh, in, in practice. This is kind of um, at the American Philosophical Society utilising the Open to Collaborate notice. Uh, and as staff at the um, APS uh, talk to, they, they kind of say that the, the notice helps make visible uh, the practices that we already have as part of our institution, but from an external standpoint, you wouldn't know that we had that as part of our practice. Uh, and so the open to collaborate notice really makes that visible and it makes it also visible to Indigenous communities who are looking to work with institutions but don't want to necessarily do the, again, the labour of educating an institution about why they need to be part of conversations about how that data and how that information gets utilised. So the notice does a lot of work both publicly, it does work in terms of kind of like connecting to uh, Indigenous communities, but also the notice does internal work kind of because it does ask an institution to think about what what are its terms of collaboration? What does that look like? What is its policy? How is it going to forward this work internally? This is an example of the Open to Collaborate uh, notice being used uh, at Simon Fraser University uh, in British Columbia as well, uh, on the George and Joanne MacDonald Northwest Coast Image Archive. Um, this is the most uh, frequented image archive at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and so this is kind of why the library wanted to use the open to collaborate notice here. 
they want to do the work of putting the right attribution back to those photographs. And this is kind of how these legacies of naming continue to play themselves out. You'll notice the name of this image archive is of the people who took the photographs, not the names of the people who were in the photographs. And so that, that's where this kind of erasure of Indigenous names just begins and is perpetuated. So the work that Simon Fraser University is doing is actually researching and working with First Nations around those Northwest Coast images. So that, that proper attribution is there going forward. This is um, again the University of Tasmania. They have decided to utilize the Open to Collaborate notice um, at, on their open access repository. Again, kind of speaking to the knowledge that they have, knowing that there's Indigenous material in this repository. They don't yet know exactly where that is. They're working to build the infrastructure and the capacity to actually properly identify, find, and then engage with uh, Aboriginal communities across the country in relationship to how that material should be looked after into the future. But again, that open to collaborate notice is really the first step an institution takes uh, in engaging and doing this work to either to work with communities to label that material subsequently. This is an example of the notice being utilized within um, a genomic database. This is a genomic observatories meta database um, called Geome. Uh, this is again on their kind of landing page. Uh, it opens the, um, the open to collaborate information, kind of saying again, we're, we're invested and committed to doing this work with Indigenous communities. This is probably the first example of a biocultural notice um, that is within a, uh, a genomic database. It's a, um, a vaccinium database for a bilberry. Uh, again, what this notice does is it makes transparent that there is and discloses Indigenous rights and interests that might sit within that genome sequence. Um, it's, this is a kind of an important uh, visibility and uh, transparency process. Uh, we know that there is um, a significant amount of work around uh, how we uh, disclose interests that sit with particular kinds of data and particular kinds of data sets. Um, and this is kind of one of those tools to start doing that for Indigenous data. This is just another example of um, the notices being utilised within a, a project in Spain, which is really about climate change. Uh, again, kind of recognising that for uh, Indigenous data sovereignty to be realised, uh, these kinds of mechanisms become really, really important, both at the point of collecting the data, as well as the kind of uh, the subsequent storage of that data. And then just finally, this is another example within the context of um, a main eDNA project, um, which is about sampling uh, soils and waters uh, within kind of Maine. Uh, they're working to kind of think about where the notices and what the workflows are for implementing the notices, importantly, at the moment of field research. So this is kind of a, a project that is kind of focused on how do you change researcher practice when working on Indigenous lands and waters so that Indigenous provenance can be part of the, the, the very workflow from the beginning. And then, of course, what does it look like within the lab? What does it look like as the data archiving is happening? And what does it look like as kind of final reports and that data moves into larger data repositories? So all of these um, initiatives have implications for, um, for research uh, and for different ways in which uh, researchers can make their, um, uh, their work with Indigenous communities more transparent. This is uh, ORCID, this is kind of one of the, um, the, the key uh, uh, programs for um, creating capacity for uh, researcher transparency. Um, we're working with them to include the labels and the notices as part of a researcher's profile so that you can see that they've been working closely with Indigenous communities and that they have been able to disclose Indigenous rights and interests within the kind of research that they've been doing and where that information may or may not sit. Um, this, of course, pushes into other spaces, including um, publishing, 
this is a project with JSTOR to kind of start thinking about how do they update their metadata within their kind of with around their plants, particularly kind of biocultural knowledge that might need to sit. These are actually the herbarium species from the Lewis and Clark expedition that are currently held at the um, Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Uh, they know that these uh, specimens were collected on uh, Indigenous lands. There's no recognition of that within the metadata. Um, and they've just started a project to make that clearer and, make, and to actually connect with communities around the use of this, the future use of these specimens. While they were collected in 1804, the technology now allows for those specimens to be um, uh, genetically sequenced. Uh, so for their kind of DNA to uh, start and live in a different kind of place. So can I making sure that the right metadata is part of the um, specimen collection within the herbarium is a really important project that is happening across herbariums around the world. This is the preferred approach for, um, you know, uh, how the notices and the labels are incorporated into uh, uh, different kinds of uh, schemas. And this is kind of data sites uh, preferred approach and standard that, that we've been working with data site around, particularly material that has DOIs. Um, so this is kind of just a, an ongoing parallel conversation within different kinds of um, data providers. And to just go back to the labels and the notices, how you use them is by joining the local context hub. Um, this is a, a digital platform that we built. We built it slowly out of, because um, how we used to customize the labels were in communities on whiteboards um, within kind of community context. And so that kind of logic of how we customize the labels we've kind of transferred into a, um, a digital platform partly because of the scale that we needed to um, start dealing with through the um, biocultural labels uh, and that this allows for importantly for institutions and researchers to join to create a profile to create a project and then to connect and to create um, sorry to attach notices to do that disclosure work first and then to collaborate with the community around uh, the generating of the, the labels. Um, it allows communities to go in and to just customize their labels and then to work with repositories that they know hold their collections and to deliver their labels to them. It works through an open API. Um, this is kind of captures key information that can then be integrated into uh, institution and repository um, infrastructures. And this is just kind of an example of what this starts to look like um, for Geome as they've kind of worked to implement it there. That's the um, uh, genomic meta database that I was kind of mentioning before. Uh, it connects to a uh, material sample ID, um, which opens and kind of you can see that there's multiple uh, sample IDs that the labels can be attached to. Um, this is uh, where within it's kind of connected to their event ID. So the role of the IDs and the permanent IDs are really important, which is why we ask people to utilize the hub because that's where a permanent ID for the labels is generated. That permanent ID for the labels is connected to the um, notice ID, which allows for the label to come in behind the notice within, an in, in, within a digital infrastructure system. We also keep that kind of information. So all of this information would sit within um, Geome, uh, within the local context hub. We also um, can keep that information. So if it changes, um, that API allows it to be updated within um, the, the other parties' um, data, database um, and kind of sh shows where what labels are being utilized. So we always have kind of a connection to that information as well. So just finally, sorry, it's a lot. Um, uh, just to kind of connect it back to um, the larger kind of frameworks around Indigenous data sovereignty, which is, you know, this becomes a practical mechanism that supports that in a different kind of way. But just that provenance is really about connection, control and governance. It really um, is about in, in establishing the capacity for Indigenous peoples to be connected to their data and who can be engaged with for future use. Um, the protocols really as an expression of Indigenous data sovereignty are about in, enabling and 
allowing for Indigenous worldviews to be incorporated within digital infrastructures. And that does a lot of educative work in terms of kind of making sure that um, there is respect and there is responsibility to caring for those worldviews as legitimate worldviews within digital infrastructures. And then finally, just with permissions as another expression of Indigenous data sovereignty, supporting ethical and equitable research, making sure that there's responsibility, transparency and integrity in the ways in which Indigenous information enters into these infrastructures in the first place. So on that note, I'll just finish. Um, <laughs> and we probably have some time for some questions. Yeah, we've got, we've got plenty of time. As I say, I'm the I'm the following speaker, so I can control how much time the next speaker you know, is available. As I say, unless I have to talk the better, as, as, as I've said. Um, so can I, can we open up for discussion if if colleagues could raise a virtual hand or it all post a, a question in the chat. Um, that would that would be uh, probably the best way to go about it. So I've got to organise my Zoom screen so that I can see who's asking what <laughs> as well. I'm, uh, so um, I'll wait for some questions to come through, but I'll, put, I'll say I'll put a couple uh, to begin with. And, and it's, I say, I've got two questions. I'm not sure which one to ask first because there's a interdependency between the two. Mm -hmm. um, so actually, let me ask the second one first. It might, it might help with the first. So the, the labels themselves seem to be tied pretty closely to working with a particular community, you know, tailoring the, the labels to the communities that are there. In in a lot of, I say, I mean, mm -hmm. while data, yeah, so the database community works a lot, you know, at, 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 across lots of places and, you know, internationally. Mm -hmm but we're often working with data that probably represents multiple communities. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's to say, well, it could be a specific community, a specific collection. What, ha what happens in the circumstances where you've got multiple communities who are represented in the data and how do you accommodate different expressions of those, you know, those cultural interests? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And so because we recognize, I mean, particularly within the, um, um, the biological spaces uh, where species don't necessarily confine themselves to uh, community uh, territories and, and, and homelands distinctly. Um, we have uh, multiple community labels. We have that both in the traditional knowledge and within uh, the biocultural labels. And really that's to, um, because we do know that uh, multiple communities hold responsibility differently for whether that's a song series or whether that's actually a particular kind of species. And so the multiple uh, communities label adds the capacity for other communities to add those interests in. The question I think that is, is, is all th that follows that is um, what's the field that allows for those multiple interests to be expressed? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have spent a lot of time working to encourage the development of new fit because the rights field isn't necessarily the right field it, i mean when you're talking about provenance and you're talking about protocols and you're talking about permissions um not all of those necessarily are rights uh and so particularly data provenance is something that could sit in a different field entirely uh so how but how do you kind of keep these labels together as a particular kind of expression of indigenous data sovereignty within the within the fields and kind of what does it look like to have those multiple um those multiple community interests expressed we um we, we've built it so that uh you know in the sense that we don't work on the singularity of one authority um we we think that there are multiple voices that can tell different stories about you know whatever it is whether it's a particular kind of collection or this particular kind of um sequence so we've left open that possibility for that multiplicity within the kind of way in which we've built the labels yes you do need to work with um specific communities to have those labels added, but at an institution or at an aggregator level, you can add the disclosure notices that then allow for those conversations with those different communities. And if you've kind of built an infrastructure that allows for that multiplicity of vocality, the multiplicity of voice to sit within that infrastructure itself at the metadata level, then that allows that 
that, that there, there could be competing or overlapping interests, but that's a conversation that is also kept within the metadata, which actually becomes really, really important for other users of that data to actually know about. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, um, oh, that's it. So it's interesting follow up on that one from, from oh, so Slav is our colleague from, uh, uh, from, uh, dance, which is the, the Dutch National Archive. So he's got a question there about, do we see opportunities using AI and ML for, like, for, for the labeling there? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And um, <laughs> forgive me if I go off on a completely different tangent here, because this is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about as well. Uh, we have a project at the moment that is kind of assess assessing the veracity of the labels um, and kind of what does it mean to have um, different kinds of trust within the kind of labels system. We've built them so they can be um, machine actionable, which, you know, is opening up the possibility for potentially creating data sets that have labels on them that could then lead to training data sets that we know is Indigenous data. The biggest challenge at the moment for machine learning um, is, fi well, is finding Indigenous data and knowing it's Indigenous data. So that's kind of its own particular kind of problem. Um, but how would you be able to potentially filter and search for um, Indigenous data and Indigenous data sets in a way that means that Indigenous interests are incorporated in the machine learning process leading to a particular kind of algorithm. Um, so we have a couple of projects where, where that's kind of been happening. I ran a project, and this, you know, for me, this starts with um, Indigenous data provenance. If we don't have that information in the first instance, it becomes very, very difficult to use it within a kind of an AI context. So we were uh, working to develop, so for instance, to working to develop an algorithm to find Indigenous data. Um, and in order to do that, we needed a quite a large data set uh, in order to be able to kind of create that algorithm. Um, the only public data set that we could really find was um, uh, records from uh, disclosure of Native American or NAGPRA notices uh, within the US context. So about um, 20,000 records that we were able to kind of that are publicly available for institutions that have disclosed that they have Indigenous material within them, either from as as conditioned by um, the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act. So it was actually legislated that they needed to disclose that they had this material. So then we had to kind of go through that and start to think about what are the different vocabularies that we're finding, what is the different kind of ontology that we needed to create. Um, and that project is by no means complete, but it's, um, it is kind of one way of thinking about what would it look like? Because I think that there's an enormous potential here um, to, to utilize machine learning to support indigenous data sovereignty interests. Um, and, and so kind of what does it, what does it mean to uh, create algorithms that address historical legacies of exclusion from data systems themselves? That for me is a fascinating question. And really, I would love more people to be working on that. Um, but, you know, so if there's anybody who is interested in thinking through some of those things or has answers to some of those problems, that would be great. But, you know, our, our ground zero problem is that if it's not marked properly to, to start with, we can't find it. Um, and what would it mean to utilise machine learning to accelerate the capacity for Indigenous communities to find their data and their collections? Um, as well as also bypass some of the gatekeeping that happens within institutions that don't want to disclose that they have what, what they have of Indigenous communities. So, you know, that's that's also part of a, a particular challenge of, um, you know, sidestepping some of the control over Indigenous information, over Indigenous data that also sits as an impediment for communities to exert sovereignty over that data. So it's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... so I, I, I'm just getting a bit of clarification. I'll ask a clarifying question first, which is the Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. That's about return of human remains. Is that the? It's not. Well, it's not. It is. It's about return of yep. human remains, but it's also return of cultural patrimony. It's yep. return of material that was um, that was stolen from graves um, yep. across and only in this country, in the United yep. States. Yeah. Um, but what happens within those notices of disclosure that institutions have had to do is. 
Um, you get community names, so you can start doing a, um, a, 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 a vocabulary that uh, connects to community names. You also have the ways in which particular kinds of funerary objects are being identified and named within those. So you're able to kind of text mine to a certain kind of extent, um, the ways in which the description of those materials is happening. Um, and that allows us to then kind of say, okay, if we can build an algorithm based on some of that vocabulary that lends up, leads us to then expand what we might be finding within an institution rather than just kind of the, the narrowness of the Native American Graves Repatriation Act which is yeah. super interesting. Um, and, you know, we work very closely with uh, national NAGPRA um, in even to, um, uh, and had protocols around how to do that, which also um, changed how we talked about, you know, we did not call scraping data when we're dealing with uh, data that is actually really, really sensitive material. Um, and so we, we had a whole protocol around that and worked with National NAGPRA to um, make some of that material differently available, as well as had a protocol around how we were doing that work. Um, so there were all just kind of different parts of that, of that project, but it was very sensitive to the, the violence that is in the data set that we were, trying, that we were using in the first instance. Hmm. So, so I mean, Sly was sort of given a, a sort of a quick follow up on it, more of a, a just a comment, you know, you know, leveraging annotation services, hypothesis or Bocano, which is not what I'm familiar with, that sort of how do you facilitate the community to assist with the labeling process itself is, uh, um, you know, what's the mechanisms for doing that um, are interesting questions in themselves. Um, yeah, I mean, well, you know, I think that we, we want, what we want the kind of larger um, data community to do is uh, help make Indigenous data visible and findable to make it fair. That's I feel like that is kind of like one of the biggest responsibilities of the um, of the data community um, because it's only through making it fair that we can then start to uh, implement care principles. Yeah. Um, and so because it's only communities that can uh, do the labeling, um, the, the, the broader data community needs to kind of think about how they can utilize the notices, what that does, how that kind of starts a different kind of relationship and communication process. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's an enormous amount of work and um, the work will probably never be done, but by kind of moving communities towards the kind of ways in which they can contribute towards supporting Indigenous data sovereignty and thinking about kind of what does that look like within your context? What does it look like within kind of this repository? What does it look like, you know, across these different aggregators? Um, how do we build better practices for when data comes into our repositories? Um, what, what, what do we need as a kind of like foundational information that needs to be part of the metadata? What's the metadata of the data? Um, and kind of how does that become standardised across the whole sector? Hmm. And so nicely, that kind of brings together a number of the conversations we're going to, you know, we'll have over the next couple of days is like, what are the mechanisms through which you can achieve that? So it's, I say, I'm, I'm going to, Talk a little bit about you know experiences trying some of that and, and, a, and a project i'm involved in in australia to to kind of facilitate that um janet's sort of raised an interesting question following on from the fair principles discuss you know which is to say to make it findable you've got to define you know what it is what what constitutes indigenous data here so how is it defined when you might be automating search for indigenous data you know so what, I mean, uh, is there a working definition, I guess, is that, you know, um, would be one. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the um, Global Indigenous Data Alliance, or the Global Indigenous Data Alliance has a working definition for yeah. Indigenous data. Um, and that's data that uh, is about Indigenous people, that comes from Indigenous lands and waters, and that implicates Indigenous people in terms of how they're being governed, so policy data. So, you know, Indigenous data is really an enormous um, category. Uh, and it is challenging because you're dealing with historical collections as much as kind of research that happens on Indigenous lands and waters today in a variety of contexts. Um, and so, and then you've got um, uh, uh, administrative data. So data that is produced about, um, you know, and you've got health data, Indigenous health data. And I think that this is kind of really where the contribution of the um, various Indigenous data sovereignty networks across Canada, 
Australia, New Zealand, the United States have really worked to form um, a, a very good definition of Indigenous data. Uh, they're also very aware that it, it, it's, it's, it's difficult work, but, um, you know, yes, you do have to start with a definition. So I would point you to, um, to Gita in the first instance. So mm. Janet, yes. <laughs> How is the Gita definition identifies items or keywords, for example, when looking, okay, I think you're going to have to talk to Gita to Stephanie and to Maui and to Randall about like how they have worked to kind of define the definitions and how they're identified. That's don't have that one on my um, in my capacity for today. Sorry. Uh, sorry, it was it was mainly more about when talking about automation. How a uh, hi um, and thank you by the way, Jane, for coming and joining us. Um, and how you know when you start looking for terms through uh, you know thousands of pieces of materials like what what terms do you look for when you're saying is this indigenous data not yeah, actually yeah. the definition so much but getting what down the to the, the technical yep. bit so when you're searching thousands or millions of records what how do you say this is an indigenous is it because it's the term indigenous or native or you know how is how are terms also, used to yeah. to break through to look for the data so I, I can only speak to that from kind of my experience with the um, the data the indigenous data algorithm that we were kind of working on. Um, we were looking for community names was kind of one thing. We were looking for places where we know our community has have had as reservations. Um, we were looking for particular kinds of words. Uh, that tend to get associated with Indigenous people, whether that was um, certain kind of sacred object or um, uh, kind of off the top of my head, think about what all of them were. But it was, and, and in this instance, it was very specific to the data set that we had um, that was kind of like dictating what the terms would be. We really do believe that if uh, kind of community names, for instance, and this is kind of the point of why data provenance or Indigenous data provenance and attribution really matters, is that that starts to help identify what is Indigenous data. If it has Indigenous communities names associated with it at a metadata level, then you could then go back and start finding it. Um, what we found within particular kinds of, uh, you know, catalogues within institutions or other kinds of contexts is that because that information is missing, it's been very difficult to um, demarcate it as Indigenous. So it often just gets yeah. pushed into that kind of that larger pool. And we, you know, this is what other colleagues of ours like Keolu Fox talks very specifically about within a kind of a, um, a genetic health context is that outcomes for Indigenous people are absolutely missing because that information hasn't, that data hasn't been marked as Indigenous. It just gets kind of squashed into um, the kind of larger homogenous um, data. And so kind of what does it mean to kind of mark that data differently so that people could do different kinds of research that might support different kinds of understandings of health outcomes for Indigenous communities or Native Hawaiian communities um, in particular. So, but it's the marking of that data that becomes important in order for that kind of um, identification of that kind of data set to be made possible in the first place. Um, so I think your, your question is such a good one because if you don't have those markers in place, then you have to kind of really delve into, you know, in our instance, because we had this particular data set, it was so narrow what we were focusing on. Um, but if you don't have any of that information in the first place, you, it's very difficult to then kind of demarcate this as a clear Indigenous data set. Now, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you very much because it pins down, um, you know, Steve will have been thinking about this as well, exactly the point that, um, I was trying to understand how you approached it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, I, I think that the question is, you know, that, that kind of granularity is such an important kind of component of it. And whether you're working within kind of with, you know, so administrative data, that is its own kind of challenge in relationship to what are the terms and what is what's kind of going to be the vocabulary that you're utilising. We have a project in New Zealand, it's called uh, Tikanga in Technology, um, which has three different, a six year project. And some of that work is to kind of 
how, what are the classificatory terms that could be utilized um, and that could kind of clear, more clearly demarcate. So we, you know, I work on the kind of more historical side of things like what are these problems? How do we understand them? How does that kind of create a barrier for kind of any of the kind of future work? Um, but this kind of, this project is thinking a little bit more about what are the classificatory terms that we can insist on being there so that it's clear that it's Indigenous data. So that we're kind of this huge, historical problem that we have, you know, we're going to have to deal with that in another way. And it is probably going to be kind of case by case by case. And so as we kind of build what that terminology actually is. Um, and, you know, what, what's also challenging with the production of, or, you know, where the challenge also sits is you have to get into the logic of, um, of studying Indigenous people in order to kind of work out what that terminology is. Because all of this material that sits within archives, libraries and museums is not necessarily how Indigenous people would have wanted themselves represented. It's not necessarily how it would have been classified by Indigenous people. It's all classified by non-Indigenous people. And so you're kind of looking for terminologies that are already part of a kind of a colonial gaze and so, I mean, it just goes, you know, you, you, this is where the, um, the, 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 the structures of colonialism become embedded in the classifications themselves um, and kind of understanding that they aren't neutral and that they hide things and that they deliberately hide them, um, you know, really comes to the fore in this kind of context with this the exact question of yours, Jeanette. So, uh, again, very grateful for it. I say I'm uh, I'm I say I'm conscious of time. We've got about twenty minutes left, so I might do just a bit of a reflection on I say some of the because I'm going to pick up and, and talk specifically about some of the applications in Australia. But the the example before I do that, it's is it's surfacing language that um, uh, uh, that would have been used at the point of time at which the content was actually created or or actually or catalogued. Um, that actually reflects, you know, what is known to be the case now. And it's, it's I'm using a terrible example, but I, I've seen historians working to understand that the, the development of syphilis and the exposure of syphilis. And what the, one of the projects that they actually did was to go through historical medical records and look for indicators that fundamentally at the time would have been, you know, referencing um, uh, symptoms of syphilis. So what they're trying to do is actually, you know, estimate, you know, what was the prevalence of syphilis in the late 18th century, late, late 19th century, sorry. But by, you know, you know, so drawing upon, you know, language that was used to kind of express the terminology that was likely is a case of syphilis. I mean, it's, in, I mean, it's not a great terminology example. Well, the point is, what are the indicators that you might be able to find inside the metadata records that actually make it likely to be the case that you have indigenous right. content within there is a you know it's a challenging problem but i think it might you know there's there's probably ways and means for actually furthering that conversation so yeah yeah i mean i i find it like it's it's really the deep dive uh mm. it's really the sleuthing you kind of need to understand what the um what the intentions were in kind of some of the uh, work with communities, you've got to understand the um, who it was for also uh, affects what, how things are being described. Um, so there's actually kind of, this is the social life of the classification uh, at any given time um, is part of that conversation too. And um, I mean, it just it needs so many people to be doing that work, but it, it is again, it's, it's kind of very specific knowledge too. Mm. um yeah mm. so so i say i want to say thanks so much jane for sort of presenting and <laughs> and and give us an insight into there so i think there's like there's 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 lots to pick up there and i say i think one of the conversations i'd like people to be thinking through about the you know over the next few days is fundamentally well you know um you know we're, this is a technical community for the most part but also a research data management community yeah, that's yeah. sitting within there but the models through which i and and um, and I think this is a kind of a reflection for the for, for the group as a whole is what are the mechanisms both technically through which it, you know and you give us some quite good ins insights into the licensing or, you know and where to, where's it going to go in the fields and the metadata is like you know to, on the ground stuff but similarly how do we think about some of the governance models that might work mm -hmm. with the, the installations and the, and the providers that we have to accommodate you know those practices as well um, uh, is 
I think something for us to reflect upon as we go through the next few days. But uh, yeah, so yeah. I really want to thank you for the, the presentation there and uh, say, um, uh, say if we can get other uh, a round of applause from others. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. the, virtu the, vir the virtual thank you is an interesting one to do on Zoom. So <laughs> I know, I know. And then also I don't get to have dinner with you. That's also a shame. No, so. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's lovely because you get to have a different kind of um, global community, but you don't get to have the in-person chats yes. as well where you go that little thing you said what do you mean i want to know yes. more about that um <laughs> we don't get to spend that time together so I, exactly. yeah but thank you again so much for having me thank thanks <laughs> thanks so much for that so i'm going to pick up from there folks and just kind of talk to some some experiences we've actually got we've been working on in australia and, and this is janet and i as uh, say um particularly in in terms of the um uh some of the applications that we've been working on so hopefully it'll kind of put some 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 localized experience on some of what a number of the speakers have been talking to today. and I'm just, I'm just going to talk quickly but sort of particularly bring you know, at the end a, a national effort that's actually occurring in australia to start thinking about um some you know one, one effort to start thinking about some of these problems but to, to, to talk about the fact that this can occur at, at several levels um so i don't uh, so I'm going to leave it in uh, non-presenter mode here because when I move to Zoom and move to presenter mode, I'm going to lose everything. So, um, so ADA is you know based in um, in Ngunnawal country in uh, um, in in Australia, which is you know in the, the city of Canberra. But we we do have a sort of a, a national you know effort here. But we're a national service provider uh, and and increasingly working with um, both researchers, age, government agencies, and 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 progressively communities on um, dealing with some of the questions that have been raised throughout the um, the day to day. So, um, say this is just some, just a, some quick reflections, really, on what does this mean in practice when we start thinking about these things. And um, uh, I so I won't go through you know what ADA you know does, but partly what I want to do is where where the sorts of decisions and discussions come on the ground uh, around some of these questions because. Um, I mean, we've, I've been in the, my role for, you know, a bit over 10 years now, and we've been working on and off in, you know, these discussions for, you know, for that period, and, and had some successes and, and some failures. But, you know, um, a lot of what we're trying to do is support those different, you know, both communities and um, the, you know, other types of institutions to address some of these questions. And these are the sorts, you know, just a reflection, really looking forward as to, where are some of the hard questions start to come to? Um, so this is a, actually part of a presentation I gave to uh, a, a group called the Indigenous Data Network, which is a new in initiative based out from the, the University of Melbourne led by um, uh, uh, Professor Marsha Langton, who's a uh, senior Indigenous academic in Australia. Um, but what they're working towards, and I'll, I'll come to the, the network you know, a little bit later in the presentation is, how do we start dealing with some of these questions at a, at a national level to surface, coordinate, and you know deal with governance questions on um, of these um, uh, 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 some of these efforts? So it really is a you know an effort of, of there are now you know thirty plus partners involved in in this discussion. The point being though is I say these are often you know often take collaborative efforts um, and significant time and resources that are going to be involved to them. But this is really picking up on, you know, just some of as a provider into, you know, some of these, these communities, these are, you know, we're trying to provide support services, you know, fundamentally, but what are, what are the sorts of questions that are coming to the fore in these? And so it's really a reflection fundamentally on, you know, a, a series of themes and then one particular challenge, which is dealing with what happens when you're thinking about distributed um, models for this. Uh, and that, that, that we think that's quite relevant for the, the dataverse community as well. So, um, what we found in certainly in, in um, um, and this was when we're when we're you know literally last week when we're talking about how we're going to develop sort of some of the you know the infrastructure for that the, the the data network. What are the what are the mix of things we have to be kind of dealing with? And so, at, you know, we're partly from a, a service provider level. You know, um, one of the things we're thinking about is well. For, you know, what are the governance model and, and to what do they actually start to apply? So, um, you know, uh, the questions partly we were thinking of there as well. We have, 
in the and in the dataverse sort of circumstances, we have um, data sets, you know, or you know, um, is the, the sort of the starting object there. But partly, we then we not need we want to be starting to think about the collections and what the the interaction for governance of a, a collection might be, how a um, a set of owners or custodians, um, whether traditional owners or you know, um, or other owners, might think about in terms of what's the things that which they're responsible for and how do they understand and manage that that ownership. But similarly, then if you're thinking about as an installation or as a you know a, a combination responsible for multiple installations, what does that mean for the sorts of governance structures you need at an infrastructure level as well? So what combination of management, storage, tools are you willing to support? Because different communities and, and, and different organisations are going to want different combinations of um, services, tools, data types, governance structures that they want to be dealing with. So how flexible are you willing to be within the, you know, the you know often for as a service provider, you're trying to aggregate and, you know, standardise services. How do you accommodate that within a, a situation where custodians and, and communities might be needing quite distinct things uh, about how you, you know, um, your infrastructure supports that? Um, uh, uh, and you know, so we're, we're really starting to think about you know what are some of the you know the, the sort of the governance questions that come to the fore there, and we've seen quite a lot today on thinking about some of those governance practices that you know that might come along with that. Um, interestingly, you know, computational considerations are increasingly going to come to come into the mix that as well. I mean, there was sort of reference here to you know, so, you know to working with genomics data. Similarly, you might be thinking about you know uh, social media. Uh, economic systems and also interaction possibly with secure analysis systems might be part of the, the conversation as well. The privacy and confidentiality and traditional not well knowledge ownership, you know, whether it's commercial property or cultural, you know, uh, cultural knowledge, all have sensitivities that are associated with them. So, uh, you know, where's the appropriate spaces for those analyses to occur is going to be part of the conversation. And Gary, early on in the day today, you know, talked a bit about, you know, sort of, you know, and we've, we've talked at, you know, at length about this, about sensitive data services and what, what are the implications of those for, you know, how you might structure your services. Um, the, the sort of a, the follow on from that was really thinking about, well, how do we understand the different types of content? And again, this is me as a, someone who's providing a, you know, a national service to multiple organisations and multiple communities for multiple needs. How do we understand how we, what sorts of levels of support might we be having to deal, you know, uh, think about, and the, the sort of support arrangements that that, that might exist. Um, so traditionally, you know, for a long period, we've had kind of a distinction between major collections, which are heavy use, uh, focus collection development, and, and often have additional value added services that come along with them. And things like we have big longitudinal studies, cross national studies, census, uh, and often you know, dedicated funded collection development as well. And then we have sort of a broader longer tail collections of, of that often are associated with self deposit, often by individual researchers, for particular collections and really trying to make sure that the service is there, but driving, you know, really through the um, the, the the long tail collections is, you know, a researcher driven or, you know, a, a data owner driven, you know, model there. Community collections start to then, you know, you know, a, a really start having to rethink, you know, a bit of what's going on there and how, what sort of support services we can actually provide. Um, so really starting to think about, well, what the, you know, the, the technology that's available there, can we really look at standardized technologies? How far can that go? How do they interact possibly with the local portals or local, you know, interfaces that, that the communities might need? Uh, and how do we balance that localized, you know, um, uh, bespoke um, you know, customized arrangements with, a, you know, a strong tendency to aggregate or standardize over time without get into the sorts of questions that Jane's just been raising around about losing certain characteristics at the same time and how do we accommodate that tension? So these, these sorts of discussions are really a series of optimization, you know, uh, issues that we have, you know, we want to think about. How do we accommodate both the, you know, the needs of the local and the, you know, the, the, the needs of the aggregate fundamentally in a way that allows us to deliver those services? Um, so we've had a series of experiences with that. Probably the earliest one of those was a group called at Cedar, the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Data Archive. We, we initially we were involved in a collaboration around, uh, and this this 
this group still exists to this day based at the University of Technology Sydney, which is really about trying to support return of Indigenous knowledge to, you know, that's documented in research projects. So the sorts of efforts we've talked about there. And this is, you know, at cedar.edu.au, we were providing a sort of a back-end service, but a local, um, uh, through a, an Indigenous um, uh uh, research group within the University of Technology series was really involved in the, the local co coordination, local engagement and, you know, and, and community consultation uh, that was occurring there. Now that, that seat has you know, been running for a while, but the big problem that they've had is really resourcing at, at, the, at the institutional level. So fundamentally it hasn't been, it still exists, but you know, the, 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 the local resourcing there has been hard to maintain over time. So, um, both in terms of to, be able to enable that community engagement to occur, but also to, to continue to support the technical specialists that you might need for the, the curation and, and, and hosting to occur. So as I say, for our early efforts, you know, continue to, to operate, but you know, haven't been successful as we might have liked. More recently though, what we've been really seeing is um, engagements in, the, in the, the level of local community, um, uh, a combination of community and, and, and research projects that are often associated with particular communities um, uh, in you know, various parts of Australia. One of those, and, and Janice worked on both of these projects. So the first of those is a, a project which is called Re Return, Reconcile, Renew, which has prompted my question about um, human remains. This is a, an effort around repatriation of human remains that, that might have been, again, taken off, off country to you know, um, particular, you know, research locations or you know national museums and the like so again that capacity for engagement between a a museum or a, you know the library archive museum collection and back to the you know the traditional home and you know from which the, the you know often the, the the remains themselves were drawn there are common protocols for for managing these but you know fundamentally how do we you know this project was really to facilitate that process now the, this group as i had a very strong engagement with a number of communities and a uh, strong governance network but here manage continue to support the technology became a, a, a problem um but and, and it, it occurred in two ways first of all the institution you know the, the institution that was hosting the um uh, the the archive itself couldn't continue to, to maintain the services that were there so one of our, our early work was was to make sure that the, the collection itself didn't die, you know, so that the communities continued, you know, and the, the services can continue to be there, but had to be, you know, continued to maintain on, you know, what was the you know, technology was largely starting to go out of date. So how do you continue the, you know, the ongoing arrangements for those those services? The second problem that we've hit though is the solutions we put in place, and this is this points to the. The, 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 the challenge of working, particularly with you know, communities that are often in remote locations. Um, there's, there's a lot of Indigenous communities that, you know, the, the, the strongest population of Australian Indigenous peoples in, is in major cities, but, you know, um, that, as I say, significant distribution and across, you know, right across Australia, uh, and often in places that don't have good internet access you know, in particular. So how do the different combinations of technology, skills and capabilities, but particularly communication technologies, imp impact upon the way you might deliver your services? And for something like Dataverse, that's going to be a big challenge. Here we were talking particularly about a virtual machine service and you know, uh, a remote desktop environment, but the, the, the communication systems couldn't deal with it. So how do you, your technologies you know, accommodate the sorts of local arrangements that might be needed within the communities you might be working with? Um, I say, Large as I, 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 the other point I'll, I'll make on this one is there was a large community of partners that are involved, and you know they've continued you know uh, to be involved here. And here we've discovered you know uh, say part of the, uh, the the tyranny of distance. It's a communications distance and an internet you know internet quality you know challenges really the driver there. But it's important to have a number of, of groups involved there. Related to that, um, Janet spent the, the best part of the last couple of, you know, uh, uh, last month on and off up in uh, the far parts of the Northern Territory in Australia there, and in Delacqua uh, Land Council, um, working on a, a, a couple of projects, uh, partly to, to support skills development and, you know, um, and, and help provide, you know, uh, ideas for um, uh, supporting a particular data project in the future. That's led then into a second project around uh, an existing uh, language project that they were working on. And progressively, we've even had contact about a, a third project um, uh, with a, a, another land council. So the, the sorts of capability building that, that's often needed in some of, you know, some of the communities is there's a strong interest and a strong you know, desire to be, you know, take 
you know, take ownership of what's there. But there is a, you know, a scaffolding process that, that, that does need to occur as you, you work along the way with um, uh, in building up capability and knowledge that, that comes with this as well. And so sometimes, you know, in this case, with the memorandum of understanding between the First Nations portfolio within the Australian National University, where we're based, and the, and the Land Council to further these conversations effectively to return, you know, uh, um, uh, to, to, to contribute back knowledge that has, you know, again, been taken, you know, in, in some cases from the communities uh, that were over-researched in this case. Um, the, the last, uh, that I'll, that I'll touch on here is, is this, this larger network. So these have progressed, you know, there's a number of efforts that are there and, and um, some of the work that Jane was talking about is the Indigenous Data Sovereignty Movement. We've got a strong network of collaborators, um, you know, working on these sorts of questions in Australia. Alongside that, there's, we've now had established so a, 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 what's called the Indigenous Data Network. Um, so this has been really in place since about two, well, in 2018, uh, came out of a, a sort of a national effort in 2017 around, you know, the quality of, you know, Indigenous data access in Australia, but really trying to, you know, um, uh, look at what are the sort of the data requirements that, that exist for Indigenous communities in Australia and those working with those communities and the data that's going to be relevant there. Driven out of the, the University of Melbourne, uh, and there's uh, the uh, as again, a large number of university partners, but at the same time, again, there's about 33 uh, community and uh, support organisation partners overall that come into the mix here. So again, another effort to try and coordinate a lot of the, the sorts of governance and technology efforts uh, that, that, you know, that, that form part of this, the, this process. That project, as I say, is really kicking off. It's only been up and running for about three or four months now, but the, it, it has three intents. And it's really trying to draw th these three questions together. So a social architecture around indigenous data governance and sovereignty, really picking up on the, the data sovereignty questions that have kind of been emerging. And we have representation for those who are in, uh, including those who are in uh, the, the, uh, the Australian you know, uh, part of that, uh, that net, the data governance, uh, data sovereignty network. The technical architecture requirements, both how do we, what, what the local requirements look like there, but also how do we start aggregating those efforts to deal with the findability problems that, that, that Jane was talking about, particularly uh, a, a shared um, data catalogue that might, you know, be focused to the, you know, to the requirements of the, um, uh, the, you know, the range of communities that exist, but, you know, Indigenous peoples more generally in Australia. And then how do we save the assets that already exist, particularly spatial assets? Um, so how do we start developing in specific indigenous data assets? So this particular effort is around a coordinated uh, framework for looking at traditional uh, uh, place names for tagging and, and, and connecting resources that exist in the, you know, both the, the, the research community and the libraries, Act, archives and museums community with the, the, the spatial and temporal uh, frameworks that you know might be applied by indigenous communities themselves. So as I say this is a you know sort of a national effort to try and coordinate the, the, these programs that is you know in the initial, first instance is about 18 months, but really we're looking you know right now into the next five to five to ten years of what are those requirements likely to be. Fundamentally I'll, I'll skip towards the you know the, the toward the end though, but fundamentally the core questions that are really coming through um, are you know, there's, there's some technical considerations that, you know, then we were talking about, well, what are the sorts of challenges? Where are you going to store your data? You know, is it, um, so um, who will who will operate it? How will users access your infrastructure? How do you determine authority of access to the data? How do you determine, should you be able to take your data away? There's a big question around, you know, um, both, you know, it's, um, keeping data on country. You know, so if a data leaves the country in which it was, it, you know, to which it's associated with, you know, is, is, how well does that, does that align with the, the preferences and the ownership, you know, uh, and custodianship um, expectations of the community, you know, and that particular geographic community that from, from which it's drawn. So how do you accommodate those, those questions? And back to my, you know, my last question really around what happens particularly when you're dealing with these just, is, these questions of distributed collections. As I say, communities are geographically and institutionally diverse. You're going to have quite a lot of variation in the implementations in terms of technology, geography, 
And the one that was really hitting on, you know, in, in our particular Australian case is communications. If you can't send data across pipe, pipelines, uh, the communications pipelines, what are you going to, you know, what does that mean for the way you offer an infrastructure that's there? Is it going to be the case you still have to think about shunting hard drives between one place and another? And when you've made those sorts of determinations, what does that also mean for the sorts of skills and capabilities of um, anything from a, you know, a large full-time paid multiple staff to people volunteering to do this in their spare time. You know, that, so how do you accommodate the range of, you know, skills and capabilities that might, that might exist? So how do we accommodate, you know, across the combination of communities that are there, building in redundancy and capacity building into the management of these collections so that we can, you know, again, sort of, you know, really achieve the aims that, you know, that, that we're looking for there. So there's a um, really a, you know, um, the sorts of questions that the IDN network is starting to engage with is, is really this, this combination that's here. Uh, governance, the collection organisation and management that's there. Standardisation, how far can you standardise? And, and say Jane's, Jane's work has really reflected you know, really well on the, the customization of standardisation as, as one model for that. I didn't talk about this, but what partly what we also want to think about is well, it, it's data is ready for X. What's the, what's the intent for which you're making, actually making data available? Um, and X might be multiple things, advocacy, education, public policy, research analysis, that, that, that have different demands on the sorts of ways you're gonna deliver things uh, and dealing particularly with the challenge of distributed collections and federated collections. How do you, you know, recognize the fact that things are in lots of different places and your capacity to communicate between those places might be very, so understanding and accommodating these differences really provide the core challenges for us as supporting Indigenous communities and in, in how we might go about that. And we have to deal with this di diversity of requirements as we start thinking about delivering, you know, local, you know, intermediate and national services as we go through. So that was kind of some reflections really on where we can come to it. But so it's hopefully a, you know, a prompt for us to be starting to think about those um, as we go forward as to what the, you know, the possible implications of how we meet the sorts of questions that have been raised today in the um, uh, in our keynote and, and and breakout sessions that allow us to you know to think about well, what would this mean about how we could do this in practice. That's just some reflections on that. So on that note, we've we've hit the hour. So I, so I, I won't I won't turn to you know I, I, if anyone wants to follow up with any questions with me, I'm more than happy to uh, to, to communicate you know um, um, going forward and uh, say my my details. I think. I, I'll, I'll post them in the chat, but for now, I think we're now transitioning into our, our initial breakout sessions as well. And I look forward to continuing the conversations as we get into our, um, our, our more detailed agenda. So thanks for that. And I'll pass back to you, Sonia. Thank you so much, Steve and Jane. That was wonderful. Lots of information, uh, absolutely engaging. So I really thank you both for your time.